The Small Town Preacher's Fake Marriage, The Bride's Wanted Matchmaker Series, written by Lucy McConnell, narrated by Liz Crane. Chapter 1. Evie The town of Moose Hollow was big enough that Evie Williams wouldn't have to see the two-timing, lying snake, otherwise known as Owen, ever again. Unless they worked in the same office. Which, unfortunately, they did. The same small, impossibly confining office space. Six months ago, she'd caught him kissing another woman in the grocery store parking lot. Seriously, why had she ever thought she loved a man who was dumb enough to kiss his mistress in public? Sometimes she wasn't sure whom she was angrier at, him for cheating on her or herself for falling for him in the first place. He was such a sleaze. She sniffed and wiped under her eyes with a lotion-filled tissue. There was no reason to cry over his stupid Instagram wedding announcement on her feed. So what if no one in the office had told her about the engagement? So what if the woman he was marrying was two dress sizes smaller? So what if they were getting the destination wedding she'd always dreamed of in Hawaii? She'd gotten off lucky. All she'd lost was two years of her life. This woman, with her cute little smile and impossibly skinny jeans, was in for a train wreck and had no idea what was coming. Evie was half tempted to warn her. She paused and closed her eyes. God? I'm a good person. Help me out here. What am I supposed to do? There's another one! Maisie's happy squeal from the other side of their shared cubicle wall made Evie jump and her eyes fly open. Staying in the office at lunch was like staying in a movie theater after the credits were done. Empty and unsatisfying. Yet she couldn't follow the mass of well-wishers out the door as they took Owen to his celebratory lunch. Mass was a generous word, considering there were eleven people employed at Hanson's Heating and Air. Five of them were office staff, and only three of them had gone out. Thankfully, her BFF, Maisie, had stayed behind in a show of moral support. Maisie's adorable face, framed by stick-straight black hair, appeared by the drab gray wall. You have got to read this. Evie's mood instantly lifted at the excitement scattering like drops of sunshine from her friend. Maybe the two of them should have gone out to eat on their own. She could use a pick-me-up. What have you got? Evie pushed back from her desk and strode around the corner so she could see what had her best friend all excited. It's another ad for a wife, Maisie beamed. Can you believe these guys? First the one about finding a father for his son, and now this guy. Evie leaned forward, her hands on the desk, to read the print in the local classifieds. The matchmaker was the local place to advertise a garage sale, usable appliances, trade a treadmill for some sheetrock work, or browse for a new job. A few months ago, they'd run an ad by a man looking for a wife. The town had blown up with the news, and speculation abounded over who had placed the ad and if anyone had dared to answer. While no one knew the identity of the wannabe groom, rumor had it that he'd actually gotten married. Evie began reading out loud. Wife wanted. Christian man looking for charitable woman who is interested in partnering as shepherds for a small flock. Must be willing to get married right away. Platonic relationship requests only. She stared at the words. A Christian man. Wouldn't that be wonderful? She hadn't minded that Owen wasn't a believer while they'd dated, but since breaking up, she'd realized how much she'd missed out on not having a man who held the same values. Like fidelity in a relationship. She pushed back at the bitterness that clawed at her, trying to drag her down to a gulf of endless misery and woe. She hated that she was so far away from forgiving him that all she could manage each day was a fight against bitterness. Two thumbs up. She continued to win that battle. She refocused on the ad and read it again, this time thinking about the kind of man on the other side of the keyboard. A whisper filled her heart that this was someone she would like to meet, a kindred spirit. He was Christian, which was a must for all of her future relationships. And he had a calling of some sort in life. Shepherding a flock was definitely a reference to a life of service. That was the kind of life she could get behind, 
taking meals to the needy, tutoring children. She'd always felt this call to do more than she was doing, but she had to pay rent and buy food. There were only so many hours in the day. What if she could make serving others her life's work? The possibility was inviting, so much so that she felt called to it. She'd been in prayer only moments ago, asking the Lord what she should do about her present situation, how she could improve it and move on from Owen's betrayal. And the answer had popped up not a minute later. I'm going to answer him. The words were thrilling and laced with gold and silver. They sparkled with possibilities. She snagged a sticky note and wrote down the ad number. There wasn't an email listed, so the only way to respond was through the matchmaker's site. Wait! Maisie followed her around the wall and back to her computer, throwing her arms across the entrance and blocking Evie's way out in case she darted for the door. You can't be serious! Oh, I am. Evie brought her screen to life with a tap on the space bar and quickly found the site and then the ad. She let out a sigh of relief that it was still there. A part of her had expected it to disappear. This whole thing felt like a dream of some sort, like she was watching herself type. Maisie tugged on her chair, making it roll away from the desk and pulling Evie's fingers off the keys. You're insane. Look, Owen is a jerk, but that doesn't mean you have to throw your life away and marry a stranger. There are lots of great men out there. Evie scooted her chair back under the desk. I'm not throwing my life away. Read the ad. He wants someone to help him tend a small flock. And if we're married, then he provides room and board. What does that even mean? Macy laced her fingers together and gave Evie a pleading look. Please don't do this. What? A flock could mean he has several children he needs help with, or that he's over a youth group or something. She glanced around her cubicle, which was full of inspirational quotes and pictures of kittens and puppies. I like the idea of dedicating my life to helping others. I'm so tired of staring at gray walls and a computer screen all day. I was meant to do more. Then become a nurse. Evie scowled. Too much school and way too much bodily fluids. Um, hello, children are full of bodily fluids. Okay, ew. Evie hesitated. She reread the ad. He sounds like a good guy. Oh, so it's a rebound thing. Maisie perched herself on the desk, crossed her legs, and squared her shoulders. Let me tell you how rebounds are supposed to work. You put on a black dress and you make out with a hot stranger, then you move on. But what you don't do, what no one has ever done in the history of rebounds and had it turn out good, is get married. She drew out the last word, enunciating both syllables. So here's the thing. Evie leaned back in her chair and gave her bestie a let-me-tell-you-something cock of her head. I'm not the average woman. I don't do rebound makeout sessions. It took a lot for me to kiss Owen on the third date. I move slow. Yeah, but are you willing to spend a life stuck in platonic? Evie thought about it. While other women talked about how much they craved their men, she'd never had those stirrings not deep enough that they took control of her rational thought. I think I'll be fine with that. Ugh, you're the only person I've met who might actually make it as a nun. Evie laughed. I'm not Catholic. You should be, Maisie called over her shoulder as she went back to her cubicle. A moment later, a huff of frustration sounded as Maisie landed in her chair. Evie read through the ad once more taking into account that advertising for a wife was a strange thing to do. What kind of a man did that? A man who was desperate, for sure. But desperation came in so many different layers. When it came down to making the decision, she put her trust in God. Closing her eyes, she calmed her mind and felt with her heart. It felt right. She typed a note to the mysterious man and sent it off, leaving the outcome... Up to the Lord. Chapter 2 Seth Pastor Seth Powell settled into his seat in front of the church board. Having their chairs in a half circle and him in the middle felt more like a witch trial than an interview. 
He wished they'd changed the seating and tugged at his collar as he looked around. There were a half dozen folding tables leaned up against one wall, and there was a stack of chairs. The space would make a great teen room. From what he'd seen online and gathered from his first interview over the phone, the ministry didn't have a teen service group or even a tutoring program after school. I'm afraid we have some concerns, said Mr. White, the head of the church board. He had one ankle resting on the opposite knee and leaned back in his chair. His whole demeanor said, I'm in charge. You're too young for a position like this. How is a 25-year-old going to counsel our congregation who have decades of life experience on him? Seth glanced at the other four members of the board. The two men wore pants with the belts practically up to their armpits, and the women were dressed smartly in skirts and matching jackets. They were all over 60 and were unimpressed with his top grades in seminary. Other pastors had diplomas and years of experience. However, the life of Grace Ministry was struggling and didn't have a large salary to offer a pastor. So they'd attracted younger applicants who were willing to put in the work to build a career and a following. He knew getting this position was a long shot, but the Lord specialized in championing underdogs like Moses and David, so he'd moved forward with faith and prayed that the miracle would come soon. Well, sir, it's not really me people want advice from, is it? It's the Lord. I would refer them to the Bible and passages I'd feel impressed to share and encourage them to seek guidance by the Holy Spirit. The group exchanged looks. Mrs. Miller scratched a few lines on the pad of paper in her lap. Her blonde hair moved about as if it were a helmet on her head. She also had the kindest blue eyes he'd ever seen. Eyes that had snuck a look at Mr. White that had nothing to do with church business. Neither of them wore a wedding ring, so Seth was left to wonder if they had something going on or if Mrs. Miller was the only one looking. Our other concern is that you are unmarried, Mr. Green blurted out. He spoke as if talking to a line of troops, his words choppy and brokering no argument. Seth shifted. That's a major concern of mine as well. He smiled to let them know he was joking. Mrs. Miller twittered, quickly covering her mouth. Mr. Green chuckled and then coughed to cover it up. He slouched in his chair, as if he was made to be here and wasn't sure if he wanted to be or not. You mentioned as much in my first interview. I assure you, I'm currently working on a solution to that very problem, Seth expounded, praying they wouldn't ask for proof, because his ad in the matchmaker hadn't brought forth any fruit. These things take time. He'd done his best to tell the truth without actually saying that he'd placed an ad in the newspaper for a wife. It was crazy and out of character for him, but he couldn't get the ad he'd seen several months ago out of his mind. When he'd finally given in to the constant pressure from the Lord to place one of his own and sat down to write, it flowed out of him with such ease that he was shocked. He looked around the room again. The windows let in a brilliant display of light. He could practically feel the energy of a dozen kids working on homework, playing board games, and listening to music. Why don't you have a youth group? he asked. Mr. Green squinted. Because we don't have any youth. Now, John, his wife Matilda placed a hand on his knee. We have the Henderson girl. So we're supposed to put together a whole program for one kid? She tisked at him. Every sheep is important. He huffed, but didn't argue. Seth frowned, wondering why he'd felt so strongly about a program when there wasn't an immediate need. I think we've heard enough. Mr. White made eye contact with the other members of the group, silently asking for their vote one way or another on Seth's application. Seth prayed. He prayed with all his heart. He'd wanted to be a pastor ever since he was a junior in high school. And though he was young, he had a heart full of love for the Lord that he wanted to share with the whole world. Well, if you can get things settled in the marriage department, I think we'll be willing to give you a chance, Mr. White conceded. He launched to his feet, his hand outstretched. Thank you, sir. He pumped Mr. White's hand first and then made his way around the semicircle. I'm thrilled for this opportunity. My, but you're as excited as a puppy, said Mrs. Miller. He slowed down the handshake. I am, 
I have so many wonderful ideas, and I can feel the Holy Spirit in this ministry. It's a home where Jesus can bring peace to those who enter. She placed her other hand, soft and light as a bird, on top of their already joined ones. There are great things ahead for you. I'll pray for your strength and endurance, because there's also a lot of work. I look forward to it. He did. His chest puffed up. Here are the keys to the pastoral cottage. Mr. White held up a finger. Don't forget, we expect progress on the marriage front, and soon. Oh, Rod, you can't give love a deadline, Mrs. Green scowled. Can too. Mr. Green stood up for his mate. It's easy. You get down on a knee and pop that question. Mrs. Green shook her head. You were so much more romantic when you were younger. My knees worked when I was younger, too. He quipped back at her. Oh, John. She playfully smacked his arm. So how about it, young feller? You ready to put a ring on it? Mr. Green asked in his sergeant voice. Progress is my middle name. Seth pocketed the keys and pulled the door open, holding it for the ladies. Mr. Green scowled. I thought your middle name was Matthew. Mrs. White twittered behind her hand again, her eyes sparkling. Seth barely made it out of the room before a grin broke free. He'd let Mrs. Green explain the joke to her husband on the drive home. He liked this group. They'd keep him on his toes, that was for sure. He stepped out of the double doors and down the steps into the bright sunshine. Lifting his face to the light, he paused to let the heat warm his cheeks. He'd done it. He'd secured his first official position. It felt good. For about five seconds... His smile melted. If he was going to keep his place as pastor, he needed a wife, and soon. Mr. White wasn't one to trifle with small details. If he said they wanted a married pastor, then a married pastor Seth would be, or they'd look for someone new. He pulled out his phone and checked the ad. There were several responses. One of them was crude. Two were mocking. A few were sincere, but interested in being paid up front or getting a weekly paycheck. He shook his head, working to keep discouragement at bay. Like he could afford to pay a wife. He was lucky he could afford to feed her on his meager salary. Dear God, all things happen on your time, but I'm running out of time here. Maybe he needed to find the single scene in town. He'd never been great at navigating the dating world. His first girlfriend had played head games that left him exhausted. His second had dumped him for a lineman on the college football team. After that, he'd just sort of opted out. And now, he was opting back in. Sort of. Right as he glanced down, a new answer popped up. He stopped in the middle of the church walkway to read it once, then read it again, savoring the sweetness of the words on the screen. Loves Jesus, wants to share her love with others. Excitement rushed through him. Open to a platonic marriage grounded in trust and friendship. Yes! He pumped his fist, then quickly straightened and glanced around to make sure no one had seen him. The others had pulled out of the pockmarked parking lot that was in desperate need of repair. He might not be able to give a wife everything she desired in the way of the world— but he could be loyal and was an excellent friend, if he did say so himself. He paused for a moment to tune into the spirit. He waited for a warning, a reason to call the whole thing off. But there wasn't one. Instead, all he felt was calmness. Not a huge burning in his bosom, but a general sense of well-being. That would do. He called the number at the bottom of the reply. This is Evie she answered. Her voice was confident and sure, while also being, dared he say, sexy? He sucked in. Maybe he should have given himself a good night's sleep before jumping in with both feet. Like Peter, he was willing to get out of the boat, but now he saw the waves and the storm. Hello, she said. Hi. The word came out like the sound of a balloon popping because of his nerves, I'm calling about your response to the ad I placed. He kicked at the curb. He sounded like a secretary, not a potential best friend slash husband. Oh, um, yes? He scrambled for something to say. Do you, 
I mean, are you still interested? Can you tell me a little more about what I'd be doing? He stopped fidgeting. Sure. He spent the next five minutes talking about the duties of a pastor's wife, as far as he knew them anyway. He'd need someone to organize church activities, help women in delicate times when a man wasn't wanted around, maybe work with the teen group once it was up and running. If he could convince the board that starting one was in the best interest of the church and the community. He didn't mention the uncertainties of the situation. They could divide up the household chores any way she wanted. I've been a bachelor long enough that I know how to keep a house clean. I'm not expecting you to pick up after me or anything like that. Well, that's a tick in the positive column, then. Are you making a pro-con list? He asked, suddenly nervous. Only in my head, but it sounds like the kind of life I would enjoy. So you want to get married, then? If he wasn't a pastor and this situation wasn't weird enough on its own, he would have cursed himself for throwing that out there like a frisbee. Sure. How does Friday look to you? His jaw dropped. He hadn't expected her to say yes, let alone offer a date. She sounded so... normal. Like this kind of thing happened to her all the time. He wasn't as calm as all that. If he didn't stop pacing, he'd wear out the soles of his shoes. That sounds perfect. Great. I'll meet you at the courthouse. Wait. He didn't want to hang up with her. A connection had formed, something he hadn't expected but now didn't want to lose. Then, realizing how dumb that was, considering they'd only just met over the phone and would be married in three days, he groped for words. I'm a little worried by how easy this was. She laughed. It was a nice laugh, deep in her throat and with a musical quality. I'd be lying if I didn't agree. But it feels right, doesn't it? He didn't have to search his heart to know the answer. It does. The silence between them was warm and welcoming. I'm in the deep end now. Okay, I guess I'll see you Friday. They said goodbye and hung up. He fell forward, lying on the hood of his car. He had just gotten engaged to a woman he'd not laid eyes on. Lord, I'm praying this is your plan for me. If it's not... I'm making a big mess of things. His voice echoed off the metal. Instead of getting in his car, he went around the side of the church to the small house that would be his and Evie's by the coming weekend. It was in desperate need of a paint job, and there were several shingles missing on the roof. He could do the work, but he wouldn't be able to finish it before bringing her here. He hoped she wouldn't run away at the sight of him or the home. He had a lot riding on getting married like his whole life plan. If this didn't work, he'd be back to square one. His job wasn't his only concern, though. If word got around that he'd advertised for a wife, no one in the congregation would respect him. He had to keep it hush-hush and hope that Evie would feel the same way. Chapter 3 Evie Evie rushed up the courthouse steps, her white eyelidded skirt lifted by the wind. She slammed it down with a hand, grateful she'd caught it before it had gone too high. She should have known better than to wear something so impractical on a windy day, but it was her wedding. If that wasn't an excuse to get dressed up, then there wasn't one on earth. She pulled open the heavy door and did her best to look calm and collected. The floor was covered in warm brown and sand-colored tiles that shone with the care of a dedicated janitorial staff. Dark wood paneling ran halfway up the walls and framed the welcome window, where a bored secretary played a game of solitaire, the cards lined up like kindergartners waiting their turn. Evie's gait was even as she crossed the small steps. She was proud that she appeared so confident when her heart pinballed around in her chest. To her right was an imposing door. As with the pearly gates, you didn't walk through that door unless you had permission and knew where you were going. She smiled at the secretary as she approached the window. Hi, I'm here to meet my... The words stuck. Every time she tried to talk about what she was about to do, her throat closed off. Conversations with Maisie had been greased with a bucket of ice cream and marshmallow topping. Maisie thought she was nuts... 
She could be walking into a marriage with someone who had a comb over. All the better, as far as Evie was concerned. The uglier her husband was, the easier it would be to refrain from physical contact and to focus on serving the congregation. Like any good friend, Maisie had tried her best to talk Evie out of the wedding. She'd used persuasion, logic, even blackmail at one point. But Evie wouldn't be moved. The life Seth had described sounded like heaven on earth. How could she pass that up? And if it all went south, she could get the marriage annulled. Not that she liked the idea. Marriage was sacred and not to be thrown about like popcorn. Since she was in this for the long haul and expected to grow old and die with Seth, she was confident in saying her vows. Quitting had been easy. The owner's daughter had just graduated from tech school and needed a place in the company. Evie trained her for two days and walked out the door without a backward glance. Her apartment was also easy to vacate. The manager agreed to sever her lease three months early, and even gave her the deposit back. Like Seth had said, it was all too easy. She had to believe that the obstacles that would have been in her way had been moved by the Lord because this was the path he wanted her on. If that was true, if God was behind this, then why had her tongue gone rigid? Ma'am, the woman behind the counter prompted her to continue, my my fiancé, she forced the word out. We're to be married, today. That's usually why fiancés meet here, said the woman with a drawl. Fill this out. We can wait on the bench. The judge will be back in three minutes. Finding your guy is up to you. She waved to the empty waiting area, which contained nothing but a hardback bench. Evie took the clipboard and headed to take a seat. She started filling out the form and quickly realized she didn't have half the answers. She could fill in her full name, but she didn't know Seth's. Heck, she hardly knew his first name, much less his social security number, his address, his mother's maiden name. Doubt crept in like a spider, moving slowly and sending shivers up her back. The doors flew open, allowing the wind to whip at her skirt again. She grabbed the hem to hold it in place and glanced up at the stranger. A handsome young man worked to get the door shut, straining against the last few inches that wouldn't budge. The weather wasn't cooperating. The sidewalk had turned dark with rain. She sighed at the sight. Was this a sign of turmoil and upheaval that would enter her life when she said, I do? At least she'd arrived before the clouds opened up. She patted her hair. Would the storm slow Seth down and make him late for their wedding? The stranger strode across the room and up to the window. He hadn't seen her, or if he had, he didn't acknowledge her at all. I'm here to get married, he told the receptionist. You and everybody else. She flicked her fingers toward Evie. Evie snickered. The receptionist must get that statement all the time to be so flippant. What an interesting job, helping people get married. What other types of couples came through here? Surely there were some who were too eager to wait for a church wedding with all the trappings. She'd once dreamed of a beach ceremony, with nothing between her and her husband and God but surf and sky. Those dreams had died, killed off by Owen's betrayal. In a weird way, she was okay with that. Trading one dream for another wasn't so bad, and becoming a preacher's wife was a grand adventure. Hannah Stevenson had been the wife of her preacher growing up. The woman was giving and always had it together. Her long brown hair fell in gentle beach waves, and she had a cute wardrobe, professional yet fun, with skirts that looked a lot like the one Evie had picked this morning. Hannah had answers for every question, whether it be scriptural, spiritual, or about life in general. She'd been a beacon for the teen girls to look up to, someone Evie would try to emulate as she stepped into this new role though she doubted her ability to meet the standard Hannah set. The receptionist handed the guy a clipboard. Fill this out and have a seat. The judge will be back soon. You're in line after her. She pointed her pen at Evie, and the man turned. Evie ducked her head, embarrassed to be caught watching him. She filled in her driver's license number on the form and left the one for her intended's ID number blank. 
The man came and stood by her legs, where she could clearly see his shiny brown shoes just over the edge of her paperwork. He cleared his throat. Excuse me? She followed his legs up to his lean torso, then up his blue striped tie, and finally met his dark chocolate gaze. He was handsome, so much more so than Owen. She'd thought Owen's chiseled jaw and prominent cheekbones made him irresistible, but his lies told another story. This guy had a nice jaw, too, but his face was rounder, less harsh. He had medium brown hair that stood up in the front, but it was his eyes that caught hold of her and wouldn't let go. Dark brown and full of warmth, they caused her to feel as though he were the first person to ever look, really look, at her. May I sit here? She blinked at the casualness of his question. Here she'd been drowning in his gaze, sinking into the depths of his soul, and he wanted to sit. Of course. She pulled her purse closer to her thigh and scooted over to make room for him. Thank you. His voice was nice, the kind that could project across the room and make every person in it think they were talking right to him. Or maybe that was just how it worked on her. She shifted slightly, uncomfortable with a growing sense of awareness when it came to her bench partner. She was getting married today. She shouldn't be having these feelings for a stranger. And if she was, should she be getting married? Ack, there were so many questions, but it was too late. She would not walk out and leave Seth at the, well, not altar, but the judge's chambers. That was low. Maybe she could confide some of her worries in him. Perhaps he had a few of his own. The man let out a low groan. As much as she was trying not to notice how nice he smelled, clean with a hint of manliness, she couldn't ignore the way it made her stomach swirl. Is everything okay? She barely whispered. She should not engage him in conversation. He just sounded upset, and she'd always been a sucker for someone in need. He half smiled her direction. I don't have half this information. I was hoping to get the paperwork done before my fiancé arrived. He was getting married, too. Probably to a stunning brunette with eyes as dark as his. They'd have beautiful babies and travel the world, taking pictures of them in front of landmarks. She shook the image from her mind because she'd inserted herself in that picture, and the kids were blonde like her. She needed to get a grip— it wasn't like she was a free woman who could eye up any man who sat next to her. Don't worry, I don't have much more done than you. She lifted her clipboard to show him so he wouldn't feel so bad. He glanced over it and chuckled. Evie Williams? She bit her lip. Moose Hollow was large in some ways and small in others. Was this one of Owen's buddies? Would the man assume she was getting married on a rebound like Maisie did? Yes. She replied carefully. He stuck out his hand. Seth Powell, I think we should consolidate our forms. She stared at his hand for a half second longer than was polite. You're Seth? A pastor? He nodded and looked at his still empty hand. Oh! She reached out and shook hands with him. A sense of well-being and peace flooded her at contact and soothed the troubled waters of her mind, like she was right where she was supposed to be. Sorry, I was expecting someone... Older? More pastorish. Her hand grew warm inside of his, and she reluctantly pulled it away, handing him her clipboard. Sorry, it's just... My pastor had gray hair and a gold tooth. He gave her a shrewd look before he ducked his head and filled in his half of the information. You'd marry someone with gray hair? Well, I figured if I got here and he was that old, I could run away and he couldn't catch me. He burst out laughing and the tension inside of her released. She ducked her head. Sometimes I say things I should probably keep inside. Please don't. You're delightful. She wrinkled her nose. I don't know many men who use the word delightful. She pulled her lips in. There she went, saying things before she thought them through. I hosted a bingo night with a lot of old women. Picking up their slang is an occupational hazard. She giggled. Are there others I should know about? 
That's the worst of it. He playfully swiped at his brow. She smiled, feeling both at ease and slightly out of her comfort zone. Seth wasn't what she'd pictured. He was way better than the middle-aged pastor in her head. His youth and fun personality also came with a few difficulties. She liked him. Liked him enough that she could make him her best friend. I think I can live with being delightful. The door to the judge's chambers whooshed open, flooding the room with pomp and purpose. All joking faded under the stern gaze of the judge. They were ushered inside the small room with a large desk. When Seth took her hand for the ceremony, a sense of belonging filled her soul. The certainty didn't last for long as Seth was told he could kiss the bride. She panicked, not because she didn't want to kiss him, but because she did. He bent down and gave her a chaste kiss, their lips barely brushing. Heat flooded her entire body and her knees went weak. She clutched his hands for support and chastened herself. Of all the times to go goo-goo over a guy, she had to pick her wedding day. Chapter 4. Seth I know it's a mess, but I'm not afraid of hard work. Seth wanted to reach out and touch Evie's arm in condolence or support or just to make sure she didn't run away but he'd found out that touching her made his head go blank. Kissing her had almost knocked him over, so he refrained. They'd driven separately to the small house behind the church. He'd hoped to soften the rundown look with words of promise as he painted a picture of their future together. She looked like she wanted to hide in the bushes. Confession? I haven't been inside. He stuffed his hands in his pockets. The board promised it was livable. She smiled indulgently. They just said that so you'd take the job. His chest warmed. She'd been nothing but grace since the moment they'd met. He couldn't believe that her good spirits would last. His experience with women told him that the sunshine eventually dimmed. She did have a unique quality about her, though. Something deep and abiding that spoke to his very soul. He hoped he learned to trust it. To trust her over time. What he felt, more than anything else in this moment, was that he'd married far above his station in life. Dear Lord, I hope you aren't mad at me for this. Everything about Evie, from the elegant tilt to her nose to the softness in her touch, said that she was one of God's chosen women. That's kind of you, he said, unsure how much of the trepidation of his job situation he should share with her. How much sharing would cause her to run for the hills but I'm still not sure they want me here. Being married to you will improve their opinion of me greatly. She put her hand on her hip. Ah, what a sweet thing to say. He flushed, deeply. She turned to face the front of the house and gave it a critical eye. Tell me what you think needs doing. She changed out of her skirt sometime between the ceremony and arriving here. He wasn't sure how she'd manage that one, but he was glad. Had she been in that beautiful dress he wouldn't have let her near the house that time forgot. The grass, the flower beds have more weeds than flowers, the tree needs to be trimmed back, new mulch, the rail on the front porch should be stabilized. He looked around, seeing more but afraid to list it. Already they had several days' worth of work ahead of them, and I'd like to have a summer picnic here. Evie's face lit up. That's a wonderful idea, There's plenty of space for folding tables, and the lawn is big enough to set up some games. With enough food, we might even draw in the teenagers. His heart plummeted at the mention of teens. There aren't many teenagers to draw in. There has to be some. She spun in a circle, taking in the houses on the other side of the street. This is a residential area. I'm sure there's kids out there. He circled his arm out toward the building. There just aren't some in here. He waved to the church building. Oh. She mulled that over. Well, we'll just have to change that then, won't we? I had an amazing youth group growing up. I'd love to be a part of one now. I mean, as a supervisor. Before he could come up with a response to her matter-of-fact declaration that they'd change the makeup of the congregation, which the board was firmly set against, 
She clasped her hands together in front of her and gave him a pleading gaze. Please tell me there's a riding lawnmower. He thought back to his brief glance in the gardening shed when touring the ministry. I believe there is. She bounced on her toes. That's for me, then. I've always wanted to try one. He laughed. You want to start yard work? Now? Well, standing here's not getting anything done, she joked. But I didn't... I mean, you don't have to do any of this. He threw both his arms wide. He'd had every intention of rolling up his sleeves, but he hadn't given a thought to what she would do while he pruned and weeded. What are you talking about? We're married. She wiggled the impossibly small diamond on her left hand at him. Do you think Noah actually built the ark by himself? Well, I... She shook her head and winked at him. His heart shook as if thundering. Did you see that? In awe of the woman, he walked toward the barely discernible path in the grass that would take them into the backyard. Come on back. Let's see if we can get it going. Her work ethic would be a credit to them both. He shoved open the shed door. It protested loudly, crying out for some grease and loving care. The inside of the shed was clean and organized. In the middle of the space was a mustard yellow mower. He stepped back with a flourish. Your carriage, my lady. She hopped on, the seat protesting loudly. She glared down at it. That wasn't very polite. He pulled in his grin. He was grateful that he enjoyed her company, but the amount he enjoyed it alarmed him. If he'd met Evie any other way, he'd throw out his ban on dating and take her to the movies. He couldn't very well do that with his wife, whom he'd promised a platonic relationship. He'd have to stick to work and the work and minimize the time they spent together. Just how he was going to do that had him scratching his head. The lawnmower started right up, and he jumped out of the way as she lurched through the door. Yeehaw! She raised one arm over her head. The mower veered left, and she hurriedly grabbed hold of the wheel with both hands, laughing as she mowed a crooked path. He shook his head. If working with her was always this much fun, he was in big trouble. Chapter 5. Seth Later that night, after the yard was mowed, edged, and mostly weeded, the two of them were worn to the point where talking took too much energy. Seth ushered Evie inside. She dragged her feet going up the three stairs to the front door. Her suitcase sat in the same spot where she'd left it earlier. A sense of shame washed over him. I'm so sorry. I should have thought this whole day through more. What a wedding day failure. What do you mean? She asked. He shouldered his own duffel bag and pulled open the screen door. It's our wedding day. Heat flooded his face. I mean, we should be celebrating or something, not getting grass stains on our knees. She glanced down at her clothing. Covered in green and brown stains and a few weed stems, she was disheveled and work-worn. To his surprise, when she lifted her chin, there was a smile on her face. I can't think of a more appropriate way to start this journey together. You're going to need to expound on that one. He bumbled his way in, trying to manage his bag and the screen and wooden doors, which both seemed to want to close him between them. She set her bag just to the right of the door and brushed off her hands as she looked around. This will be a life of work, so working together on our home is a great start. He didn't miss the way she stumbled over the word home. As brave as she appeared, she was still worried, maybe scared about how this was all going to turn out. And she hadn't touched him since the wedding. Not that he expected her to be all over him or anything, but she'd almost touched him several times and then backed off. The fact that he felt the distance between them made him wonder if he was being too sensitive. There was just something about Evie that had him aware of things he wasn't normally. Like his heart rate. It kicked up over and over again this afternoon. His laugh. He would never paid much attention to it, but he'd caught himself laughing out loud several times today. Each time, he'd noticed and marveled at the pure joy that had blossomed inside of him. And it was all because of Evie. A strong need to provide for her filled his chest. He couldn't very well rub her shoulders or draw her a warm bath. 
An idea hit and he brightened because there was something he could do. I'm going to order pizza. Any requests? I'll eat anything. Her eyes grew wide and she glanced quickly away. I mean, I'm not picky. He lightly touched her arm, drawing her eyes back to him. With all sincerity, he said, I truly don't deserve you. Her eyebrows came together. Because I don't have a pizza preference? She asked. He nodded. A lifetime of not arguing over pizzas or ordering half this and half that is a blessed life indeed. She broke into a grin. You have mighty low standards for a preacher. He chuckled. There she went again, giving him a hard time in a way that made him feel like he was in a bubble, floating through the house. The interior wasn't as bad as the yard. There was fresh paint in the living room, and the wood floors, though covered in a thin coat of dust, were in good shape. He pulled out his phone and placed the order. We're in luck. They said they'd be here within 15 minutes. She stretched her arms over her head and smiled. What? I've never met a pastor who considered themselves lucky. He shrugged. You never married one before, either. Today is all about firsts. They explored the house together, finding three bedrooms, one of which had been turned into a home office. There were two baths, one in the hallway and one in the master bedroom. The rooms were small but furnished, which was great because everything he owned fit in his car. A knock announced dinner, and they hurried the warm box back to the kitchen. It's not much of a wedding banquet, I'm afraid. He opened the lid, and the intoxicating aroma of fresh crust and marinara sauce hit them both with full force. His stomach growled. Stop apologizing, she moaned and reached for a paper napkin. If you say a long prayer over the food, I'm going to make you sleep in the garden shed. He bowed his head, a smile on his face, and said the blessing as fast as he dared. He contemplated adding a long list of parishioners by name just to tease her, but he had no desire to sleep with a fertilizer. She was right, though. He needed to stop apologizing. It was just that she was so wonderful, and he was so... not... The things he brought to the marriage seemed small and undeserving of her brightness. Evie dug in, the cheese leaving strings over the side of the box. This is the best wedding dinner ever. She took another large bite and chewed slowly, savoring it. I have to agree. He leaned back in his seat and set a napkin over his chest. His lower back thanked him and his feet thudded sorely with his heartbeat. She took a second to look over the kitchen dining area, and he did the same. They were seated at a round table with three chairs. It could use some sanding and stain, but it was solidly made. The sink was under a window that looked out over the yard. The cupboards were all open. Someone from the church must have cleaned after the last pastor had moved out. There wasn't a cup, dish, spoon, or napkin to be found. I guess we'll need to buy some things. He tapped a lower door with his foot, shutting it. Like plates. She lifted another napkin and wiped her lips. I thought you were going to pack the plates, he teased. She lifted a shoulder. My old roommate owned the house and everything in it. You? Confirmed, bachelor. I eat out a lot. She laughed lightly. You have a beautiful laugh, he said in a husky, intimate voice he didn't know he had. She paused, and the laugh cut short as her cheeks turned dusty pink. The sound died between them, creating an awkward little monster. Her face paled, and she dropped her eyes to the cream tile. He instantly regretted his actions. I relaxed into this too fast, he backpedaled. She bit her lip, and he hurried to explain what had happened to him, even as the knowledge poured into his mind. I think that knowing we're married and there aren't any dating games to deal with had me feeling more comfortable than I should. Plus, they'd been joking all afternoon about being married now. She talked about being his wife and having a husband. The camaraderie was tentative, really. He should have known better. No, I want you to feel comfortable around me. He did. He couldn't explain how easy it was to be with her. Perhaps she wasn't as comfortable with him, though. Maybe we should get to know one another more? That might help. That would be good. 
she took a small bite of pizza. As in, good, that will help me feel better, or keep talking so I can figure out if you're a weirdo. The second one, she said from behind a napkin as she finished her bite. Her eyes crinkled at the corners. He wiped his fingers clean. What would be the best way for her to meet him? If he were just introduced to her, he'd start at the beginning. Let's see. I was raised by a single mom, and I had my come-to-Jesus moment my junior year of high school. I went to college on financial aid and worked as an assistant pastor in Colorado for a couple of years before applying for this position. How did you find out about it? I didn't even know this church was here, and I've lived here my whole life. He lowered his brow. The calling to Moose Hollow had been a personal feeling, one that he'd kept between him and God. Until now. Instinctually, he knew Evie would understand. I felt impressed to come here about six months ago. I waited tables, not really sure why I'd uprooted my life. Then one day a woman came in wearing a church hat. You know, the kind with the feathers and flowers and such. Evie nodded. She spoke about their pastor dying and how the church needed a new one. I got the information and applied the next day. I was in the right place at the right time. Wow. She set down her crust, staring at him like he was a science experiment. What about you? What brings you into this marriage? She smiled without showing her teeth. Are you going to ask me what a nice girl like me is doing in a marriage like this? Maybe after your story. Because you don't know if I'm a nice girl, right? I have a feeling you're the nicest girl. Her cheeks dusted pink and she chewed her lip. When she looked up, there was a storm of painful clouds in her eyes. His heart yearned to be a harbor of peace where she could leave the clouds behind. But that wasn't the type of marriage they had. He couldn't hold her in his arms and whisper words of assurance in her ear or kiss away her sorrows. I was your typical suburban child. I have a brother and a sister. They're both out of state and deep into their own lives. I was raised with Jesus from day one. My parents are in Africa on a mission for as long as they can be. They love the work. Her eyes unfocused as she looked inward. I was a shy girl, except in church. I loved to sing in the choir. In a blink, she was right back in this room. I can't lead music or play the organ. Shoot, you weren't looking for a choir director, were you? He shook his head. I've got that covered. She sagged with exaggerated relief. He swallowed back telling her about his guitar and love for music. Even though he thought she'd be supportive, it was such a big part of who he was that he wasn't ready to share it with her yet. That was okay. Even if she never sang in front of anyone, he'd be happy just to know she appreciated music. Anyway, skip a few years. I worked, but I wasn't happy there. So when I saw your ad, I answered it. And here we are. She spread her hands wide and then dropped them quickly. That was a good start, and a base for a lot of questions. Okay, lightning round Q&A. She sat up taller. Did you walk or ride the bus to school? He asked. Neither. We carpooled. You? Bus. Favorite ice cream flavor? Salted caramel. Mint chocolate chip, he said, without waiting for her to ask. Have you ever been in love? She opened her mouth and closed it again. He waited, but she didn't pop out an answer. A breath later, she gathered up the used napkins and stuffed them into the garbage under the sink. She didn't look at him, and the fun that they'd bantered between them now hid in one of the clean cupboards. He kicked himself for throwing in that question. It had popped into his head, and he hadn't filtered until it was too late. Thank you for a wonderful night. I think I'm tired. I'm going to make up a bed. The heaviness of the unanswered question was a gulf between them that he didn't know how to cross. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. It's not you. She put her hands in her back pockets. It's been a big day. Her words did little to assuage his worry that he'd messed up on their wedding day. She headed for the small hallway that led to the two bedrooms. Did you have a preference? She pointed in both directions at the same time. Take the one on the right. It was the master, and she'd have her own bathroom for privacy. We have a meeting with the board at eight tomorrow morning. Her eyes rounded. 
Do I need to do anything? No. They just want to meet you is all. Introduce themselves. She nodded and then yawned. I can handle that. There was no doubt in his mind that she could. She'd be gracious and beautiful and kind. Everything a pastor's wife should be, and more. Good night. She walked out of sight, and a few seconds later, he heard the bedroom door shut. He sat at the table for a few minutes. Realizing that they had over half a pizza left, he shut the lid and shoved the whole thing in the fridge. By not answering the question about having been in love, she had answered. Who was this man? How could he have been so stupid as to let her go? And why did the memories of it haunt her? Was she still in love? He clutched at the hope that she was not. He hadn't even thought about the possibility of marrying a woman who was in love with another man. That would be tragic. He drifted in and out of the other rooms in the house before finally going into his room and putting fresh sheets on the bed. After changing and a prayer, he cracked his door open in case she needed him in the night. Chapter 6 Evie Evie's hands shook with nerves as she and Seth stood outside the church doors. He hadn't been given the keys to the building, and Mr. White, the head of the church board, had said he'd meet them here to officially hand them over. The church itself was beautiful. Mature trees gave a beautiful background to a stone exterior and a steeple that could be seen for miles around. All of it spoke of a place of peace and love. She yanked her hand down, forbidding herself from chewing on her thumbnail ever again. She might not be so nervous if Seth wasn't fidgeting. He said Mr. White's name as if talking about the head of a university or something. She had this mental picture of a gray-haired man with a regal bearing and a stern countenance. She clutched her arms close to her chest and then, realizing she looked nervous, dropped them quickly to her side. Meeting the church board was harder than she'd anticipated. Seth looked devilishly handsome in a suit and a skinny tie. When he'd walked into the kitchen this morning, her stomach had soared on the wings of angels. Not devilishly handsome. Pastors didn't look that good. Or they shouldn't. Hers did. Oh man, she was so going to the underworld. The thoughts running through her head were not at all chapel-worthy. She'd promised a platonic marriage— but her thoughts kept straying to how easy it would be to wrap herself up in him. Desire was a normal part of being a woman, but she'd not experienced it at this level until Seth. Truly, when Maisie had asked if she could live platonically forever, she hadn't thought it would be a problem. It was quickly becoming one. When Seth had asked her if she'd ever been in love, she'd almost blurted out that she had— but then she started thinking about who she'd been with Owen as opposed to who she was with Seth, and she got all discombobulated. Love at first sight wasn't possible, yet she'd felt more alive weeding the flower beds with her new husband than she had in her entire relationship with Owen. What did that say about her understanding of love? And what did that say about her that she'd stayed with a man she might not have loved and even considered marrying him? All of that had flashed through her head as if heaven had opened a window and dumped a bucket of revelation. She'd been so tired she'd fallen asleep before she'd had a chance to think it all through. And then Seth had walked out of his room looking like a magazine cover model, and she hadn't been able to catch her breath since. Pastors should not be hot. They were supposed to be older men with kind eyes and wrinkles and bald spots. Men who didn't make women think of candlelight and romantic dinners and dancing in the kitchen cheek to cheek. A Cadillac pulled into the pockmarked parking lot. Here we go, Seth muttered under his breath. Evie elbowed him gently. Relax, we mowed the lawn. He owes you at least one paycheck for that, she joked. He grunted, but the stress lines in his forehead eased. You beat me here said the man she assumed was Mr. White. He had a wide smile on his face, and his hair slicked like a car salesman's. Not the sleazy kind that wanted to sell you a lemon, but the kind that wanted to see you in a Pontiac. He shook hands with Seth, who introduced her as his w -w wife He gave her a wide-eyed, silent apology. 
She pretended not to notice his stutter and ignored his apology. He'd done more than his fair share of apologizing last night for things that were outside of his control. They were both new at this whole marriage thing, but they'd get better at it. It wasn't like they were pretending to be married. They'd signed papers and said, I do. He was her legally wedded husband. No need to stutter over the title. Mrs. Powell, it's good to meet you. I'm Mr. White, head of the church board. Okay, hearing Mrs. Powell was strange. She gave Seth a whole lot more credit for making it through the introductions with the little grace he had. If she'd had to say her own name, she would have forgotten she was a Powell now. She pumped Mr. White's arm. It's nice to meet you. She pulled her hand away and smiled as sincerely as possible, which she realized made the cords in her neck stand out. She dropped the grin. She was trying too hard and knew it. One of the Powells standing here needed to get a grip. I'm mighty glad to meet you, he said. I can't lie, I wasn't keen on the idea of a single pastor. Not when he's this good looking, Evie waved like a game show beauty over Seth before hearing her own words. He turned red. Stop, she lightly slapped his chest. You're handsome and you know it. She sang the last sentence like a rapper. The laughter in his eyes threatened to bubble over, and he fought against it. Only watching him struggle made her realize he was trying to maintain a level of professionalism that she was systematically destroying. Chagrined, she clasped her hands in front of her and sealed her lips shut. God, please help me behave like Hannah and find a way to break the awkward feeling I created. Tires in the parking lot brought all their gazes to a charcoal gray hearst bumping over several potholes. It backed up to the handicap ramp, and the driver and an assistant, wearing matching black suits, jumped out. Not exactly what I had in mind, Lord. She glanced up at the sky, wondering if, now that she was married to a pastor, she had some sort of direct line. Had her prayer for deliverance brought the hearst? She hoped not. Of course, God did have a sense of humor, so maybe. What's this? asked Seth. Baptism by fire, my friend. Mr. White slapped him on the back. We had a call from another church in the area. This lady passed away just last night, and they already had a wedding booked for this morning. I guess the family had things all lined up except the time of death. I wonder if they placed bets, Evie quipped, and then she slammed her lips shut. Joking about someone's death was irreverent, something a pastor's wife should never be. She glanced back up at the sky, this time watching for lightning bolts that could strike her down. The corner of Seth's mouth twitched up, like he was trying not to smile. At least, she hoped that was why they twitched. She really did want to be a good preacher's wife. Mr. White gave her a sidelong glance, but moved on without commenting. They asked if we had an officiator yet, and I assured them you were gunning to get in the saddle. Well, sure. Seth gave her a wide-eyed look Mr. White couldn't see that screamed, What? She felt his panic. Officiating at a funeral was personal. Being asked to jump in at the last minute wasn't unheard of, but they'd planned to spend the day familiarizing themselves with the church building and going over the list of parishioners and their needs left behind by the last pastor before he died. It was eerie, like he'd had a premonition that his time on earth was up. Conducting a funeral wasn't on the schedule. She lifted her chin with a sense of determination. Life wasn't predictable, and she could roll with the punches. They could do this. She'd been to several funerals over the years, and surely Seth knew what he was doing. They must have had classes on this sort of thing in the seminary he'd attended. Let's go inside and give you the rundown. Mr. White showed them through the doors and into the small room off the chapel. The viewing will be in here. Don't worry, the mortician will set everything up. It's part of the package. The family should arrive around 10.30 he pointed at Seth. You'll conduct the meeting, introduce the speakers and such. They'll expect you to say a few words. Evie held her breath, wondering if he was going to back out. Sure, he spoke in front of people all the time, but there was an old saying that most people would rather be in the casket than give the eulogy. She would. Seth nodded sagely. I have a few passages I can use. Great. I'm not sure what the family expects. I'm sure they'll be grateful for anything. 
Mr. White rounded on Evie, and her palms went slick under his blue stare. This was a man who did important things in life. Her throat constricted, and she had to clear it. The lady's auxiliary offered to put on a lunch for the family after. You're in charge of the kitchen. Me? She squeaked. She'd never been in charge of anything, not even the cookie fundraiser for her Girl Scout troop. She'd hated selling door-to-door and dropped out the next year before the fundraiser came about again. She suddenly felt like that ten-year-old girl quaking on a porch step and praying no one was home. It's tradition for the pastor's wife to run things like this. Mr. White opened cupboards and left them hanging open. She wondered if he was the one who left the kitchen in the cottage that way, too. She suddenly had an overwhelming desire to check his house and see if any of the doors were shut. Maybe he was a pathological door opener. He continued speaking. The family will bring a check to cover paper goods. Everything you need is in here. He hooked his thumb over his shoulder to indicate the now disarrayed room. I'll be in with a few deacons setting up tables and chairs in the reception hall. Maybe next time you could have a few centerpieces for the tables. Um, um... Her brain stalled at all she had to do. Centerpieces? Sure. Something to make the place look nice. Were there specific table decorations for a funeral? Instantly, she pictured coffins and headstones. Somehow, she didn't think families would appreciate the humor. Her brain sped up. That was all she could come up with, and her brain ran with it, adding black streamers and balloons. Oh, help. She wasn't fit for this position. No one had said anything about running a kitchen or decorating tables. She just wanted to take meals to new moms and help people move. Maybe teach a Sunday school lesson to three-year-olds. Panic pulled in on her as she looked down a long life of not measuring up. Seth's hand found the small of her back. He was warm and soothing. In that small gesture, she suddenly felt like she wasn't alone in all this. Here he was leading a whole funeral for a woman he'd never met to a group of strangers. and She was fretting over setting out paper goods. She drew in a breath through her nose, letting it subdue her feelings of panic. Just today. All she had to get through was today. Sure, I'll start a Pinterest board. And open a Pinterest account and figure out what a board is, she thought. Looks like you two have it well in hand. Mr. White shoved his hands on his hips and rocked back on his heels. He was probably used to working with competent people who took his expectations in stride. Hey. A teenager popped his head in the door. Do any of you know where these programs go? Seth held out his hand. I'll take those and go hand them out as people come in. He made his way toward the viewing room. Mr. White and Evie followed him into the hall. Introduce yourself, son. Mr. White turned the other direction to supposedly set up tables and chairs. Seth's shoulders hunched at being called son, and a tangible sense of lowness swirled around him like he didn't quite measure up, like the word caused him pain. Not physical pain, but the kind that happened to the spirit. How Evie knew that being called son was what caused him to throw up a protective wall, she wasn't sure. She just knew. A lot of puzzle pieces fell into place all at once. Seth's nerves and the tone of voice he used, his embarrassment over her joking around in front of Mr. White, even though he'd joked with her the day before. Wow. Seth had something to prove, though she wasn't quite sure who he was trying to prove it to, himself or Mr. White. She glanced behind her at Mr. White's squared shoulders just before he disappeared into the gathering room. He may or may not have chosen his words carefully. She didn't know him well enough to know if he'd meant to sting like a hornet. She suspected he wasn't out to cause harm in the world, though maybe he liked to stay on top of the pile. She whipped back around and called out, Seth? He paused and turned to her. She scrambled for something to say that would ease the small wound, something that would build him back up to the man who had walked confidently into the judge's chambers yesterday and married her. The man who had confidence, not in himself, but because he chose to walk with God. She blurted the first thing that came to mind. Knock him dead. She gave him a thumbs up. A breath later, her words registered and her cheeks warmed. 
Why did her brain have to come up with the most inappropriate encouragement for a funeral? Seth's eyes crinkled at the corners as a real blossoming smile spread across his face. The result was breathtaking and thought-taking and knee-shaking. It was like watching all her teenage crushes smile in person. She'd had a thing for men with chin-length dark hair. Thank goodness he had a clean-shaven face. If he'd had scruff, she would have fainted right there. I think that's been taken care of, he winked, and her breath caught. I just have to make sure I don't put them to sleep. She smiled in relief that he wasn't offended. Sorry, I should have thought about what I was going to say. I'm glad you didn't. His brown eyes did that warming thing as he held her gaze for a moment longer. He headed down the hallway once more his shoulders back, and his spine straight. Her insides went all melty, and she sagged against the doorframe for support. Maisie would absolutely die if she knew how lucky Evie was. Not only did she get a good guy, but he had a sense of humor. One that matched hers, apparently. She didn't want to test that theory too hard, not on the second day since meeting in marriage, and certainly not at a funeral. Somber organ music began to play in the chapel, floating through the building like a fog of grief. She wiped her hands on her pants and determined to take charge of this luncheon and not do anything to distract from the memory of the deceased. She would be the model preacher's wife, even if it meant she had to literally bite her tongue. A steady flow of funeral casseroles, salads, cakes, and hams came in as the viewing progressed. Murmured voices and soft condolences floated down the hallway. The women who dropped off food didn't stay to talk. It was Saturday, and there were things to do for their families and in their busy lives. No one asked if she was the new preacher's wife, and she didn't volunteer the information. Evie had attended enough church to know how quickly interest spread and gossip started. Anonymity was her closest ally for the time being. Evie played word association games in an effort to remember names— but there were ones that slipped through the cracks of her frazzled mind as she laid out bags of rolls and scooted dishes around in the oven to make room for one more. The grieving family moved from the viewing room to the chapel for the funeral service, a procession of black dresses and long faces. By the time the food was all taken care of, Evie felt more like a Martha than a Mary, all cumbered about. What she really needed was some scripture— She stood in the hallway, just outside the open doors, listening to the hymn. Along with her need to calm her shaking hands, she was curious about what Seth would say. This was his first time at the pulpit in this building, and she wanted to be there to support him as well as listen. She had no idea what kind of a preacher he was. Hellfire and brimstone preachers were hard for her to listen to for weeks on end. Seth wouldn't be like that, would he? She couldn't imagine him pounding the pulpit and thumping the Bible. Something in the soft touch of his fingers on her back told her more about him than his ad had. He was full of a gentleness that spoke to her soul. She listened for a moment before sliding around the corner and standing in the back of the room. The building was older, but well-kept. The pulpit was in the center of the front of the room. Made of beautifully carved walnut wood, it shone with furniture polish and care. On either side were large windows that flooded the room with natural light. Directly behind the pulpit was a stained glass window, depicting an open tomb and light streaming down from heaven. The walls were eggshell white, and the floor was covered in light blue industrial carpet, easy for wheelchairs to traverse while keeping the noise level down. A vaulted ceiling was framed with large beams, stained dark. Evie wrapped her arms around her, feeling the welcome of being in a house of the Lord. Her spirit cried out that it missed the peace, the time spent with Jesus, the love that always seemed to fill a chapel like the hush over a room before something important arrived. Seth made his way to the pulpit. He was so handsome that her heart rate tripled. He started out by welcoming everyone to the life of Grace Ministry and thanking them for sharing this day with him. Evie settled into his voice. It was deep and abiding, strong like a river, yet calm. It had been a couple years since she'd been a part of a congregation. 
Owen had pulled her away from worship services with seemingly important activities on Sunday morning. Brunch with clients, last-minute adjustments to a presentation, food shopping. She hadn't realized how much she'd miss the peace in a church building until she walked back in. There were church hats. She'd love to see the different styles, accessories, and bright colors every week when she did attend. There were several beautiful hats today with black lace and flowers. She regretted letting Owen influence her so much. She'd thought she was making sacrifices out of love, but looking at it now, she realized how desperate she'd been to keep his attention, and she felt sick and stricken that she'd changed so much about herself for him. Her feelings must have been written on her face because when Seth spotted her, he lost his place, stopping mid-sentence. She nodded for him to continue, feeling awful for distracting him in the first place. It seemed she was failing at wifery all over this morning. He glanced down at his notes on his phone and picked back up again. He spoke of heaven and God's love for his children, of life being but a small part of eternity, and how beautiful it would be to praise the Lord forever. His words were poetic and from the heart, and she found herself floating away on the images he painted of angels guiding this dear woman to her mansion in heaven. She wasn't perfect, none of them were, but God's grace was bigger than their imperfections. Evie took a deep breath, drawing upon the Lord for strength to be better, do better. This was what a funeral should be, a place of refuge, a place to remember the past, and for the living to want to do, but bring, bring. Evie's thoughts were yanked about by an obnoxious ringtone. Everyone glanced about to see who hadn't silenced their phone. People whispered. Through it all, Seth maintained his composure and continued on as if nothing had happened. Evie refocused on him, ready to welcome the strength his deep voice welled up inside of her. A man sitting in the pallbearer section put his phone to his ear. Al, can you hear me? He spoke as if he were the only person in the room and Al was back in the kitchen. The attendees collectively gasped. All thoughts of communing with the spirit fled the room. Evie's mouth dropped open and she stared at the back of his head. Seth stumbled over his words and tapped his screen to bring it to life. He'd been on a roll but must have lost his place. He cleared his throat, but the man didn't put his phone away. Yeah, Mom died last night. No, I know. Well, there's not much I can do about it, is there? She was always late to everything. Seth's eyes widened, and he looked at Evie as if asking, Can you believe this guy? She put her hand over her mouth to stifle a giggle. It wasn't funny. The woman's son was rude. It was just, did he not know? She schooled her expression into a proper one of respect. Seth looked down and smoothed his tie before looking back at the congregation. Jesus said, Dang, Nabbit, a 30-incher? I knew I should have gone fishing with you guys. One of the other pallbearers elbowed the guy on the phone. He pulled the phone away from his ear and glared at the guy. Al caught a 30-inch rainbow, trip of a lifetime. He moved his phone back to his ear. Send me the video. I'll have Karen help me load it. She owes me after I put on this suit. Haven't worn a suit in six years, but she said if I didn't wear a tie, I'd be scooping dog poop off the lawn for the next month. Shoulders began to shake as others in the congregation worked to control their laughter. One woman squeaked loudly, her head down. Seth looked to the side, his lips pressed together in an effort at self-control. To his credit, he jumped back into his speech. Evie clamped both hands over her mouth to stifle her giggle. We're here to... Seth started. Reel it in. Come on, buddy. You got this, the man said to the video, which he apparently didn't need Karen to help him view. Giggles escaped through hands over mouths like they came from balloons, high-pitched and fast. The beautiful hats Evie admired quivered with silent laughter. Men coughed to cover up their chortles and children looked around, wondering what they'd missed. Seth brought his eyebrows together in a bemused expression. Their eyes met and he shook his head and lifted his shoulders slightly, asking Evie what he should do. She shrugged and sliced her hand across her throat, telling him to call it. Seth took her advice. The closing hymn will be... 
She ducked into the hallway, her stomach hurting with the effort to stay quiet. She made it to the kitchen before she giggled. A moment later, Seth rushed in, his eyes dancing with mirth. Organ music floated in behind him and cut off as he shut the door. Oh my gosh, he exclaimed. She laughed outright and scolded him in a hushed tone. What are you doing in here? He pointed at the door with one hand while holding his side with the other. He panted through his laughter. I couldn't compete with Al's 30-incher. She swiped the moisture from her eyes. You have to get back out there. He shook his head. Give me a minute. He swallowed and took a breath. I have to stop smiling. She nodded. A pastor can't laugh during a funeral. Heavens no, he agreed. She snorted a laugh. Who is that guy? I think he's a son-in-law. He dabbed at the happy moisture in the corner of his eye. She shook her head, her giggles dying down enough that she could breathe again. Well, after this, your first sermon should be cake. She stepped forward, touching his chest. A warmth, familiar and kind of scary, rushed through her at his nearness. The tone in the room changed from lighthearted to deep connection in an instant. Their eyes met and held. Time slowed down. Neither of them moved as their breathing became ragged and the sound of her pulse thrummed in her ears. The door flew open and a woman in a black dress and hat put her hands on her hips. We're headed to the grave. You coming, Pastor? Seth broke eye contact and stepped back, shaking his head like he had to clear it. Evie pressed a cool hand to her warm forehead. I'm coming he said. Good. Don't worry about Cal. He'd sit up in his own grave to talk about fishing. You did real good on your talk for not knowing Shelby. She was a spitfire, but she had a good heart. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Seth's words were as real as they were sincere. Evie found that she liked that about him. He didn't puff up his chest under a compliment, even a well-deserved one. You can ride in the hearst and Tony will bring you back. She strode off without waiting for his response. Well, he tugged on his tie. I guess I'm catching a ride with the undertaker. Be back in time for lunch, dear, she quipped, pretending to be busy and unconcerned, as if her husband riding around town in a car with a coffin in the back was an everyday occurrence. He chuckled. Life with you will not be dull, Evie Powell. She put her hand over her chest. I hope not. He smiled once more before leaving. Immediately, the room felt smaller, less bright without him in it. She looked at all the food on the counter and decided she'd better get to work setting it on the buffet tables. Things would settle down for the two of them after the luncheon. Although, she hoped they didn't. The funeral was the most fun she'd had in a long time. Was that twisted? Perhaps. But what was life, and maybe death, if it couldn't be laughed at? Owen didn't like that about her. He'd constantly reprimanded her for seeing the irony in things and getting a kick out of it. Dots connected, and she had another revelation about herself. She'd shut off or shut down happy parts of her personality for him. Like in the chapel, she recognized what she'd lost. Thankfully, Seth was different. She'd seen the light of her own laughter echoed in his eyes. That was a gift, and she wouldn't take it lightly. But she would take it, because it was of great worth. To her, especially. Chapter 7 Seth Seth stuffed his hands deep into his pockets as he and Evie walked the aisles of goodwill. When he'd suggested they try a hand-me-down store, she didn't bat an eye even though he could tell she'd never shop there. Her clothing was high quality and new. She wore makeup that looked expensive, or maybe it was her effortless beauty that made everything she did look classy. He was a heel not being able to buy her new things for the kitchen. What kind of a husband was he if he couldn't even buy them plates? But that was the life he'd signed up for, and she'd known he was a preacher when she'd married him. She was a diamond, and he was the rough. She deserved more than he could give her. What about this for the living room? She asked, holding up a painting of a bowl of fruit. An awful painting. The banana had three 90-degree angles, 
The frame was worse than the picture, made of barn wood with splinters poking out of one end. I... He hesitated, looking for a kind way to say what he thought. She laughed. I'm kidding. She set the frame down and stepped away, brushing her fingers across her jeans. He let out the breath he'd been holding and chuckled. I like that, though. He pointed to a lamp made from deer antlers. She looked him over with a sharp eye and then gushed falsely. Me too. Let's flip a coin to see who gets to keep it in their room. He pulled a quarter out of his pocket. Call it in the air. Tails. He caught the coin and flipped it over on the back of his hand. Ah, heads. You lucky duck. She elbowed him lightly. They walked right past the lamp and toward the kitchenware, neither of them stopping to pick it up. I have to ask you something. She stepped ahead of them and picked a plate up off of a stack on the shelf. It was blue with a darker rim and several chips. She put it back. Shoot. He leaned his forearms on the shopping cart, content to let her pick plates and bowls. Why didn't you get married before? She eyed another plate, this one purple. There were three matching bowls, but only one other plate. She put it back, too. I mean, you're funny, easy to be around, not too bad to look at. His chest filled up with something akin to caveman pride. What's the deal? He huffed out a breath as he tried to wrap words around the history that kept him from trying for a woman like her, a woman who was out of his league. Maybe he'd done something in this life to deserve her, though he wasn't sure what. More likely, it was God saying, You need some help, boy. I'm going to give you a boost. Let's just say I'm goodwill relationship material. You're chipped? She held up a black plate and pointed to the white scar. He nodded. Exactly. I'm not department store quality. You mean I settled? She placed her hand over her chest and gave him a teasing smile. Something like that. I didn't even start out new, though. I grew up in... He paused, searching for delicate words. A lower-income neighborhood and situation. That was putting it nicely. His dad was a slobbering drunk. Even though he was a happy drunk, he couldn't hold a job, and he was a bad husband and a worse father. His mom worked, but she drank to escape her own horrors. They'd split a few years ago. Not a surprise to anyone who knew them. Mom was sober now, but Dad had taken a turn for the worse. His mentor at the seminary had asked if he wanted to become a preacher to atone for his parents' sins. He hadn't had an answer for that, and he'd not spoken of his past since, which made Evie in his life all the more of a miracle. One he wanted to be worthy of, and not mess up. Was it possible for a person to mess up a miracle? Probably not. Miracles were literally the workings of God, and no one could mess with God's will. Evie's brow furrowed at his confession. Then again, if there was a way to mess up a miracle, he'd be the one to find it. His instinct was to brush his fingers over her forehead and wipe her worry away. He placed his hands over hers on the edge of the plate. I may not have come from a good place, but I want to go to one. I promise you, I will work hard for a good marriage and do my best for you. Her forehead smoothed and her shoulders lowered. That sounds like a department store promise to me. A shot of panic went through him. Her expectations were too high. If she wanted a family like the ones he'd seen at church, with little kids all lined up in matching bows and dresses, she was in for a big letdown. Because no matter how hard he tried, his past always came back to haunt him. Either he made a dumb mistake, or he dropped the ball, or he missed something important. He didn't know why he did those things, but he did. And the thought of doing that to Evie was truly dark and loathsome. His hands tightened on hers. I'm going to fall short, he rasped. She leaned slightly forward, as if taking him into her confidence. That's what grace is for. She slid her hands out from his, taking the plate with her. He stared as she switched out for the blue set with the most chips. This one. But it's damaged. She nodded. Most people would only see the damaged parts, but there's more smoothness and beauty than chips. 
She ran her hand around the edge, proving that the majority of the piece was intact. It doesn't have to be perfect to do what it was created to do. She proceeded to load the set of five dishes and five bowls into the cart with care. Seth watched in awe. His wife was beautiful, inside and out. If he was any kind of a gentleman, he'd push her away. But he couldn't bring himself to do it. A part of him craved being accepted and loved in the way she promised. He'd searched for it his whole life. But she'd never love him. That wasn't their deal. No matter what feelings she stirred up in his heart, he'd keep them from seeping out. The best thing he could do for Evie was keep her at arm's length. No matter how much, he wanted to pull her close. Chapter 8 Evie After finding plates and a few other kitchen essentials, Evie and Seth headed to the local box store for towels, hand towels, washcloths, and bathroom rugs. Evie tried to study her husband out of the corner of her eye. He was handsome in a rugged way, with chin-length hair and stubble on his cheeks that turned the color of honey in the sunlight. It was all kinds of beautiful. Not that she could tell him that. Nope. They were platonic in every sense of the word and would remain that way until death did them part. That was the deal, and she was a woman who kept her word. The butterflies in her belly swirled in all directions, making her doubt her earlier proclamation to Maisie that she could keep this up. She did have hope that she wouldn't have to hold out for another sixty-plus years. Eventually he'd go bald or something, right? She shifted in her seat, trying to stop staring at him. Seth had opened up about his past. Having listened to him preach, she never would have thought he'd come from a tough home life. He spoke of God's infinite love with conviction, as if he'd felt the Lord's light fill him. Perhaps it had. Maybe that was how he'd survived all that he'd been through. She wanted to ask him to tell her more, but things like that were better when they were uncovered like an archaeological site, one layer at a time. If she dug too deep, too fast, she'd damage things, precious things. It was better not to wish for something that couldn't be. This was the path God had placed her on, and she'd walk it, with him and for him. Perhaps she'd believe that it would be easy because it was his will. That was naive. They parked and hopped out. Seth glanced at his phone where he'd typed the list she'd dictated before they left the house. If you want to start in towels, I'll see what I can find for gardening tools. She grinned. Any requests for color schemes? He shook his head. She narrowed her eyes playfully. Really? If you're asking if I'll use a pink towel, the answer is, I'm man enough to wear pink. The image of him wrapped in nothing but a pink towel and droplets falling from his freshly washed hair filled her head, and her eyes popped open. As if reading the thoughts on her face, he ducked and hurried inside the store, veering toward the garden center. She had her eyes on the scuffed floor when an all-too-familiar voice called her name. In horror, she looked up to see Owen not two feet away. Usually she could sense him in the area as easily as smelling a dead skunk. She must have been too distracted by her husband to care much about her ex. Wasn't that a wonderful thought? How have you been? Owen asked, flashing his ultra-white teeth. If the power went out, he'd be able to light the way to the exit with those bad boys. Great, I got married. She held out her hand, showing off the modest ring. She didn't care that it was smaller than the one that Owen had given what's-her-name. She'd gotten married first. Take that. He blinked several times. Really? She bristled at his level of shock. Yes, really. That, that's great news. She folded her arms and regarded him with distrust. You seem surprised. Yeah, I mean, he scratched his nose. It hasn't been that long since we've... She snorted and flipped her hair over her shoulder. It only seems like I found someone fast because, unlike you, I waited until I was actually single to start dating. Low blow, he mumbled. The truth never hits below the belt, Owen. Her words were full of venom and vim that surprised even her. Where was this coming from? 
She wasn't the type of person to have an argument in the middle of a store. She looked around, hoping no one was watching the preacher's wife tell off a man she used to date. The phrase, what would Jesus do, ran through her head five times before she was able to get a handle on her snarling thoughts. It was like a large black guard dog lived inside of her, and the only one it ever wanted to tear to pieces was Owen. She worked to get the animal under control. Owen kept talking. I mean, I guess I'm more surprised that you were able to find someone who could handle your quirks. What quirks? she demanded. I'm trying, Jesus, I really am. I get credit for that, right? You know, the ones that drove me crazy. It was why I started dating. His phone rang and he was cut off. After answering, he pointed to the phone and mouthed, I have to take this, before walking away. She glared after him. Great to see you again, jerk. She flipped around and stormed to the bath section of the store and stared at the towels. What quirks? She didn't consider herself a peculiar person. In fact, she was one of the steadiest people she knew. She didn't run out and party on the weekends. When she gave her word, she followed through. And if there was a cat stuck in a tree, she'd climb up after it. Which she had actually done on one of her and Owen's first dates. Oh, those quirks. When she'd hop down with a frightened feline in her arms, Owen called her his superwoman. But maybe it was a peculiar thing to do on a date. She hadn't even thought about it at the time. Someone needed help, even if that someone had fur and a tail, and she'd jumped at the chance to take care of her neighbor. She couldn't leave the poor thing up there. Her body sagged. Had she really driven Owen into the arms of another woman? Not that she absolved him of his crime of cheating. That one was on Jesus to take care of. But was she really that bad to be around? That hard to commit to? And if so, what chance did she have at keeping Seth happy for the rest of their lives, without a physical relationship? She tried to focus on the towel options. They had any stripe of the rainbow to choose from. Several sherbet colors caught her eye, as did a Hawaiian print. They had a few of those left, with huge flowers on them and beautiful reds, pinks, and sunset orange. She reached for one, her hand stopping just before making contact with the fluffy fabric. Owen would have told her to pick something neutral that would last longer because brighter colors went out of style faster. His voice mocked her. She reached for the drab, tan bath mat and matching washcloths. Playing it safe was better. Seth had joked about using pink, but she wouldn't make him do that. She would have before she'd run into Owen, but there were parts of her that she could curb in order to make this marriage last. Seth was a good man, and she would respect him. They were just starting out, but she seriously questioned her ability to make this marriage work. First, she'd embarrassed Seth in front of Mr. White by joking at the funeral. Then she'd gone and picked those chipped plates he didn't want. He told her they were too broken, and she'd bought them anyway. The tan towels were the best choice. Chapter 9. Evie Evie's first Sunday was what she'd expected. Lots of curious looks, questions, and introductions. She'd managed to not embarrass herself or Seth by keeping her mouth shut and listening a lot which was good. The congregation was made up of over 65-year-olds who were happy to chat about their grandchildren, their ailments, and their opinions on the state of the world. When she woke up on the second Sunday, she had a pit in her stomach. The expectations, the curious eyes, all of it crashed on her the moment her alarm went off that morning. She dressed and walked with Seth to the church to open it up. Evie grabbed the stress ball off Seth's church office desk and began tossing it back and forth between her hands. He stood, reading through his notes, closing his eyes every now and again to memorize something. You realize that we work harder on Sundays than any other day of the week. He glanced up at her. It's ironic because it's supposed to be the day of rest. He chuckled. A day of rest from the cares of the world. He dipped his head, back to his notes. She nodded, thinking about the cares she held in her heart. They centered on the man standing in front of her and didn't drop from her shoulders, no matter what day of the week the calendar showed. 
Do you like the plates we bought? They're fine. He waved one hand. She stared at the top of his head. I mean, if it had been up to you, which plates would you have picked? He lifted a shoulder. She pressed her lips together, decidedly unsatisfied with the way the conversation went. All she needed was a little direction. With Owen, it had been so easy. He told her exactly what he thought about everything. Every little detail. She rubbed her hand over her throat. Is it warm in here? She fanned her face and headed to the window. Throwing it open, she leaned out, gasping for fresh air. There was a lilac bush in bloom, and its fragrance soothed her anxiety. She hadn't realized just how suffocating Owen's opinions had been. Even the memory of them sent her into a tailspin. Are you okay? asked Seth. She gulped. Fine. Taking one more deep breath full of calming lilac, she pulled herself back inside. I'm good. She brushed off her skirt, her eyes sweeping over the guitar set next to the bookshelf. She'd heard him play at night in his room, through the shut door. You should play something during your sermon. The idea was like a bolt of lightning, and it lit her on fire. He shied back from her. No, I I don't play well in front of others. What does that mean? His phone dinged an alarm, and they both checked the large clock ticking away on the far wall. It's time to go in. He effectively avoided her question. She let it slide. He couldn't avoid her forever. He rubbed his stomach as he mumbled. Were you speaking to me? She put down the stress ball and picked her clutch off the desk. She wore a navy skirt with white piping that flared at the knees and a white cardigan summer sweater set. The white wedges and clutch rounded out the outfit and made her feel stylish, young, and flirty, exactly like Hannah and the woman she was supposed to be. I was actually pleading for grace. I could use some enabling power right about now. Her stomach sank. She'd been so worried about her own insecurities, she hadn't even thought about his. Are you really nervous? You did so well last week. Everyone said how much they enjoyed your sermon. He nodded. I know, it's just today feels bigger, like something important is going to happen. Her eyes got big. Do you get feelings like that a lot? What do you think it is? He shrugged. I have no idea. I've only ever had this feeling once before. When? The day I married you. He touched her elbow. She melted and put her hand over her heart. Seth Powell, sometimes you say the sweetest things. He reached out to guide her out the door, his hand on her lower back. She sent up her own plea to heaven that Seth wouldn't be able to hear the thundering of her heart induced by his touch. They stepped into the hallway and he turned to lock his office. He handed her the keys and she dropped them in her purse. He didn't like them in his pocket, ching-chinging while he paced in front of the congregation. You're going to do great. You're serving the Lord. He will walk with you. She checked to make sure his shirt was free of wrinkles. He looked good, freshly shaven, which was a shame. She really liked him with scruff, and he didn't seem to like to shave because he'd only done it twice this week. She didn't dare ask why, because it felt too intimate. They shared a living space, yet there were things she couldn't talk to him about, like her fears that she was going to drive him away by being an oddball. We he began, and she almost swooned over his use of the word we. Oh, how she loved the sound of that we. Have our fair share of octogenarians. Which we're going to change. Somehow, some way, we'll figure out how to bring more families in. We can do this. She brushed her hand over his shoulder, removing invisible lint. It was a good excuse to touch him, something she'd been doing more of lately. He paused for a moment, a look of wonder on his face. I believe you. She blushed under his gaze. It was so honest, so admiring. No man had looked at her like that before. Knock him dead. She punched him in the shoulder, proving that she could take an already awkward moment and make it even worse. He nodded, his lips pressed firmly together. I'll try. They walked down the hall together. Evie was acutely aware of how close their hands were. 
It would be so easy to reach over and hold hands with him as they walked. She talked herself out of it and made a fist to keep the appendage from getting any ideas of its own. The chapel was half full. There were some beautiful hats to admire as she took her seat in the back. Maybe she should sit up front to show her support for Seth, but there were several elderly people with hearing problems taking up the first few rows. Right as Seth cleared his throat to welcome them, a nurse in pink scrubs that clashed horribly with her red hair pushed a man in a wheelchair through the door. Sorry, she held up a hand. I'm sorry we're late. She set him at the end of a row next to one of the few small families in attendance. The Mitchells had one little boy, Jerome, who was about five, and another on the way. They'd been the first group to welcome her last Sunday, and their beautiful little family was so easy to remember in this group of predominantly bald heads. The little boy stared at the older man wrapped in a plaid quilt and slumbering away. Jerome reached out a finger as if to poke him. Sam, the dad, shoved his arm back to the side and gave him a look that told him to hold still or else. The nurse leaned over Jerome and stage-whispered to Sam, I'm just going to leave him here for a minute and catch a smoke outside. The man suddenly lurched about, making his chair rattle. Is he okay? asked Camille. She absently ran her hand over her swollen belly. She was due any day now. Oh, he's fine, the nurse batted away her concern. He likes the music, might even try to dance. She winked and rushed out the door, tapping her box of cigarettes against her palm as she went. Welcome, everyone. Seth's deep voice filled the room, drawing attention away from their visitor. Evie drew in a breath, relishing the sound of Seth's voice. He had the power of speech within, soothing and yet commanding. He gave the opening prayer, and then they all sang together. Evie watched to see if the old man would indeed try to dance. He held pretty still. He was pale and leaned precariously toward the pew. Jerome looked at him more often than not. It was like he couldn't stop. Sam nudged him and pointed to the words in the hymnal. Evie glanced at the back doors, wondering how long the nurse would be out. After the music ended, Seth began his prepared sermon about Peter the Beloved. I think we can all relate to Peter's need to provide for his family and his desire to serve the Lord. He had real-world concerns. There were nods. Evie's heart warmed, and her love for the people in the congregation grew as she watched them support her husband. Seth hadn't come from a place of love. He'd landed in one, though. At least, she hoped so. The members of the board had stony faces. There were two teenagers in attendance today, but there should be more. She talked to Seth about starting that youth program again. They almost had the yard under control, and she'd have some free time. Seth continued. Worldly concerns might have been what Peter struggled with when he asked the Lord if he could join him on the water. Evie's eyes dropped shut as the words and his rich voice flowed through her. He continued to open up the story of Peter, who leapt over the side of the boat in eagerness, but then saw the waves and the storm and the threats and the fears and began to sink. It was as if Seth had been created for the purpose of weaving together this truth to speak peace to her soul. Her desire to be better, to be the disciple who would leap from the boat to join Jesus, swelled within her. Suddenly, someone cried out. Her eyes flew open to find the source of the interruption. Jerome jumped up on the pew and pointed to the visitor. I think he's dead. He poked him in the shoulder before Sam could grab him. Wake up, dude, he yelled. The whole room gasped as one. Seth's words cut off. Sam grabbed for Jerome. Evie shot to her feet and ran over, not sure what she was going to do, but willing to help. She leaned down in front of the stranger. Sir? She gently shook his shoulder. Seth was suddenly behind her, his hand on her back. Where's his nurse? She asked. A strange sense of calm came over her and a part of her knew that this man's spirit had passed through the veil, and he was already with his maker. I'm right here. Led by Mrs. Green, who must have run out first thing, the woman walked in as if she had until resurrection morning to figure this out. She bent down and thumped him in the shoulder. Yep, 
He's dead. Told you, Jerome said to his dad. Sam shushed him. Shouldn't we do CPR? Evie asked in astonishment at the nurse's blasé attitude. She'd never seen anyone die before. The little boy stared at the body. She got the feeling that if there was a stick around, he would have poked the man with that, too. She stepped in front of him. His mom grabbed him and scooted to the other end of the pew. But I want to touch him. If he's dead, he won't care. Evie coughed to cover her laugh. Thank goodness he wasn't traumatized. Little boys. The nurse took out her phone and checked the time. The smell of cigarette smoke lingered around her. We were expecting it to be any day now. He told me last night that his dying wish was to go to church once more. Looks like it all worked out. She grabbed the wheelchair handles and addressed Seth. Mind if I keep him in your office, preacher? I have to make some phone calls. Seth opened his mouth and shut it again. He was clearly at a loss. The Christian thing to do was to offer the space, but she could tell a part of him didn't like the idea of trying to keep a corpse on ice in the room where he sought heavenly guidance. There wasn't really another option, though. The kitchen was too warm this time of day due to the south-facing windows, and the gathering hall was too big and not at all private enough. The gentleman deserved a bit of privacy and respect. Well, his remains did, anyway. Evie stepped in front of Seth. I'll show you the way. She waved her arm like a gracious hostess, but this was the oddest get-together she'd ever seen. Seth stepped beside her, his hand on her lower back. You okay? He whispered in her ear. Evie nodded, grateful that he cared enough to think of her in this crazy moment when his carefully prepared sermon had been derailed. You know I was kidding when I told you to knock him dead, right? She said out of the corner of her mouth. He pinched her side, and she clamped her lips on her squeal. Tease, he called her. She was too busy trying not to laugh to respond. You gonna finish your preaching? Mr. Green called out. He was a no-nonsense kind of man, who wore an army ball hat right to the doors of the building and took it off the moment he stepped inside. It was sitting on the bench next to him. Evie shooed Seth toward the front of the room. Go, you haven't even gotten to the best part yet. He shook his head. This is crazy. She lifted a shoulder. Life is crazy. Why should death be any different? He gave her an appraising look. That's profound and funny. If you use it in a sermon, you have to give me credit. She winked and moved into the lobby, walking just in front of the wheelchair. The sounds of people turning around in their seats and settling faded away as they got into the foyer. You two are a cute couple said the nurse. I'm Terry, by the way. Evie, it's nice to meet you. She unlocked the office door and moved to the side, holding the door so it wouldn't swing shut on the wheelchair. So, can anyone come to your church, or do you have to pay a fee or something? Terry pushed the wheelchair around and maneuvered the occupant up to the desk as if he were going to write a letter. Evie shook off the image of him coming to life and typing out an email. At least his eyes were closed. Everyone is welcome. Well, I might just bring my Scott by. He could use some straightening up. Your preacher's story was real pretty. She crossed the room. I'm going to crank up the AC. Don't want him to stink up the place. Evie chewed her lip. Exactly how long did it take for a body to start decomposing? Wasn't there a three-day rule of thumb on that? H how long do you plan on leaving him? Just until the coroner gets here. Terry fished out her phone. I'm calling now. Okay, but we have a strict no-dead-bodies-overnight policy, Evie joked. Terry glanced up from her screen. Shoot, I'd better get going then. The way she said that made Evie grateful she'd created the policy just then. She hesitantly wondered what other kind of odd rules they should make, and did they need to post them in the lobby? She stood there for a moment, not sure what the proper etiquette was in this situation. Every time she looked at the dead man, she felt like she was invading his privacy, so she let her eyes roam over the bookshelves. Do you need anything? I'm fine. Terry started talking to the person on the phone. Evie slipped out the door and breathed a sigh of relief. After dithering for a moment, she decided to skip back home and down a diet soda to give her the strength to get through the rest of the afternoon. 
Storing corpses wasn't in the job description, she mumbled to the Lord as she slipped out the door. The warm spring sunshine did wonders for her case of the heebie-jeebies. The poor dead man, she didn't even know his name, hadn't meant to freak her out. He was just passing from this world to the next, minding his own business, when he'd inadvertently tripped into her life. Lord, everything happens for a reason, so I'm awfully curious what you've got up your sleeve here. She'd just opened the fridge door when someone pinched her side. She shrieked and flipped around, shoving her backside into the open fridge. Seth Powell, she scolded. He laughed, tipping his head back and looking far too good for any man of God. Sorry, I saw you sneak over here. Aren't you supposed to be preaching? She scolded, removing herself from the fridge. Lucky for him, the jello salad was still intact. Aren't you supposed to be babysitting a dead guy? She smacked his chest. Don't disrespect the dead. His mouth hung open. He started it. How? She demanded, her hand on her hip. He literally died of boredom in the middle of my sermon. If that's not an insult, I don't know what is. Though he was joking, there was a hint of insecurity behind it. Evie grabbed his arms and squeezed, trying to convey a sense of strength and belief in him. I think your sermon was so beautiful that it opened the pearly gates and he just walked right through. Seth's eyes warmed, and his hands came up to cup her elbows. Evie, he whispered, sometimes you say the sweetest things. His eyes dropped to her lips. Without thinking, she moistened them. Her heart sped up and her breath became hot. He dropped his hand. I don't want rumors to start that I have the key to the pearly gates. Our regulars will be too afraid to show up. She rolled her eyes. You... Her retort was interrupted by Ryan Porter pounding through the back door. He was the other teenager in their congregation. A good kid, wiry in builds, he wore thick glasses and a ready smile. Pastor Powell, he panted, the closing hymn's almost over. If you don't hurry, everyone will know you snuck out. Shoot. Seth dropped his hold on Evie and burst out the door at a run, his tie flapping. Feeling so much more alone than she had just a moment ago, Evie rubbed her elbows. How could a man fill the room so entirely? She absently picked up her diet soda can. Ryan glanced at her drink. You gonna drink that? He swallowed loudly. She glanced down and then handed it over, not even sorry to see it go. Thanks for keeping an eye out for him. She opened the cupboard and fished out a package of cookies, offering him those as well. He nodded as he ripped into the container and shoved one into his mouth. Any time. He took a swig of the soda and sauntered out of the kitchen. Evie shook her head. What in the world have I gotten myself into? First, there was the dead man in the church office, and she'd put him there. If people hadn't already questioned her ability to be a good preacher's wife, that might just tip the scales. Second, she'd married a man in name only. Well, he had become her friend, but even that friendship was tainted by the lie they played for the rest of the world. Third, she wanted to be married to Seth for real, to know she belonged in his heart and not just in the ring on her finger to be able to kiss him whenever she wanted, which was quite often. She leaned against the counter, wondering what kind of a person she was to think that a half-marriage was a good enough marriage. Because when it came right down to it, she was happier here than she'd been anywhere else with anyone else. What did that say about her? Chapter 10 Seth Something was wrong with his wife. Seth couldn't figure out what it was, and it was driving him crazy. Evie was so vibrant when they'd married, so full of life that it spilled out of her and flooded the people she came into contact with. But now, she was less bright than she'd been. He stared at a picture on the wall in his office of Jesus pulling Peter out of the water, lifting him higher to solid ground, which was always an interesting thought because the water was no more stable than it had been moments before when Peter had sunk. The only thing that changed was Peter. Evie was like Peter. Bold, daring, constantly expressing her love for the Lord. 
The only thing Seth could come up with was that he was dragging her down. Somehow his inner darkness and past were contagious. She still smiled. She still answered the many questions tossed her way about how they'd met and what a whirlwind romance they must have had. And wasn't she lucky to find a man who could preach like that? His cheek lifted in a half-grin. If they only knew that he was the lucky one. Evie was magnificent. Every minute he spent with her was touched with gold. It didn't matter if they were doing yard work in preparation for the upcoming summer picnic or washing dishes or changing light bulbs in the Sunday school room. She made every moment a gift. Marrying her was the best decision he'd ever made. Even better than learning to play the guitar. He glanced over at the worn and dinged instrument. The battered guitar had been all he could afford at the time, but he'd longed for it like a leper longed to be healed. Once it was in his hands, he'd felt whole again. Playing came easy to him when his only audience was the Lord. The moment he stepped in front of people, his fingers were all thumbs. Evie's suggestion that he play for the parishioners rang in his head like a church bell. If God had given him musical talent, he'd gladly give it back in singing his praises and bringing people to the cross to lay down their sins and their sorrows and rest in Lord Jesus. But his clear lack of ability to play for anyone indicated that Jesus did not want his guitar in the chapel. As he continued to stare, a melody floated into his consciousness and his hands itched to pluck the strings. He turned his back on the instrument and focused on the report he was supposed to write up for the church board. They'd noted that there'd been other visitors besides Mr. Wellsprings last Sunday. The Harpers had brought friends to hear him preach Jesus. Seth was glad. The more people in the building, the more hearers of the word and disciples of Jesus. His thoughts circled back to his wife. As much training as he had in shepherding a flock, he had very little training in reading women. In many ways, Evie was her regular self. She'd handled the impromptu funeral for Mr. Clarence Wellsprings, the man who had keeled over during his sermon, with amazing grace. The man didn't have much family, just a great-granddaughter who hardly knew him, so the service was small and quiet and fast. Preacher, Mr. White called as he walked down the hallway. Seth jumped to his feet. Back here, he called through the open office door. Mr. White's white socks flashed in contrast to his dark shoes as his pant legs whipped to and fro. You're not going to believe this. You won't believe it. He smacked his leg. His bald head was shiny with sweat and pink with exertion. It's so wonderful. I can hardly believe it myself. He stopped talking and just grinned. Seth smiled. What is it? Mr. White seemed to realize that he hadn't actually shared the big news, and he shook his head at himself. That Mr. Wellsprings who keeled over during your recital. Seth mentally cringed. Recital? Had he been too showy? Too prideful during his sermon? He worked hard to preach the Lord and not for him. What he'd lacked in family, he made up for in money. If there was such a way to do so, a large donation was made in his name to the church. Mr. White puffed up his chest as if he were the one who had written the check. This is good news. I can't wait to tell the board, but I had to tell you first. That's wonderful. Seth ran through the laundry list of items the building needed fixing, but nothing seemed as important as the youth program he and Evie bantered about now and then. She wanted it badly and spoke often about how her youth group had been a strength to her during those formative years. He agreed. If it hadn't been for Thursday nights in a gathering hall much like the one in this very building, he would have taken a different path in life. Mr. White, we need to have an honest discussion about bringing more families into the ministry. This money could go a long way in providing activities and programs to benefit the entire community. Well, Mr. White hooked his thumbs in his belt loops. We'll see about that. You just got here, and I'm not sure how people feel about you spending money all willy-nilly. Willy, what? I assure you, the funds would be responsibly... Budget has always been a matter of board discussions. Our last pastor didn't want anything to do with finances. He let us handle everything. Seth did his best to tamp down the frustration. He wasn't a spendthrift, nor was he a thief. A man could be young and honest. 
Age wasn't an indication of character or integrity. Well, I'd like a say. This is where I spend my time. I'm invested in the building and the people. Mr. White frowned. I don't like it. It doesn't feel natural. Seth forced a smile. Change rarely does. I'll see you at the monthly board meeting. It's going to be a joyous occasion. I'll bring some cookies to celebrate. Mr. White regarded him cautiously. Cookies would be good. Great. Seth patted his shoulder. The cuckoo clock in his office started on the twelve dings, marking lunchtime. If you'll excuse me, my wife is expecting me for lunch. At that, Mr. White brightened. She's a good one. Don't you let her get away. I'm not planning on it. Seth shut and locked his office and then ushered Mr. White out the main doors. He waved goodbye as Mr. White headed for the parking lot, and Seth went to the house. The kitchen was unusually quiet. He walked quietly, feeling that strange downheartedness that had followed Evie around all week. She was in her room, sitting on the edge of her bed with her scriptures in her lap. Her face was calm, her eyes on the page. He backed out slowly, not wanting to interrupt her Jesus time, as she called it. He made his way to the kitchen and pulled out a can of chicken. Ten minutes later, he had chicken salad sandwiches and chips on two chipped plates. Just thinking about her looking at all the whole parts of the plate and not caring about the chips made him feel blessed. He'd just opened the fridge to get her a diet soda when he heard her footsteps in the hall. Hey there. He spun around to see her smiling at him. Her hair fell over one shoulder and her eyes were bright and so full of beauty that they knocked the sense out of him. Hey. He glanced down at the cold drink in his hand. Thirsty? And hungry. She motioned to the table before walking over and taking a seat. Thanks for lunch. This looks great. They sat down, said grace, and then dug in, smiling at one another. Seth racked his brain for something to say that didn't include the church donation. For all he knew, her deep thoughts were about the youth program they lacked. If he could surprise her with some good news tomorrow after the meeting, he would. Though getting her hopes up and then having them dashed if he was unable to get the board on the same page could be devastating. Another reason to keep the donation hushed was that, while it was a wonderful blessing, it was also tainted with the fact that Mr. White didn't trust him, which brought up all sorts of issues for him being the son of an untrustworthy drunk. On one level, he knew Mr. White wasn't dropping his father's sins in his lap. He didn't even know about them. But on another, it felt awfully familiar to the way people used to look at him when he'd walk into the gas station or store. Do you think I'm strange? Evie's question broke through his thoughts. He focused his gaze on her, once again taken aback by her all-American beauty. She was so wholesome, it made him feel like a cad for marrying her. She deserved so much more than him. He scolded himself for such thoughts. It wasn't where a man came from that defined him, but where he went in this life. And if he believed all the things he preached about Jesus, then even the lowest man could be redeemed. Wanting to bring a smile to her face, he tried joking. Well, you married me, so there must be something weird about you. Her eyebrows pinched together, and a small, concerned line formed between them. Worse than that, she didn't laugh. He plunged forward, trying to make up for his blunder. Then again, I advertised for a bride, so maybe we're a match. Her brow relaxed. You're a good man, Seth. She laid her hand over his. Desperate times call for desperate measures. He turned his hand over and clasped hers. Or miracles. She searched his face. The air between them grew warm and then began to crackle, like a piece of paper with a match held to it. It colored first, and then a flame burst forth. His eyes dropped to her lips. They were both beautiful bows. He wanted to run his lips across them, knowing that there would be melodic moments that followed. Before the fire fully ignited, they both pulled their hands away and set them in their laps. They breathed loudly, as if they'd sprinted from the front door to the grocery store and back. Evie stood and took her empty plate to the counter. I almost forgot, she said, her voice too high. Seth cleared his throat, 
recognizing the longing that had tightened his vocal cords and needing to get it under control. He didn't want to frighten Evie away by allowing her to know how much he wanted to kiss her. He'd almost kissed her. He shoved the last of his chips in his mouth. They crunched loudly as he chomped away, needing a distraction from his thoughts. The salty flavor was a smack in the face when he'd been craving something much sweeter. Mrs. Mitchell had her baby yesterday. They're due back from the hospital tonight. Seth swallowed and took a big gulp from his can. I can only imagine the chaos with Jerome missing his mom for a night and finally getting her back. She nodded as she washed her plate. We should make them dinner. She jerked around, her mouth hanging open. I was going to say the same thing. He smiled. Great, we'll make it together. Anything he could do to spend more time with her. She eyed him. We'll have to make something a little more substantial than chicken salad sandwiches. He got to his feet. Jerome won't notice. We'll make grilled cheese. She laughed. You're probably right, but Mama needs nourishment. He set his plate on the counter, his arm brushing hers. He just couldn't seem to stay away long. Probably dead, too. His voice had gone low and intimate. He didn't mean for it to happen, but he was close enough to smell the light vanilla scent on her skin. You're probably right, she replied, barely above a whisper. He touched the small of her back. She arched, bringing her face closer to his. Evie? He ran his hand up her back, pulling her close. Her eyes dropped to the floor, breaking the connection, and his hopes were dashed. He stepped back. I, I think we're out of ground beef. I'll go get some for meatloaf. That sounds perfect. I'll start some potatoes. She brushed her hands on her hips and rubbed her lips together. In a daze, Seth grabbed his keys and wandered out to the car. He sat behind the wheel, wondering what had just happened. He'd been worried about his wife, and then he tried to kiss her. He shook his head. He was a fool. Any man worth his salt would know what his heart wanted. Even though Seth understood the attraction between them, he wasn't sure how he'd almost lost his head. He'd have to keep a tighter hold on things, or he'd do something stupid, like kiss his wife and scare her off. Chapter 11 Evie Evie carefully balanced the warm pan as she and Seth walked up the Mitchells' front steps. A cartoon played on the television, visible through the large front window. Jerome danced in the middle of the room. He wore pajama bottoms and his church shirt with the buttons undone. It flapped around as he spun with a big grin on his face. Seth adjusted his grip on the large basket he carried. Inside were fresh rolls, a bag of salad, and the mashed potatoes and gravy. Maybe it wasn't a fancy meal, but it was hearty. At least we know they're home. He knocked, and a moment later, Jerome pulled the door open. Dad, the preacher's here! He ran away before anyone appeared to take his place. Evie glanced at Seth. I guess we just go on in? He pulled his lips back. After you? Thanks. She stepped inside and took in the layout of the house. Across the room and to the right, she could make out a countertop, so she headed that way. The lights were off, so she was careful not to trip and spill the carefully prepared dish. The smell of sour milk made her wrinkle her nose. Seth set the basket on the counter and found a light switch. Evie blinked once and then grimaced at the layers of dirty dishes in the sink. The smell of sour milk grew stronger. Jerome ran back in, his shirt off. What's that? He pointed to the basket. Dinner, Evie smiled. Are you hungry? She pulled out the package of rolls and pointed to them. Her mom used to complain that she got up at 3 a.m. on Thanksgiving to put in a turkey, but all the kids would eat were the rolls. She hoped Jerome was like that, too. He stared at them as if they were manna from heaven. His chin began to go up and down until he was fully nodding. She opened the bag and held one out to him. He took a big bite. Thanks. She laughed. You're welcome. Where's your dad? asked Seth. He's... Bite. How'd your bath to throw? The kid couldn't get a solid word out around his mouthful of food. Well, that clears that up, 
Seth gave her a look asking, what do we do? Evie thought back to the time she'd gone with her mother to deliver meals to new parents. Mom would hold the baby and coo for a while, but she never left without doing something to help lift the load. Evie shoved her sleeves up her arm. We're going to help Jerome do the dishes. You are? asked Jerome. We are? echoed Seth. She chuckled. Yes, we are. She began lifting things out of the sink. Jerome, can you find a dishcloth and towel? You get to tell Seth where everything goes. He grinned. I can do that. Crumbs flew out of his mouth as he spoke. Evie added sweeping to the list. It took less time than the sink needed to fill with bubbles for them to get into a rhythm. Seth was great with Jerome, asking questions that made him feel important because he knew where the measuring cups went, alternating with making him laugh by pretending to put things in the wrong place. Evie's heart melted at the exchange. Seth would make a great father. The thought was there in her head before she had a chance to stop it. The darn thing was like a thief jumping out from the shadows to startle her. She gave herself a mental shake and moved on to scrub the cereal bowls. Oh, my goodness, I'm so embarrassed. Camille stood in the doorway wearing a thick robe, her hair in a towel. The preacher's doing my dishes. My mother would disown me. Evie chuckled. Don't worry, I make him do them at home, too. It's good for his soul. Seth nodded in solemn agreement. He looked more like the kid caught stealing a candy bar than a preacher, though, with that chagrined duck of his chin. I don't mind, really. He silently pleaded with Evie for help. Clearly he was out of his depth with in-home visits. Put the guy in front of 30 people and he'll carry them to Jesus' feet. But put them in a kitchen and he's two left feet. Camille rushed forward and tried to take the scrubber out of Evie's hand. I was just coming in to get all this under control. Sam was rocking the baby while I took a shower and... Her eyes welled up with tears and she sniffed loudly. I didn't want anyone to see the house like this. Like what? Evie ushered her to the small table. Lived in? Like a family who cares more about welcoming a new baby more than chores lives here? Camille sucked in a ragged breath and swiped at her eyes. You make it sound much better than it is. Nonsense. She motioned for Seth to grab plates. He broke into action, handing them down out of the cupboard to Jerome, who was all serious expressions now that his mom was crying at the table. He set them near Camille's elbow. Evie spaced them out at each place. Seth was right behind with silverware and glasses. Evie continued talking as she unloaded the dinner they'd brought. You've just had a baby. What greater work is there than that? All of this can wait. With the table set, Seth and Jerome stepped back. Camille sniffed. It smells good. Evie pulled the foil off the dish. It's nothing fancy, but my mom swore it was the best thing for a new mother, if only because it smelled so good. They chuckled together. Mr. Mitchell appeared in the doorway. His hair stood on end as if he'd just woken up from a nap. By the bleary look in his eye, the assumption wasn't too far off. He held a bundle of blue blankets to his shoulder. What's this? he asked. Camille smiled. Dinner. His stomach growled and she blanched. You are hungry. She turned to Evie. He told me to not worry about dinner because he wasn't hungry. Clearly, he's lying to me. Seth stepped forward. Maybe we can let this one slide. Mr. Mitchell gave him a thankful look. Would you mind? He motioned for Seth to take the baby. Seth threw his hands behind his back. Uh, maybe Evie is a better choice for that job. I'll sweep or something. Evie stepped forward, feeling confident. She'd held many a newborn niece and nephew. She took the little guy and settled him into the crook of her arm. What's his name? Tayson, Jerome answered. And he's the little brother and I'm the big brother. And Mommy says that's all there's ever going to be because she's too old to do this again. Evie barely held back her giggle. Camille threw a look at her husband, who shrugged. Eat, Evie told them. I'll bounce walk so he stays asleep for a while. She walked into the front room, leaving Seth to sweep and the family to eat. She stared down at the newborn, and something tugged inside her chest, 
revealing a motherly yearning she'd previously avoided. "'Why are you so precious?' she whispered to little Tayson. His top lip was nothing more than a blip hanging over his bottom lip, and his chin was a perfect little ball. Perhaps the change in her circumstances, the fact that she was a married woman, had unlocked these grand desires within her. She cooed like a dove over his fluffy black hair and his tiny sighs of contentment. Maybe you'll be a mom soon, Camille said softly as she reached for her son. Evie had been so wrapped up in admiring Tayson that she hadn't even noticed Camille coming into the room. Her whole body flushed with the possibility. She told herself to calm down. Babies weren't in her future. She'd known that going in, though, so there was no lamenting the loss of something she'd never had. I wish that were true. I'm not sure that it's in my cards, though. She carefully removed her arm as Camille took Tayson's weight. I'm certainly blessed to be in the position to hold many babies, though. She patted the blanket one last time, relishing the warmth the little bundle created. Never say never. This guy took four years, but he was worth the wait. I didn't know. Evie was shocked to hear that they'd been struggling to get pregnant. Camille always looked so healthy. It wasn't something we talk about openly. So why tell me? Evie threw the question out without considering how it might have sounded. Thankfully, Camille didn't act like it was a strange thing to wonder. I guess having you see the underbelly of our family tonight, and not running off. I don't know, I guess I didn't think you would judge me. Never. Evie looked around. Camille had extended a hand of friendship and sharing, and Evie felt pressure to return the gesture. There just wasn't much she could actually say. A confession about how much she wanted to kiss her husband but couldn't popped into her head, and she shoved it away. She couldn't tell Camille that, but she really should get Maisie on the phone soon. Some major girl talk time was in order. Is there anything more we can do for you? Camille shook her head. I'm going to feed this guy and then try to get everyone in bed. That's our cue to leave. I'll find Seth. She turned and almost bumped right into his chest. How long had he been standing there? Had he heard her talk about wanting children but not having them? She hoped not. Are you ready? he asked. He had the basket, which was piled with their empty dishes, hooked over his arm. I think Jerome is about to fall asleep in his mashed potatoes. Evie smiled at the thought. I'm ready if you are. Seth waved to Camille, who had settled on the couch and was busy changing Tayson's diaper. Congratulations. Please, don't hesitate to call if you need anything. Thank you. You've helped out so much tonight. They ducked out, not needing a big formal goodbye. The ride home was quiet. Evie glanced at Seth several times, still wondering if he'd heard her say she wanted children. She didn't dare ask because it would start an awkward conversation that she wasn't ready to face. Because what if he said no? He'd advertised a platonic marriage, and that was what she'd agreed to. Neither of them ruled out the possibility of renegotiation, but she wasn't sure she could take that kind of rejection. If Seth didn't want her to be the mother of his children, her heart would crumble. Chapter 12. Evie Evie checked her skirt before walking into the chapel. This was her fourth official week as a pastor's wife, and she was finally getting the hang of things. Hello! She leaned over the side of the pew to look at the darling Tayson wrapped up tight in a white blanket. He's just so beautiful, she told Camille. Camille, looking stunning in a Princess Kate-typed post-pregnancy robin's egg blue dress, pulled the blanket aside and let her have a look. He's going bald in the back, but that's normal. I just hate to see all this downy hair disappear. I'm sure he's going to turn out just as handsome as your Jerome. Evie winked at the big brother, who had taken the job of being an example quite seriously. He sat in the pew, his ankles folded and his brow lowered in his best reverent look. Evie moved on to the next seat. Mrs. Farmley, what a beautiful new hat. 
Do you like it, dear? My daughter shipped it from a small town in Arkansas, I think. She travels so much and finds the most wonderful items all over. She's got quite an eye. She patted her hair at the base of her neck and preened. Well, she certainly found you a treasure. Evie's heart warmed at the joy on Mrs. Farmley's face. The woman hadn't had the easiest life, but she came faithfully every Sunday and contributed to the potluck luncheon last week. She also crocheted baby blankets for preemies at the hospital, even though her hands were slightly bent with arthritis. As far as Evie was concerned, she deserved all the compliments the world could give and then some. I've been wondering about you, dear. Mrs. Farmley patted Evie's hand. Me? Evie was on top of the world. Well, except for the hankering to kiss her husband that came up about every five minutes. She was on guard, though, and careful not to let herself get lost in his deep brown eyes. That was the key. His eyes spoke soft words only lovers would share, and as long as she didn't listen, she could withstand any temptation. Yes, you spend all your time following that husband of yours around his job. Evie blinked in surprise. Well, I don't consider it just his job. It's a calling to the ministry. I know, I know, but you have to have something of your own. I do? Evie still wasn't sure where this was going. And that's why I've decided to teach you to crochet. This Tuesday, 11 a.m. Don't be late. She set her purse in her lap and folded her hands over top of it. It's not optional. You need to be yourself, and it will give us a chance to chat. Oh, a light went on in Evie's head. This wasn't so much about her learning to crochet as it was about Mrs. Farmley needing company. I won't be late, but I'm bringing something sweet to share, so you be prepared. That's fine. She dipped her chin once in agreement. Evie grinned. Mrs. Farmley thought she was winning this little game of invitations and who serves whom. The faint scent of old cigarettes hit her nose and Evie sneezed into her elbow. We ain't late, are we? Evie turned to see Terry, the red-headed nurse, standing in the doorway, with one hand on her hip and the other hooked through the arm of a man who looked like he'd rather be stretched on a medieval torture rack than walk into a church. His forehead was covered in a sheen of sweat, and his dark eyes danced around the room like he was a rat planning his escape through a maze. Their small congregation turned to stare at the newcomers who hadn't bothered to bring their inside voices. Dusting the surprise off her face, Evie strode down the aisle as quickly as she could, determined they would be met with a friendly handshake and a welcome. Terry, right? She held out her hand. Terry shook it eagerly. You remember me? Of course. It's wonderful to see you again, and all dressed up. She nodded to the faded Levi skirt and tight blouse. We're so glad to have you here. Who is this gentleman? This is my husband, Scott. She jerked a thumb at him. I told him all about your preacher, and he don't believe me. Tell him, will you, that he preaches a real nice sermon full of Jesus, and he sings, too. Evie wished he would sing for the congregation. She'd heard him through his closed door and had fallen under a spell. She pressed her nails into her palm to bring her back to the present moment, and away from a soulful daydream full of Seth and his guitar. Why do you think he sings? she asked. Well, I saw his guitar in the office. It was all beat up and used looking. I assumed he was one of those new age preachers. She tightened her hold on Scott. You're correct that my husband does in fact play, but he doesn't play in public, she said diplomatically. I hope you'll join us and hear his sermon today. I've read it, and it's wonderful. There's a few empty seats this way. A few? There were plenty, but she didn't want to sound like she was worried about attendance. If anything, Terry's appearance today was a beacon of hope that their group of faithful would grow. They just needed to have faith and continue to work hard. The Lord would provide the miracles. Here we are. She showed them to an empty aisle. Well now, Terry, you go right on in there, ladies first. Scott put his hand on Terry's back and all but shoved her into the pew. Evie glanced at him and decided not to take the small space between him and the end. If you don't mind, I'll sit right behind you. Okay, Terry nodded. 
Scott flipped up the collar of his polo shirt and sank low in the seat. He glanced behind him at the door one more time. Evie held back her chuckle as the term reluctant saint came to mind. She waved at a few people as they came in, smiling even as one of the elderly men made a show of turning down his hearing aid. Seth came in, looking smart in his light blue shirt. Her breath caught in her throat, and she couldn't think clearly. When she had herself under control once again, she thought about what Terry had said about Seth playing for the church. He'd been working on a song last night in his room. She'd fallen asleep to the gentle strains wafting through her door. It was unlike any song she'd heard before, and she wondered if he'd written it. He was so quiet about his music, not bragging or begging to show her what he was working on. Maybe one day he'd open up that part of himself to her. The opening song and prayer passed as she settled more comfortably into her seat. Seth started with a question. What is the worth of a soul? Her mind skipped over several answers, none of them seeming big enough. Seth continued, A soul is precious. If I offered Mrs. Mitchell a thousand pounds of gold for her baby, do you think she'd hand him over? Heads swiveled in the direction of the youngest member of their congregation. Mrs. Mitchell smiled wide and tugged her baby closer to her chest. Not on your life. Everyone chuckled. What about your soul? Seth asked. Do you see it as valuable as this baby? God sees each one of us with the same love, the same acceptance, the same joy as Mrs. Mitchell has on her face when she looks at little Tayson. A man in a dark shirt and pants dashed past Evie. He pulled her arms into himself, surprised, and jumped in her seat. He grabbed Scott and yanked him to his feet before throwing him to the ground in the center aisle. It all happened so fast, Evie didn't have a second to cry out. With a zipping noise, Scott's hands behind his back were secured with a zip tie. What on earth? Evie half stood, staring in disbelief as an officer read Scott his rights. What's going on? Seth asked, his voice ringing with authority. We're sorry for interrupting Pastor, but we've been after this guy for weeks. He's a slippery one. The officer's partner sauntered down the aisle. He hooked a hand under Scott's arm and helped lift him to standing. His face had a carpet print, and he looked ready to spit nails. Evie's mouth dropped open. She glanced at Seth only to find herself looking in the mirror. His shock was as deep as her own. You're telling me? Terry tucked a hand into her hip and glared at Scott. What'd you do? Scott glared at the officer. I ain't saying anything until I get a lawyer. You'll get your phone call the officer said as he started muscling Scott down the aisle. Wait! Evie called out, halting the procession. She turned to Terry, and her heart went out to her. What this woman must be going through was well beyond her. She might not have ever seen someone she loved hauled off to prison, but she did understand betrayal. There must be so many emotions rolling through Terry right now. I can give you a ride to the station if you'd like. Terry pressed her lips together and sat down with purpose, her back straight. If it's all the same to you, I don't want to talk to Scott until I get a little Jesus in me. Did that mean she was staying? Evie looked at Seth for help. He lifted his shoulders and she could hear him say, I'm not in charge of Jesus, with just a look. Which almost made her laugh out loud. Okay, I'll just sit here then. She moved around and took Scott's spot on the bench. They'd be lucky if she ever came back after this. So many people watched her in her dark, embarrassing moment. The police continued on, pushing Scott ahead of them. He was true to his word and didn't say anything more. Didn't even ask his wife to come with him. And didn't seem surprised that she chose to stay. Whispers danced around like bats in the rafters. Seth patted Evie's shoulder. She looked up and saw something in his eyes. Admiration, perhaps? She wasn't quite sure. The look filled her, though. It made her feel like she could fly. The rest of the meeting passed quickly, but Evie couldn't remember any of Seth's sermon. She kept thinking about the woman next to her, who seemed so hard but was probably hurting. They finished the closing hymn, and Terry's shoulders shook with emotion. 
You just sit right here and Seth and I will go with you, okay? You're not alone. You don't have to. My car's here. She sniffed and straightened her back. I should have known better than to bring that man to church. Evie patted her shoulder, took a few minutes to say goodbye to her new friends, and then gathered up her things. Seth said he'd meet us outside. He has to lock up. Terry was silent on the ride to the police station, staring out the window. Evie tried desperately to find comforting words, but there were none. They pulled into the lot, and Terry paused with her hand on the door. Before I go in, I gotta ask you something. Evie and Seth turned in their seats so they could see her. She splayed her hands on her skirt and took a deep breath. Do you believe what you said? About a soul being worth more than a thousand pounds of gold? Even a soul that's broken? Seth gulped. I do, but the gold doesn't see its own worth, especially when it's in the rock. All it can see is the rock holding it back. It's only when we're mined by God that we find out. Mind? Terry asked, her haunted blue eyes full of questions. Being cut out of the rock isn't a pleasant process. We're dinged and dented, sometimes cut or broken. It's only when we give our souls over to God and see what he makes of us that we can see our true worth. Terry nodded, like she was cementing the thought in her head. You don't need to come in with me. But, Evie protested. Terry held up her palm. I'll help him find a lawyer. She smirked. Are you not upset? Evie asked. Angry at him? Hurt? Terry sighed. He may be an idiot and possibly a thief, but he's my idiot. She pointed at Seth. I'll be seeing you next week, preacher. I need some Jesus for my heart. With that, she pushed open the door, tugged her skirt in place, and marched into the police station. Seth shook his head. What? asked Evie. He opened his mouth and closed it. The words seemed big and hard for him to find. I'm amazed by her ability to forgive, to love someone who hurt her. Evie stared out the front window, her eyes unfocused. Aren't you? he pressed. She took a breath. I think women have a great capacity to love. What a man would consider a sacrifice, a woman would think nothing of. Have you ever loved like that? he asked. Once, she said quietly. Did you get your heart back? She turned to take him in. He didn't shrink under her scrutiny. His desire to know seemed more curious than anything. Had she ever gotten her heart back from Owen? At one time she'd given it to the Lord, then she'd strayed from that path. That's a good question. I'm a pastor. We take classes on how to ask good questions. She laughed and her spirit lightened. She might have given her heart away and had it splattered with disappointment and unfaithfulness, but there was a part of it that was attached to Seth. Maybe it was the part encircled with his vows. The connection felt stronger than her heartbeat. It felt like so many things all at once. Acceptance, hope, faith, trust, admiration, dedication. If you wrapped all those things up in a word, it spelled love. She grabbed the door handle for strength. Heaven help her, she was falling in love with her husband. The one man on the planet who was right beside her, yet out of reach. Chapter 13 Seth. Seth yanked on the mower's ancient steering wheel, and the wheels groaned as the blade created the perfect lines in the grass. His sense of satisfaction was disproportionate to the overall importance of lawn care in the grand scheme of existence. But that didn't make riding a lawnmower any less fun. Evie would have claimed the pleasure, but she'd been swindled into crochet lessons with Mrs. Farmley. Not that she'd complained. She'd even baked lemon bars to take with her. The yard was finally coming together. Good thing, too, since he'd announced the summer picnic last Sunday. The room had fairly buzzed with excitement. The pastor before him hadn't been interested in organizing church functions, and it had been at least five years since they'd had a picnic. It was a shame. The grounds were perfect for gathering. One of the men had offered to bring and set up a game of horseshoes. Suddenly, the older men had the gleam of competition in their eyes. 
The ladies insisted on bringing their signature dishes. He was grateful for that because it would take some of the pressure off him and Evie to prepare food. Evie pulled into the driveway, and he pointed the mower in her direction, cutting the engine as she climbed out of the car. She wore the white eyeleted sundress she'd worn to their wedding and had her hair down, floating like angel wings behind her as she walked over, carrying a takeout cup. Here, I thought you might like a strawberry lemonade. You read my taste buds, he warmed. She'd spent the day caring for others, yet still made time to do something nice for him. He should be a better husband. There must be a way he could serve her that would show her he cared. However, he couldn't show her exactly how much he cared. That could be dangerous, because he had strong feelings for this woman. Really strong feelings, like L-word feelings. She grinned and tucked some hair behind her ear that had escaped. He climbed off the mower and walked with her to the porch where they sat down side by side on the top step, their legs brushing. How are your visits? he asked. She'd taken off that morning to make the rounds before her lesson. Mrs. Carter had taken a spill and sprained her knee, and of course she couldn't seem to stay away from baby Tayson for long. Seeing her hold him so easily, like a pro, had his heart tripping over itself to get to her. She'd make an amazing mother. Not that he could say anything about that. Even though he was dying to act on the impulse to make her his. Glorious. I love holding Tayson. He smells like heaven. She hugged herself like she was trying to hold in the joy that simply flowed out of her. Seth stared, shocked by the pure goodness in his wife. He set the cup aside. I don't deserve you. She bumped him with her shoulder. Says the preacher. He shook his head. All his growing up, he'd been surrounded by women who were hard and harsh, rough around the edges and prickly. He'd always thought that's how women were. And then there was Evie. Something inside of him sprang to life. It was a truth he didn't know or understand, but there was a part of him that reacted to the pure womanliness of her. He took her face in his hands, not thinking, only moving on instinct, and pressed his lips to hers. Just as his mind caught up with his actions, and the reality of holding her close hit him full force, she responded to his kiss. Her arms wrapped around his neck and she laced her fingers into his hair, her nails tickling against his scalp and drawing out a moan. A hole opened up inside of him, one he hadn't known existed, but he couldn't deny it was strong enough to suck them both in. In a move of self-preservation, he ripped his mouth off of hers and leapt to his feet. Whatever was inside of him was big and scary. Stumbling backward, he muttered, S sorry The next thing he knew, he was in the car, driving away, and wiping sweat off his forehead. He had to keep Evie away from whatever dark parts of his soul remained. Maybe the blackness came forward because of the lie he'd told the board the one he'd dragged Evie into by marrying her. He shouldn't have asked her to be dishonest and pretend that there was something between them that wasn't there. She was pure, and he was slums and garbage heaps. It was wrong to put her in this position. And then he'd gone and kissed her, like he had a right. It didn't matter that she was his wife. He should have known better. Chapter 14 Evie Evie watched the car leave, noting the speed with which it left. The speed of fear. The speed of longing. The speed of... regret? She pressed her finger to her lips. They were warm and tasted of Seth. There was no denying that he'd kissed her unlike any man had kissed her in her entire life. He kissed with passion. Yes, passion, but also giving. At this point, she hated comparing him to Owen, but the contrasts were striking. When Owen had kissed her, it always felt like he was pushing limits, trying to get more out of her than she was interested in giving. Not Seth. Seth's kiss had been full of sunshine and light, strawberries and music. He'd laid himself bare in that kiss, asking her to accept the broken parts as much as the man he'd built himself into. There had been no question, 
She'd held him close and, with her lips, said, I take all of you. Here is all of me. Maybe that was what scared him off, the all of her part. She'd been so careful for the past couple of weeks to say the right thing at the right time. Do the right thing. Be the kind of woman a preacher would be proud to marry. In one touch of the lips, her guard had come down and she'd heaped herself upon him as surely as if she'd thrown herself into his lap. No wonder he'd kissed and run. Maybe she was the opposite of a man magnet. She sniffed her arm, wondering if her vanilla lotion had repellent in the chemicals. Or, more likely, the chemicals in the lotion reacted with her body to have the effect. Some women drew men to them like they were made of honey and sugar water. Not her. She sighed and went slowly into the house, stopping at Seth's half-open door. The desire to be nearer to him, even in his absence, drew her into the forbidden space. She stood in the middle of the old carpet and turned in a slow circle. There wasn't much in here by way of personal things. No family pictures, no awards. His diploma hung in his office at the church. There were images of Christ, the kind that brought comfort and peace. One depicted him offering his hand to a drowning man, done in stunning blues and whites. She picked up a rock he'd placed on the nightstand, rolling it in her palm. Like a little boy, she mused. Her thoughts turned to the few things he'd said about his past, about the absent parents and rough upbringing. She stared down at the smooth rock. Somewhere inside of Seth was a little boy who still felt alone, lonely, and unworthy. She closed her eyes and offered a prayer. God, Seth needs love, the Jesus kind that fills the holes in a cracked and damaged soul, not the kind that makes me want to bury my fingers in his hair and, well, I don't know if I have the strength or the courage to love like that when I feel like this. Her words trailed off as she thought of the damage Owen had done to her by cheating, the crushing weight of betrayal she still carried. Help me, she whispered, so I can help him. She stood there for a moment, waiting for an answer, a path. Nothing became clear, but she did feel the peace that came from knowing God had heard her words. She set the rock down and patted it once. Feeling stronger and maybe even a mite bit braver, she headed to the kitchen to make some rolls. Seth would come back and she wanted him to feel welcome. Her mom said that two things made people feel at home a clean space, and the smell of fresh bread. They'd eventually have to face the kiss, but she really didn't want it to become a one-time thing, so she opted not to confront him with it when he walked through the door. A kiss like that? That kiss was the kind that could carry her through eternity, and she wanted to share them again and again. Maybe in time, they could. She scolded herself. What she wanted wasn't important. She needed to stay focused on what the Lord would want for Seth. Healing. Jesus' love. That was where her mind needed to stay focused. And if he kissed her again? She bit her lip. That was a temptation she wouldn't be able to withstand, so the Lord had better not put it in front of her. That was all she had to say about that. Chapter 15 Seth The church summer picnic was well underway and a roaring success, if the number of wheelchairs on the lawn was any indication. Seth had mowed and edged and fertilized and watered until he'd put St. Patrick's Day to shame with all this green. The flower beds were awash in color, thanks to Evie's dedication. She'd even planted rose bushes in the barest spot of the yard. They bloomed with unabashed brazenness in red and pink. He'd asked her about yellow while they were standing in the local greenhouse, and she'd wrinkled her nose in the cutest way. Roses should be red or pink, maybe white if they have to be. He thought it was funny, the way she had an opinion about the color of things. Not funny like he wanted to laugh at her, but funny like watching a baby goat hop over a log. So adorable you wanted to scoop her up and hug her and laugh all at the same time. Just because they made you feel happy. His face flushed. He'd thought a lot about hugging Evie, 
kissing her lately. It had been over a week since he'd given in to his base desire and acted without thinking. On his long drive around town, he'd sternly lectured himself on keeping his thoughts on the straight and narrow. When he'd gotten home, he'd found the house smelling of fresh-baked bread and butter. Evie had been all smiles and chatter about the people she'd visited that afternoon. Her continued openness had been as much of a relief as it was awkward. She tried to make him feel comfortable, and that was slightly awkward. But he'd answered with the same level of cheeriness, and they'd managed to get over the bump in the road to a space where they could pretend it hadn't happened. Not that he could forget. Preacher, called Mr. Green as he held up a horseshoe. Come on over here and help me beat these braggarts. Seth grinned. They had several yard games set up, including a volleyball net where Evie played center on a team made up of a small group of younger girls. The Henderson family had invited their neighbors and friends for their daughters to hang out with while they were here. No one could deny the energy that having young people around added to the picnic. He made a mental note to point it out to Mr. White. The man was stalwart about keeping the ministry focused on those over the age of 70. Evie had gravitated to the girls, and they soon asked her to round out their team. They played against their moms and were serious about taking home bragging rights. Seth strode over to join the old men. They'd grouped together just as quickly as their wives had circled the quilt frame set up in the shade of the oak tree. That was another one of Evie's ideas. Since so many of the ladies tied quilts on their own, she thought they might like to get together. He'd never seen so many eyes sparkle behind bifocals before. Perhaps he needed to open up the church for a sewing circle. Mr. Green shook Seth's hand and rubbed his shoulder. All right, you just send up a couple prayers while I get warmed up here and we'll get down to the business of beating these bozos. No way! Mr. Lucas sliced his hand through the air. You don't get to call on the Almighty. You gotta face us as a man. I'm not afraid to take you two on, said Seth, but I can't say that the Lord won't be on my side. A chorus of oohs met his throwing down of the proverbial gauntlet. He glanced over to see if Evie had noticed. She was already looking at him, a small smile on her lips. He whipped his attention back to the group. We're red. Mr. Green shoved two horseshoes into his hand. Are you an overhander or under? Over, he replied stealing another look at Evie. She had her eye on the ball and was tracking it to set a bump pass. Mr. Green elbowed him in the ribs. Keep your head in the game, man! Seth's neck warmed because someone had noticed him admiring Evie. She was quite the distraction in her shorts and t-shirt. He refocused on the stake at the end of the field. There wasn't time to gawk at his wife. If he and Mr. Green won this game, he might be able to convince Mr. and Mrs. Green to vote with him during the church board meeting. Mr. Green pulled a quarter out of his pocket and told Mr. Lucas to call it in the air. Mr. Lucas won and lined up to throw his shoes. Mr. Green ran the game with military precision. He probably tied his shoes, made his bed, and ate his breakfast with soldier-like attention. Mr. Lucas threw one ringer, and the other shoe landed an inch away. Good job, Seth stepped up to the line. He threw, his shoe bouncing on the sand to hook the stake with one side. He breathed out a sigh of relief and glanced over to meet Evie's eye. She grinned and gave him a thumbs up. He puffed his chest out. Mr. Lucas smacked him on the back. Quit being such a rooster. She was already in love with you. Get on with the game. Aw, don't give him a hard time. Mr. Duncan, the fourth man in their group and usually the quietest of the bunch, swatted at the air. He's still in the puppy stage. Better him than me. I don't have the energy to chase her around the bed every night. Mr. Lucas threw his shoe and missed entirely. Guys, Seth held up a hand. Come on, I'm a preacher for heaven's sake. What, that means you can't be a man? Asked Mr. Green. He set his jaw. Don't know if I trust a preacher who doesn't understand the desires of the flesh. Seth's mouth dropped open. What do you mean by that? Mr. Green lifted a shoulder. How can you relate to us? He waved his hand around, indicating the attendees. If you don't know how we feel, or the temptations we've faced. 
Seth silently hoped these men weren't facing the types of temptations he waded through when he walked through the front door. I came from a rough background. I'm no saint, I promise you that. But I'm always trying to be close to Christ. Mr. Lucas nodded toward the ladies quilting happily, his wife among them. That sweet woman, and loving her in every way provided, has brought me closer to Jesus than any sermon on death or hell ever could. I think what he's trying to say is, just because it's fun, don't mean it ain't right, Mr. Duncan snickered. Seth shook his head. You're all shameless, you know that? They laughed. We're experienced enough to appreciate the good things in life, said Mr. White. Youth is wasted on the young, that's for sure. Seth softened at their teasing. They weren't trying to make him feel inferior. They were imparting wisdom hard-earned and long-taught. That wife of yours, she's the best thing that'll ever happen to you. Mr. Duncan touched his heart. Make sure she knows it. I will, he replied automatically. On the outside, he looked like a newlywed, a man who shared longing looks with his new bride. Inside, he was a bundle of confusion. If only he hadn't put restrictions on their marriage in the beginning. If only he'd left the possibility of a physical relationship within their grasp. Evie wasn't angry about the kiss. She'd seemed to enjoy it in the moment. But he'd felt guilty breaking their vows. The best way he could care for her was to be the man of truth and honor he'd promised. Even if that meant he couldn't tell her how he felt. Besides wanting to kiss her, there was a deep, warm feeling that spread through him whenever she was near, or if he thought about her or smelled her perfume in the living room. The feeling was getting stronger with each passing day. He had to shore himself up, be a mountain of willpower, because if he crumbled, he could lose her. And that was the last thing he wanted. Chapter 16 Evie Evie's skin felt tight from being in the sun all day. It also felt warm and wonderful. What a beautiful day, she said as she stared down at her empty plate. They'd had picnic leftovers for lunch. She stood and took her plate to the counter. We have enough food in the fridge to feed a village for a month. Seth leaned back and rubbed his impossibly flat stomach. The man put away enough brownies and potato salad to feed three men, but didn't gain a pound. I did my part. She giggled. Yes, you did. She turned on the faucet. You know, if we had a youth group, we could put on quite the spread this week. It was so much fun playing volleyball with those girls. They're good and innocent and happy. I can't help but want to protect that inside of them. It's all too soon that life will hit and they'll have to grow up. Seth didn't answer, so she prattled on. I've been thinking on ways to organize. We could have a prayer and a scripture, maybe something shared by one of the kids. It would mean so much more coming from them than it would coming from you or me. Well, maybe me. Seth got up, brought his dish over, and then began clearing the table. I'm pretty sure those girls would follow you to the moon. Her cheeks split with a grin and her skin tingled. Have you talked to Mr. White? Seth turned quickly. Not yet. She frowned. The witness feeling that a youth group was needed in this ministry had been so strong during the picnic, it wasn't a prompting she could ignore. But she didn't want to push her husband for fear of pushing him away. If only prayer could take care of household chores, there was a mountain of dishes to wash on the counter. It seemed every bowl and serving plate had been whisked away and replaced with a new one. It wasn't until hours later that she'd realized people were dropping them off in her kitchen. Seth blew out a breath as he took in the disaster around them. I should have opened the church. I didn't realize the ladies had borrowed from there to serve. Maybe I should have asked them to take them home and wash them before bringing them back. He glanced at the bottom of a 9 by 13 pan to find the ministry's name etched into the glass. This one's ours, too. Who was going to take Jesus' serving dish home? The guilt would burn them in their seats on the ride home. He laughed. She closed her eyes and let the sound rumble through her. It was such a deep, comforting, joyous noise that she didn't think she'd ever get tired of hearing it. What are you thinking about? Seth asked. 
She opened her eyes to meet his dark brown ones. They were warm and wonderful and brought a sense of being home into her soul. Just looking into them made her feel open and free to say what was on her mind, even if it was silly. I think I just understood something in a new way. You know the phrase, making a joyous sound unto the Lord? I always thought it referred to singing, but maybe it has something to do with laughter, too. Her whole body flushed with the confession. She turned to the tap, filling the sink, hoping he wouldn't realize how much happiness it gave her just to hear him laugh. He laid a hand on her forearm, his palm hot against her even hotter skin. I'd never thought about it like that. He glanced at where their skin came together. He purposefully removed his hand, causing her heart to drop. Considering his background, what little he'd told her, she wondered if he'd ever had someone reach for him in love, if he understood what that meant, if he could feel that peace in his heart. Maybe it frightened him. What they both needed was something soothing to take the edge off of the moment. Hang on a sec. She bustled into the living room and grabbed his guitar off the stand. Carrying it close to her body so she didn't accidentally bump it into the wall, she hurried back and held it out to him. Will you play? But... His eyes darted to the mount of dishes to wash. I need to help with this. His voice held a desperation she didn't like, one that came from long ago. Again, she wondered at his life, his childhood, and what had happened to instill the fear that he struggled against when he got close to her. She pulled out his chair and motioned for him to sit down. You will be helping. Really? He quirked an eyebrow at her, indicating that he thought she was trying to sell him a bushel of magic beans. It feels like I'm getting away with something. She chuckled, already feeling lighter. You're giving me a gift, I promise. I don't need a concert, I just want to hear music while I work. Make a joyous sound for me. He eyed her carefully. What do you want to hear? Her heart flopped to the side and let out a sigh. He was so thoughtful, first insisting on doing dishes with her, now wanting to play whatever she wanted. Your music, the kind that fills my soul with heaven's song. Surprise me. But... She met the full gaze of his brown eyes and let all teasing drop. You can't disappoint me, Seth. The words hung there, heavy and meaningful like ripe fruit on the vine. She waited until she was sure he had the full measure of them before turning around to turn off the water and plunge her hands into the suds. A moment later, Seth played one chord, soft and testing, then another, and then a measure, loving and lifting, floated around her shoulders in an embrace— He gained confidence, and the notes melded together into a song. At times, she could swear he played the looks he gave her. At others, she heard the sweat and strain of working side by side in the yard. Sometimes he hummed, as if there were words he didn't quite have to give, but the desire was there. All the while, she scrubbed and rinsed and set to dry. If ever there was an evening full of love and, dare she say it, romance, then this was it. She'd had candlelit dinners and received bouquets of flowers, but nothing spoke to the part of her that was pure woman like the music Seth played just for her. With a few slower strums, like the winding down of a music box, the notes trailed off. Why'd you stop? She asked quietly, without turning around. Because you've washed that bowl three times already. Her cheeks burned at being caught. She whipped around to face him. I didn't want it to end. It was so beautiful. He stood and came to stand in front of her. Her mouth dried at his closeness and her grip on the bowl tightened. She swallowed. What's the song called? She asked, wondering if she could download it and relive this precious evening over and over again. She thought she was giving him a chance to feed his soul, and instead, he'd fed hers. I played you, he whispered softly as he brushed her cheek. Me? I thought about all the beauty that's inside of you, and I played that. 
Seth. His name came out like the soft whisper of a kiss. He ran his thumb down her jaw. His eyes swept over every inch of her face, drinking her in with such tenderness that it filled her up. Good night. He leaned slightly forward, and for a breath, she thought he was going to kiss her again. Instead, he pressed his lips to her forehead. Night, she managed to get out. Even as he walked down the hall, his steps matched the beat of the music that still hung in the air. Gulping, she looked around the room, taking in the dried and stacked dishes and the feeling of love. She was in love with him. All of him. If only he felt the same. Chapter 17 Seth I don't know why I'm so nervous. Seth tugged at his tie and then tightened it again, nearly choking himself. Evie gave him an indulgent look. It's a board meeting. She sat in the front room, a ball of yarn on the floor and a crochet hook in her hands. I don't know what you're complaining about. I'm the one who has to learn a new language. Her brows came together in an adorably confused expression. What is an HDC again? She leaned closer to the page and then looked at the small square in her hand. It wasn't exactly a square. It was more of a squarish circle with a bulb on one side. What's that going to be? A disaster. She met his gaze and rolled her eyes at herself. Do you think I can talk Mrs. Farmley into bread lessons instead of this? She shook the knotted mess in front of her. Seth held back his chuckle. Evie wanted to give Mrs. Farmley company, but Mrs. Farmley wouldn't abide by just a visit, said they wasted time. Instead, she'd offered to give Evie crochet lessons. Evie had agreed, thinking it would be easy. It wasn't, which meant she spent an awful lot of time counting under her breath and perhaps uttering a few naughty words while she was at it. He liked that about her. She was a preacher's wife and a darn good one, but a ball of yarn had gotten the best of her. I think you're doing a wonderful thing. The urge to lean over and kiss her head was so strong that he had to force himself to step back. Then why do I feel so horrible? She glanced at the instructions and then back at her work and began yanking it apart, the rose melting away. He picked up the ball and wound the excess. Because you're trying something new and stretching your abilities. She stopped yanking and looked down at him where he worked. Okay, what's going on with you? Me? What are you talking about? She considered him a moment, a tiny line appearing between her brows. He tried his best to not look guilty. She should be going with him to the meeting. This was the big day, his moment to convince the board that a youth program was more important than whatever else they wanted to spend the money on. There had been whispers about a new parking lot— It wasn't that they didn't need it, he just couldn't justify the expense when there were kids out there who could benefit. Kids as lost as he had been who needed mentors. They needed women like Evie to look up to. The youth program would include her too, in a major way. She should be at the meeting to present her ideas, but he wanted to do this for her. She spent so much of her time doing things for others, enough that it made him feel unworthy. If he could come home from the meeting and present her with the funds, well, it might just make up some of the difference. You're worried about more than just the meeting. What's up? He pasted on a smile and glanced at her for just a moment. A hundred ways to tell her what was on his mind went through his head. But none of them would help right now, and he was late. Just your average preacher jitters. She reached out and brushed her fingers down his hand before grabbing and squeezing. You're going to do great. Okay, now he was a real jerk for not telling her. He opened his mouth just as the reminder on his phone buzzed in his pocket. I gotta go. Go, she grinned. Be amazing. I'll be here making knots in my yarn. You're the amazing one. He touched her cheek and thrilled at the way the contact filled him up and made his heartbeat rush through his ears. On that feeling of floating, he rushed out the door and over to the church. The board was already set up in their semicircle of chairs. He took the one facing them, much like he had in his interview, and hated the sense of being on trial. 
He chewed on the inside of his cheek. He should have been here a half hour ago, shaking hands and kissing babies. Not that there were any babies in the room. There should be. They should have a building full of families. The meeting started out like any other meeting, but it felt like there was more to it, like the very air was charged with anticipation. Finally, Mrs. Miller announced the budget section of the meeting, taking a moment to acknowledge the generous donation and praising the Lord for opening the windows of heaven. Seth scooted forward in his chair and straightened his tie. A small bead of sweat trailed down his back, making him squirm. This was his chance. Mr. White cleared his throat, taking command of the meeting. I think we are all in agreement that receiving these funds now is a sign that we should increase our advertising for funeral arrangements and redo the parking lot. Seth stared down at his palms. He had calluses from shoveling, raking, and emptying the collections bag on the lawnmower. When he looked up, he found all of the heads around him nodding in agreement. I know I'm new here, he interrupted, but I have an idea that I think may bring new life to this ministry. His palms grew clammy as he took in the stern faces of the church board. New life, barked Mr. Green. If you haven't noticed, son, most of our current congregation is more worried about the end of life. Mrs. Green elbowed him in the ribs. Don't joke about death like that. She turned to Seth like a teacher in a classroom. She very well could have been one once upon a time. Go ahead. Tell us what you have in mind. I understand the concerns about taking care of the people who have been faithful parishioners. I do. But I also know that a ministry needs youth and families to thrive. Seth hated how his voice sounded unsure. He had years of training in oration and speech, not to mention diction, so why was it so hard to express himself in front of these people? Perhaps it was because they held his future in their hands. Or, more likely, because they held Evie's future in their hands. He didn't want to mess that up. He didn't want to squander her faith in him. It would be nice to see a few cherub cheeks during Sunday services, said Mrs. Miller. Seth grabbed onto that small glimmer of hope like a man aching for a glass of water. Yes, yes, and to have a teen group, one that would meet during the week to offer support to youth and provide friendships for those who may feel alone in their faith at a delicate age. Mr. White shook his head. Teen groups are a lot of work. They take volunteers. Where are you going to get them? Seth drew a deep breath before answering. For now, my wife and I will oversee the group. You two are already doing so much. Mrs. Miller shook her finger at him. If you're not careful, you're going to wear that wife of yours out. I doubt that's possible. She does more in one afternoon than I do all week. His confession earned him a round of chuckles. He rubbed his hands on his legs to dry the palms. His nerves were starting to calm, and he felt like he could express what was in his heart. I'd also like to get a Sunday nursery going. He held up a palm to stop objections. This could be done on a rotating volunteer basis from the mothers of the smaller children. They could take turns working the nursery, and then maybe even have some time to themselves every few weeks. Mr. Green grunted. What do they need time off for? Mrs. Green smacked him with the back of her hand so hard he rubbed his chest. You men never seem to understand. My vote goes with the preacher, because he's the only one of you who seems to have any type of inspiration. I'm not trying to divide genders here, Seth chuckled nervously, but I believe that our church, our ministry, would be much stronger if we became a resource for families. Mr. Duncan, who hadn't said a word up to this point, lowered one foot to the floor and placed his hand over his belly. Are we going to spend all afternoon arguing over this? The early bird special starts at 4.30 and I don't want to miss it. Mr. White rubbed his balding head. I thought this would be a cut-and-dry conversation. He leveled Seth with a look that had censor in it, much like a father pinning his child to the wall. Seth did his best to maintain eye contact. He wasn't here to cause problems, but he couldn't deny this was the direction the Lord wanted him to take. It wasn't only Evie's desire for the program that urged him forward. It was his past— Having been the kid who'd found refuge in a youth program, he knew in his heart of hearts that there were kids struggling out there. Each time he knelt down and asked direction from the Lord, 
all the arrows pointed this way. Unfortunately, Seth also knew the Lord well enough to know that he could be sending him on a journey that would end with Seth out of a job. There were no guarantees. He'd obey and then have to leave the rest up to the Lord. And if he was out of a job, that would mean he was out of a wife. The whole reason Evie had agreed to marry him was for this ministry. If preaching was taken away, then she would leave too. The thought caused his heart to constrict and tighten painfully inside of him. Mrs. Miller motioned for them to look her way. Why don't we ask the pastor to create a chart, or a list, or some kind of plan to show us what he has in mind, including how much he thinks it would all cost? I would be happy to do that. Seth smoothed his tie over his chest. He should have thought to bring one today. Wonderful. Then we can look over your proposition in a week. She dusted off her hands as if the problem were solved. Seth smiled as if everything were right with the world. The closing prayer was said, and he stood up to shake hands and offer smiles like he should have done at the beginning of the meeting. Running out of there would only make him look less confident. Worse, it would make it seem as if he didn't have a plan. He had a plan, it was just all in his head. He should have come more prepared, and he felt young and immature for showing up without a polished presentation. Maybe Mr. White was right. Maybe he was too young to lead this ministry. He tried to push the dark thoughts aside, but he continued to struggle as he made his way to his office. Once he was settled behind the desk, he bowed his head in prayer. Dear God, please help me to remember my worth in thy sight is not based on what man believes me capable of. I am your servant. Amen. When he opened his eyes, he saw his guitar— A shaft of light from the window lit it up like a stage light. He'd play for a few minutes, and then he'd work on his sermon. As he strummed, he couldn't think of any songs except for the one he'd played for Evie the other night. It played over and over in his head like a playlist stuck on repeat. He began the song, getting lost in the goodness, the beauty that surrounded his life when Evie was near. Maybe that was where his worth truly lay— in being the husband she deserved. If that was true, then he'd better step up his game. Chapter 18 Evie Evie walked into the chapel with her head held high. That is, until she saw Mrs. Farmley. The moment the woman's feathered blue hat entered Evie's periphery, Evie ducked her head, allowing her hair to fall in front of her face. Not that she could hide from anyone here, but she'd be able to postpone the inevitable questions about her crochet project, if you could even call it that. It was more of a crochet torture device. Why did the pattern have to speak in acronyms? Reading it was like trying to read alphabet soup. She turned suddenly and dropped into an empty seat. The smell of stale cigarettes hit her nose, and she turned to smile at her seatmate. Terry wore a black broomstick skirt and a tight white t-shirt. A flesh-colored nicotine patch poked out from under her sleeve. Her nails were painted red, and her necklace and earrings matched both in shade and vibrancy. Her hair was teased. Despite her efforts to pull herself together, her eyes bespoke of an internal falling apart. "'How are you?' Evie asked while throwing her arm around the woman and giving her a side hug. "'I'm doing okay.' She swallowed heavily, as if holding back an ocean of tears. Really? Evie squinted one eye at her. Not really. I've got to visit Scott in prison this week. It's all I can do to think of him rotting away in there with the scum of humanity. I can't picture myself as one of those women who show up for visiting and such, like it's all part of a normal life. Evie squeezed her. I'll go with you, if you'd like. She hadn't pictured herself as the type who frequented prisons either, but Terry needed a friend right now. Who cared if someone saw her go in? Thanks, I'd like that. They set up a time for Thursday early afternoon when Terry was off work at the hospital. Evie sat back and folded her hands in her lap. She greeted a few more people as they came in or settled into their seats. This little congregation was quickly becoming a big part of her life. Seth got the meeting started. Sitting in the back had certain perks. For one, she could let herself go all starry-eyed for her husband, and he couldn't see her from where he stood. 
She had to school herself so often during his sermons lately, rarely keeping her thoughts on the things that would fill her spiritual bucket. Halfway through expounding on the principle of hiding one's talents versus sharing them with the world, Seth paused. He glanced down at his tablet and tapped it to bring it back to life. After a moment, nothing happened, and he scowled. I'm sorry, everyone. It seems my light has gone out. His joke earned him a few chuckles. Can you go on without it? asked Mr. Timms from the front row. He wasn't one to say much and always sat with his hands folded over the top of his cane. I'm sorry, I... He glanced up, searching for Evie. Her heart thudded loudly as she realized what a panic he was in. They had at least twenty minutes he needed to fill. I can get the charger, she mouthed as she stood. He nodded. My sweet wife is going to solve the problem. In the meantime, let's sing a hymn. Evie rushed from the room, down the hall, and into Seth's office. She scrambled to the outlet behind his desk, only to find it empty. She checked the bookshelves and opened every drawer, but the charger was nowhere to be found. Spinning, panic rising as the final notes to the hymn wound down, she spied his guitar. Grabbing it, she hurried back to the chapel. Just as she was going through the main doors, her brain caught up with her and she paused. Seth caught sight of her and stopped singing. With his voice gone, the rest of the room turned to see what had made him stop. Her face burned. I don't think that's going to power up his iPad, muttered Mrs. Werther's. Her face was constantly in a scowl, and even her kind words came out clipped. What do you think you're doing with that? I, uh, thought Seth might play one of his songs. Her voice was weak with knowing she'd crossed a line. Seth hadn't given her any indication that he'd be willing to play in front of people despite the lesson on sharing talents. In fact, he'd done quite the opposite, explaining his stage fright when it came to performing. I'm sorry, I don't know what I was thinking. She hugged the instrument closer, ready to bolt. I couldn't find the charger. Seth's skin took on a green hue, which made Evie feel all that much more horrible. Just the sight of the guitar in the chapel had churned his stomach. Wait, you play? asked Mrs. Timms. My late husband played beautifully. Oh, won't you please give us a song? Her words were full of longing that was quite out of character for her. Several others added their pleading. I don't play. His protest was cut off by Mrs. Timms. Music always speaks right to my soul, please. Evie's heart wrung out like a wet dishcloth with the newfound knowledge of how much Mrs. Timms missed her husband after all these years. Seth gulped and slowly lowered his chin. He must have felt the burden of Mrs. Timms's sorrow. Evie took it as a sign that he was willing to try. She paced down the aisle and stood close, only a guitar width away from him. He was warm and clammy and nervous. He reached for the guitar, his eyes never meeting hers. What had she done? Just play your love for Jesus, play for him, she whispered. If he could do that, if he could not worry about the people in the room, then his music would touch their hearts. She knew it. Retaking her seat in the back was difficult. She wanted so much to be up front, but she didn't want to leave Terry alone, and she wanted to watch people's reaction as Seth played. He swung the strap over his shoulder and plucked a few strings before closing his eyes and dropping his head as if he were in prayer. Perhaps he was. Evie offered up her own pleadings on his behalf. Please, God, give him strength beyond his own. A few tentative notes stumbled out. Seth stopped and swiped the back of his arm across his forehead before repositioning his fingers. He began to play Down to the River. Someone started to hum along with the tune, and a minute later, several others joined in. Once he'd been through a verse and a chorus, Seth barely whispered the words. When I go down to the river to pray. He didn't glance up, keeping his eyes on his fingers, even though he could play this song blindfolded. She'd heard him strum it several times as he'd looked over books or even paced through the house. As his voice grew in confidence, the humming stopped. Evie glanced around. Several people had their eyes closed. 
a few rocked to the slow beat. Mrs. Timms had tears falling down her cheeks, which she dabbed at with a white handkerchief. When he finished that song, Seth went right into How Great Thou Art. Evie leaned back in her seat and let herself be taken away on the tide of notes, swells, and Seth's voice that echoed the beliefs of her innermost heart. When he finished, five minutes after the hour, and offered the closing prayer, there was a spirit in the room of reverence and love and trust. He had a gift. What better sermon about letting your light shine and using your talents to advance God's work than what he'd done today? She was so proud of him, it just might be a sin. Evie reached Seth at the same time Mrs. Timms did. The woman's eyes glowed as she gripped his forearm. You didn't know it, but today would have been my 55th wedding anniversary. I came here missing Paul something fierce, but your music filled the ache in my chest and told me God is with me. Thank you, young man. Thank you. She patted his arm. With a small smile for Evie, she shuffled down the aisle, pausing to nod to Terry, who sat in the back, her head down. Evie threw her arms around Seth's neck and held him tight. She was so caught up in the feelings inside of her that it took her a moment to notice he wasn't hugging her back. She stepped away and gazed into his eyes, ready to bask in the glory of being what God intended. Instead, she found turmoil and disappointment. What is it? she asked. Seth set his jaw. Don't ever ask me to do that again. But all the thoughts and words she'd been feeling logjammed in her head, and she couldn't get her tongue to move quick enough to express them. He handed her the guitar. Please, just put it away. His flat answer had been a note of finality that she couldn't find an argument for. When she turned, the Henderson family was right behind her. The way they averted their eyes told her that they'd heard the conversation and were uncomfortable because of the conflict that now sat firmly between her and Seth. She forced a smile. Tasha, that's a beautiful dress. Is it new? Tasha nodded, her gaze darting back and forth between her and Seth. I'm just going to put this away. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon. Even to her, her voice was too high-pitched, too forced. She set her sights on the door. That was some mighty nice singing, preacher, Mr. Henderson said to Seth. Evie tried to listen as she moved away, but Seth's reply was lost in the after-meeting shuffle. Terry stood up as she came by. I'm going home. Evie stopped in her hurry to get the guitar back to the office. Why don't you come over here and I'll drive us over to the to see Scott? She nodded. Okay. I'm not sure how I'll feel about driving after, so that's probably good. Terry preceded her into the lobby. Evie would have spent more time, but every moment she held the guitar felt like one more moment of betrayal to her husband. She'd been a horrible wife to put him in that position, and her conscience was fussing at her to fix things. She just didn't know how. She was greeted in the lobby by several older ladies, thankfully none of whom were Mrs. Farmley. She disappeared after the service. That gave Evie a few more days to work on her crochet before she had to answer any questions. Perhaps the application of faith was what she needed. More like the gift of tongues to interpret the directions, but she wasn't above praying for that either. He did so well! Has he been singing long? It was just the thing! Evie smiled in response to the lady's comments. Don't tell me, tell him! Please, please tell him! She prayed Seth would feel good about sharing his music because the look he'd given her had been shockingly cold. And his words? They made her want to hide under the bed. Don't ever ask me to do that again. Why had she even asked him in the first place? It was either a moment of panic or of pure inspiration. Sometimes it was hard to tell the difference. But if she was going off of the results, she'd have to say it was a bad idea and she wished she could take it back. Chapter 19 Seth Seth glanced down at the handwritten card that had come in the mail that afternoon. He'd gotten several already this week thanking him for singing, 
telling him how the song had touched a heart or brought up a sweet memory or made them let go of their stress and just breathe in the Holy Spirit. He tossed it into his top drawer with the rest of them and continued to pace his room. Three days had gone by, and he and Evie were still out of sorts. He'd apologized for snapping at her, and she'd accepted, but things just weren't the same as they were before. He worried that they were ending the honeymoon phase. Wasn't it supposed to last three years, or at least one? They were barely into this marriage three months, and things were strained and conversation was stilted. He'd messed up. So had she. She never should have brought him the guitar in front of the congregation. He'd been cornered, and then his secrets had been laid bare before the very people he was trying to serve. Was this pride? Perhaps. Okay, yes, it was pride. And yes, the response from the parishioners was 90% positive. Many of them had stayed behind to tell him how much they enjoyed the music and ask if he'd sing again next week. He'd put them off, saying he needed time to practice. Hopefully, after a while, they'd stop asking. It wasn't that he'd done poorly. He'd hit all the right notes and sung all the right words. It was that music was between him and God. It was their thing. Seth's way to communicate with the Lord when the words just wouldn't come. It was precious to him, and putting it on display would be akin to Moses charging a viewing fee for the sacred stone the Lord had written the tablets on. That might be a bit of a stretch, but it was the same idea. He'd lashed out at Evie right after, and he'd been stuck in his bedroom well before bedtime because he couldn't stand the tension between them. Was he hiding? Yes, yes, he was. He sat on the edge of the bed. Bang, bang, bang! Seth sprang to his feet and rushed to his door, yanking it open. Evie pulled hers open at the same time. Great. She was hiding from him, too. Are you okay? he asked, his heart skittering across the hardwood floor at the sight of her in her pajamas and a face mask. She was so cute with the green mud smeared across her cheeks and forehead. It set off her eyes, making them as big as an owl's. It wasn't me. I thought it was you. Bang, bang. They turned to the front door and Seth took the lead. Evie hung back, probably shy in her makeover state. Who is it? He called through the wood. It was after 10 p.m. They didn't get visitors this late at night. Not social ones, anyway. It's Tasha Henderson. Seth's hand slipped on the knob in his haste to open the door. Evie appeared at his side, bringing with her the scent of roses. He tried not to breathe it in not to let it affect him. Tasha? Evie reached her hand around Seth and pulled the girl inside and into her arms. What are you doing here? Tasha shook. Seth grabbed a blanket off the back of the couch and wrapped both of them in it, because Tasha didn't seem to want to let go of Evie. Evie shot him a grateful look. Can I sleep here? Tasha sniffed. I won't be any trouble and I'll clean up after myself. Honey. Evie moved them to the couch and Seth followed, grateful he had a wife who could offer the physical support. What's going on? Evie prodded. They sat down and Seth sat next to Evie. Tasha looked back and forth between the two of them. Jeez, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to come so late. I just got cold and I thought maybe you'd... She drew in a deep breath. Why aren't you home? Seth asked. It seemed like the most obvious question, so he went with it. Tasha's eyes grew wide with fear. I can't go home. My dad will kill me. A dozen horrible scenarios raced through Seth's head. There were so many ways a teenage girl could get into trouble these days. Evie rubbed her hand up and down Tasha's arm as if trying to get circulation going. Why? Because I... I... Seth braced himself to hear the worst. He carefully arranged his features and concentrated on keeping his breathing steady. I failed English, Tasha wailed. Like, failed, failed. Like, I can't graduate now. Oh my gosh, I'm such a disappointment. They'll hate me. They're always telling me to do my best. Well, I did. Sort of. I mean, I have eight classes and I can't keep up. Everyone else can do it but me. I'm so stupid. You are not stupid, 
Evie hugged her to her side, resting her chin on Tasha's head. We can figure this out. There has to be a way you can get credit to graduate. It's not just that, Tasha sniffed. It brings my whole GPA down. I don't qualify for scholarships. My parents have been talking about me going to college since I could read. Her voice dropped. We can't afford to pay tuition. I needed to qualify. Tasha started crying in earnest. Seth had never felt so out of his depth, and he wasn't sure about Evie's judgment after the whole guitar thing. She seemed to blank out in the heat of the moment. Do your parents know where you are? he asked. Tasha shook her head. I didn't go home after school. Seth locked eyes with Evie. He gave her no room to argue. I'm calling them. Don't! Tasha was on her feet as if they'd been a snake about to strike. Evie shot him a look that told him to back off. He narrowed his eyes in response. She could not consider harboring a runaway. She turned back to Tasha. What if we drive you home? Your parents won't kill you in front of the pastor, will they? That wasn't a bad idea, and Seth gave her a little more credit. Tasha danced from foot to foot. I... maybe not, she pouted. I don't want to go. Evie stood. I know, but you're making it worse by not facing it. She groaned, burying her face in her hands. Okay. Seth stood up. I'll go change. He glanced at Evie. You might want to... He made a circle around his face. She blushed, the color showing on the few parts of skin that weren't green. I totally forgot. Tasha half smiled. Seth counted that as a win. He walked two steps before pausing. You're not going to run out on us, are you? Tasha shook her head. Like Evie said, you guys are my best shot at seeing my next birthday. I didn't say it like that, Evie muttered under her breath as she breezed past him into the hallway. For a brief moment, Seth wondered what Tasha would think about them going into different bedrooms. The troubled teen dropped to the couch and hung her head. She had bigger things to worry about than where he and Evie slept. He hoped so, at least. It wasn't long before they pulled up to the Henderson house. All the lights were on, the house lit up like it was midnight on New Year's Eve. Mr. Henderson paced in front of the window, his phone pressed against his ear. Mrs. Henderson was standing nearby, holding their five-year-old tight against her. Great, he's calling the police. Tasha threw her hands in the air. Or your friends, Seth couldn't help pointing out. She grumbled as she climbed out of the car. Her attitude had shifted from fear to defensiveness in one second flat. Ah, to be a teenager again. He remembered those times. Being in trouble, knowing you were in the wrong, and just wanting to have a safe place to land. He'd never messed up on purpose. Yeah, he'd made dumb decisions, but it wasn't like he'd had parents to guide him along the way. He was lucky if they paid the power bill. Tasha had so much more than he did, yet she craved love just as much as he had. He took a deep breath. Dear God in heaven, if you have a plan here, let me be a part of it. I just want to serve you, Lord. Help me know what this family needs. He looked over and found Evie's eyes closed as she too sent supplication to the Lord. He chewed his lip as some of his anger at her dissolved. He didn't have time to really look at his deeper feelings, to understand why, but he put a pin in the thought to come back to it later. Tasha held back, not wanting to walk into her own house, so Seth knocked on the door. He glanced behind him to see Tasha hiding behind Evie. They waited a minute, and then Mrs. Henderson pulled the door open. Her eyes glanced over him. How did you know to come? She skipped to Evie and then saw Tasha. The next thing Seth knew, he was thrown against the brick as Mrs. Henderson shoved him out of the way to get to her daughter. Oof! He grunted as his head hit the wall and the air was knocked out of him. Evie managed to avoid a similar fate with a quick step. She placed her hand on his arm. Are you okay? His pulse accelerated because of her touch, thrumming in the spot where a nice goose egg was forming. He nodded as he rubbed the knot. 
I'll have a nice headache in the morning. Mrs. Henderson cried and kissed Tasha, who was also crying. This night already had a lot of tears, and it felt like it was just beginning. Mr. Henderson appeared in the doorway, blocking the light and casting a large shadow over the happy reunion. Where have you been? Tasha lifted a shoulder and dropped her chin to her chest, mute. Do you have any idea what you've put your mother through tonight? He demanded. A vein in his neck popped out and began to pulse. Seth stepped between him and the ladies. Evie's hand went to his back in a show of silent support. Hello, Mr. Henderson. I believe Tasha has something she'd like to talk to you about, but can I say, before your mind flies off into scary thoughts, that it's not as bad as you think? Mr. Henderson's vein melted back into his skin. He managed a quick handshake. She scared us half to death. I don't know if I should be grateful it's not as bad as I think or ticked off. Seth smiled. Let's go with gratitude for the moment. Mrs. Henderson kept one arm around her daughter, who dragged her feet getting over the threshold, and then motioned for Seth and Evie to follow. The front room was well kept, with a line worn in the gray carpet by Mr. Henderson's pacing. One couch sat under the front window with a love seat facing it, and a coffee table in between them. Jennifer, the five-year-old, sat in the corner with a phone, watching a show. I just called off the police. Mr. Henderson shut the door behind them. I'm sure they'll check in in a couple of days. We'll be lucky if child services isn't breathing down our neck. Mrs. Henderson positioned Tasha next to her on the love seat. She brushed her hair off her face. Tell us what's going on, she softly pleaded. Tasha took a deep breath and then looked at Evie. Evie nodded for her to start, giving her courage by just being there. Seth measured Mr. Henderson's mood. He had his arms crossed and his feet spread apart. Nothing about him said understanding parent. This might get rough. I failed English. Tasha covered her eyes as if she couldn't bear to see her parents' reaction. You failed a test? Mr. Henderson clarified. No. Tasha rolled her eyes like he was an idiot. Seth wondered if he'd been the same way combative and full of attitude. Who was he kidding? Of course he was the same. He felt the need to come to her rescue, even though she wasn't doing herself any favors. She failed the class. Mrs. Henderson's eyebrows lowered and Mr. Henderson's vein appeared again. Seth held up his hands. I'm sure there's ways to make up for it. I guess Tasha was scared to come home. She believes you'll think less of her because of this. Of course we do. Mr. Henderson began stomping about. She has so many more advantages than we did. He threw his arm out as he passed his wife, bringing her into the equation. We live in a good neighborhood. We attend church. She has enough food, clothing, friends. I would have killed for the charmed life she has, and she throws it away. Evie lifted a hand like a student in class. She didn't wait to be called on before she spoke. English can be difficult. It's not an easy subject but I'd be willing to tutor Tasha. We... She glanced at Seth. His mind blanked, not having any idea where she was going with this. Are looking to start a youth group. It would involve tutoring, if needed, and a chance to socialize and do service for the community. It's been slow in coming, but I'm sure we can use the church kitchen, and I can start as soon as tomorrow night. I'm not sure about using the church. Seth's stomach churned with unease. Maybe we can do it at our house. Nonsense! Evie batted his concerns away. The kitchen is perfect. Trust me. He bit back his response. It wasn't like he could tell her the board was against the idea and had blocked him until he had a proposal and a stellar reason why they should move forward. Still, his hackles went up. She should have listened to his concern instead of running over the top of it. It was the guitar all over again. Mrs. Henderson sat forward. I can talk to the school tomorrow and see what we can do. Maybe she can take a course online that would count? Evie nodded. They have homeschool options. I'm sure there's a path. Tasha can't be the first person to be in this situation. You think so? Tasha asked. It looked like she'd really thought she was the only kid to ever fail English. Mr. Henderson narrowed his eyes. 
Fine. But you are grounded until your grades are up, and I will check them every week. No boys, no football games, nothing. School is your best friend. Tasha chewed her bottom lip. Can Cassidy come too? She's not doing well either. Seth closed his eyes and shook his head. Cassidy was one of the girls who had come to the picnic. Her family weren't regulars at church, but he'd hoped they would be. Perhaps this was part of the Lord's plan to bring them into the fold. He could turn all things for good, even failing grades. Even so, the unease didn't disappear. There was a storm coming. Seth just wasn't sure from what direction. I just said no friends, Mr. Henderson snapped. Evie smiled easily. Actually, it will be easier to teach, too. They'll help each other. Will Thursday work, around four? Tasha nodded. I can talk to my counselor during school. And I'll make sure she has what she needs to fix this, added Mrs. Henderson, her dark eyes set in determination. Fine. Mr. Henderson threw himself onto the couch, defeated. The stress he'd been through was more than he could bear and had worn him down. But no boys. Tasha nodded solemnly. She looked like she was grateful to get out of there with her cell phone intact. Seth stood up and Evie followed quickly. We're going to head out. Please call us if you need us. He shook hands all around. Evie hugged both ladies and waved to Jennifer in the corner. Thanks for saving me, Tasha whispered when he said goodbye to her. Seth grinned. I'm just the driver. She giggled. He and Evie made their way outside. Mr. Henderson jogged out and stopped them. I just wanted to ask that we keep this whole thing between us. I'm not the type that wants my family's issues announced and prayed for over the pulpit, if you know what I mean. Of course. Seth patted his shoulder. He and Evie climbed into the car. It was almost midnight. Mr. Henderson went back inside and the house lights went off at the same time Seth started the engine. Looks like they're headed to bed he said. She nodded. Good. They need it. She stretched and yawned. I need it too. So much for getting my beauty sleep. Like you need beauty sleep, he replied without thinking. Her cheeks turned a lovely shade of pink and she fiddled with her fingers. I can't help but think I've failed Tasha. What? He nearly slammed on the brakes. She'd been a lifesaver for the girl tonight a place Tasha could go for counsel and comfort, not to mention the help she'd offered, despite his protests. How? he demanded. She pressed her lips into a thin line. We talked about a youth group over a month ago, and I haven't done a thing for it. Maybe if I'd acted when I'd had the prompting, she wouldn't be in this mess. Seth stared out the windshield. I don't think this is your fault in any way. It was his fault. Maybe he could use this example to show the board how important a tutoring group would be. Except he'd promised Mr. Henderson he'd keep this to himself. He wished he hadn't done that. Evie yawned. What are you up to tomorrow? (laughs) Well, later this morning. Seth glanced at the clock to find a new day had started while they'd been at the Hendersons. I'm visiting Mr. Harrison at the hospital. Right. She yawned again. Do you want me to go with you? He shook his head. Sleep in. You earned it. She leaned her head back. Her eyes drifted shut, even though she tried to fight them. Seth took in her profile. She was so beautiful. He wished he had one-tenth of her peace. He opened his mouth to tell her about the board and the money and the decisions facing them for the future of the ministry, but she snored softly, a sweet little hum in the back of her throat. He couldn't bring himself to wake her. His mind couldn't even come up with a good place to start the conversation that needed to happen. He didn't feel good about her moving forward with the youth group while the board was still considering if there should be one. But what harm could a few tutoring sessions do? And Tasha needed help. The Henderson family was counting on them. It took over an hour for his mind to settle enough for him to fall asleep. The half-truths and hiding things didn't sit well with his soul. Being married was hard. Harder than he'd thought it would be. Chapter 20 Evie 
Evie sat on a plastic chair the color of an aged avocado. The cinder block wall behind her was painted a light gray color, and the floor was white laminate, the kind that could withstand a bleach bath by a hairy janitor. Or an inmate working as a janitor, as the case may be. She glanced across the room to where Terry talked on the phone to her husband, who sat on the other side of a thick piece of glass. They were leaning into one another. Their foreheads would leave marks on the not-so-clean surface. Scott wore an orange prison jumpsuit. His hair was awry, and his whiskers were longer than they'd been the last time Evie had seen him. But it was his eyes that she couldn't stop checking. They were defiant, hard, and calculating. Terry suddenly slammed the phone back into the receiver and bustled across the room toward Evie. Evie stood to greet her, ready to offer whatever support she needed. "'I've never wanted a smoke so bad in my life,' said Terry, as she adjusted her purse strap on her shoulder. She snapped her fingers as she walked, as if they needed something to occupy them to take her mind off the craving. Her constant fidgeting and muttering under her breath made it clear that Evie didn't need to respond at the moment." Truly, her mind was blank. She'd never been in this situation before, never had to have consoling words inside prison walls. Thank goodness they were on this side of the glass, though. The very atmosphere was stifling with the sense of freedom removed. She couldn't wait to breathe fresh air again. They stopped at the door for the guard to check them out. Terry sighed as she waited, her entire body slumping like too many cupcakes stacked together. He's not at all sorry. It makes me ache right here. She pounded her fist heavily against her chest. He doesn't want to change, not even for me. Her voice cracked on the last word, and she looked like a dam about to break. Evie rubbed her back. I'm so sorry. They were cleared and allowed to make their way through the lobby and out to the parking lot. Both women lifted their faces to the sun and drew in deep breaths. They turned and shared a sad smile. I love him more than he loves me, Terry announced. I'm sure that's not true. Evie hit the button to unlock their doors and they climbed in. The car smelled like pina colada air freshener and happiness. She might never take the freedom to hop in and go for a burger for granted again. It is true. I've changed so much of who I am to be with him. Terry rolled down the window and hung her arm out in the wind. She contemplated the scenery for a moment. You wouldn't know it, but I was quite the catch. I had this long hair that flowed like honey and perfect skin. I was so innocent when I married him, so trusting and believing that a man would want love and want to give it as much as I wanted to. I changed, grew up, grew wiser. She dropped her hand as it surfed the wind. I'm going to have to face it, though. He took advantage of my unconditional love and didn't return it. I don't know what hurts more, the loss of my innocence or knowing he didn't really love me. Terry glanced over at her. I don't expect you to understand. Your man is so in love with you he can hardly see straight. But thanks for coming anyway. Evie started at her last comment. No, he's... I... That's not true. Terry rubbed her forehead. What am I going to do? Evie turned the corner. She checked the clock to see if they had time to stop for a soda or ice cream. Terry needed comfort foods in a big way, and they didn't have anything back at the house. She searched for some advice. Journaling helps me clear my mind. Usually when I write things down, the answer becomes clear. But I'm not even sure where you'd start writing in this situation. Feelings aren't exactly black and white— They're more of a Skittles bag full of colors that don't mix. Oh, they mix all right, and they make mud, which is what I'm in right now. Even now, I know I love him. I look at the man he's become, and I ask how I could love a loser like that, and there isn't an answer. Maybe instead of focusing on the problem, Terry needed a break. I know this is a bad time to ask, but how are you at English? Terry's head rolled to the side as she took Evie's measure. Like the language, or what? Like homework. Terrible. Shoot, okay, plan B. How are you at making cookies? She'd planned to have a snack for the girls, but Terry's visit had taken longer than she'd anticipated. 
Cookies I can do. My grandma had a recipe that's pretty great. Evie's heart soared with hope. She had this feeling that Terry needed to be needed. Do you have it with you? I memorized it years ago. Perfect. She changed lanes and took the exit that would take them to the church. I have a couple girls who are down on their luck who could really use some cookie therapy while they work on their homework. Terry shifted in her seat. I wouldn't mind baking. Grams used to say it's good for the soul. Heaven knows I could use it. Evie patted her knee. It didn't take long for them to bounce through the pockmarked parking lot. Tasha and Cassidy were sitting on the curb, their knees pulled up to their chests. They hopped up when Evie killed the engine. Hello! Evie waved energetically. They responded with a quarter of the same enthusiasm. She tried not to take it personally. After all, this was a tutoring session, not a party. And there weren't boys involved. Maybe one day there would be, once she finally got her act together and could take on more than the emergency case. You guys remember Terry? She's going to cook something while we work. Hey. Tasha waved lightly. Why the long faces? Evie motioned for them to head toward the church. There were ingredients in the kitchen and a large counter where they could all set up. Cassidy gave a gusty sigh. I got asked to prom, but my mom says I can't go unless my grades are up. That's exciting. Evie thrust the door open and held it while they trooped in. Terry came last, her face as long as the girl's. Evie shored herself up to be the perky one for the afternoon. It would be if I could actually pass this class. The teacher is impossible. She gives us essay on top of essay, and if we fall behind, there's no mercy. On top of that, added Tasha, I have to do a semester online to blank out the F from last term. She threw her backpack on the floor. Welcome to life, Terry muttered as she went to the sink to wash her hands. Evie reached for inspiration. We can only do the best we can do. Then we ask for help. That's what we're here for. I'll feed your brains. Terry will feed your stomachs. Hopefully, between the two of us, we'll be able to move you along. The girls set up their school-issued Chromebooks and logged into the classroom. The assignments for the day weren't big, but they took a while. The program was set up so that you had to get five right answers in a row. If you missed one, it bumped you back to the beginning with a new set of questions. Evie didn't get the right answers all the time either. English grammar was a minefield. So, for who and whom, you just need to think of he and him. She waited to make sure both girls were looking up from their screens before she continued. If you can substitute him, then you use whom. They nodded together. Suddenly, the kitchen was filled with a delicious smell of chocolate chips warming in the oven. The three of them followed their noses to see Terry pulling a cookie sheet out of the oven. She'd been quiet, perhaps lost in her own troubles while baking, but finding three sets of eyes on her had her grinning. Hungry? They nodded. They're still a bit warm, but I won't tell you to keep away. Maybe the preacher's wife won't like it, but I believe some temptations are made for giving in to. She used the metal spatula to slide cookies onto napkins and then set one in front of each of them. Evie broke off a piece and blew on it before throwing it into her mouth. The buttery cookie melted on her tongue and she moaned. This is so good! Terry brightened for the first time that day. Her eyes lit up. You think so? Tasha waved her hand in front of her mouth to cool the hot cookie off. She'd gone right for a big bite. I don't even care that it's so hot. I want more. She wasn't kidding. She went for it. Evie would have scolded her, but she'd followed her example and had a mouthful. You're amazing, Mrs. Terry. Cassidy swiped at the chocolate around her mouth. Oh, go on with you. It's Granny's recipe. Terry flapped a hand. She stood taller and reached for the spatula. You go on and have another. You hardly tasted the first one. Yes, ma'am. Tasha took the new napkin in her greedy palms. Terry pulled up a stool and sat down, bringing the cookie tray with her. It was probably a good idea because two just wasn't going to be enough. Not for Evie, anyway. What's your essay this week? Evie asked around a mouthful. Tasha hit a few keys. We have to write about our goals in life, 
She made a face. Evie laughed. What do you want to be when you grow up? Neither girl had an answer. On a whisper from the Holy Spirit, Evie turned to Terry. What about you? What do you want to be? You guys already are grown up, said Cassidy. Evie shrugged. Who says you can only have one try at growing up? I've already had two, no, three, if I think about it. You have? Tasha's eyes rounded with interest. Yeah. When I graduated high school, I picked a path. I went to college and got a generic degree. Then I started working at this company and dating a man who proposed. I felt like I grew up a lot when I agreed to get married. That was a big moment. She paused, wishing she could skip over this part, but feeling like it had to come out. We, uh, broke up, and I was adrift for a while. Then I... met Seth. Met? Ha! More like she'd answered his ad, but she couldn't say that, especially not in front of these girls. They needed a better example. Marrying him was another major growth moment in my life. Why? asked Tasha. Because a preacher's wife is a much different, much less selfish life than I was leading at the time. Marrying him was a sacrifice. Terry's face hardened. No, Evie hurried to add. Making the decision to take a different path was a thoughtful process. But what I believe... She smiled at Terry to let her know she had purposefully chosen to use the same words she had earlier is that God's path for us is easier than the path we want to make for ourselves, because it is His will. Does that mean life will be easy? No. I've worked harder since marrying Seth than I ever did before. But my moments of joy and peace have tripled. She glanced around the table at the three beautiful women, and her eyes filled with tears. And I've met each of you. That wouldn't have happened if I was still in a cubicle crunching sales numbers. A gentle quiet filled the room, sweeter and warmer than the cookies. I guess my goal will be to find God's path for me. Do you think I could put that in an essay? asked Cassidy. I think that would be a wonderful essay topic, Evie confirmed. Tasha twisted her empty napkin. I think I already know what he wants me to do. Yeah? Terry leaned forward, eager. What? A nurse. Tasha began nodding, her movements getting bigger as the knowledge grew stronger inside of her. I felt nudged that direction for over a year. I just didn't want to dedicate myself to it. The program is really competitive. You'd be so good. Cassidy side-hugged her. Terry tapped her nail on the counter. Being a nurse was the best decision I made. Evie beamed. Looks like you two have your essay topics. The three of them turned to Terry. She leaned back. Don't look at me. I haven't got any answers raining down on my head. Except that I love nursing. It's the best part of my life right now. Evie laughed and patted her hand. They'll come. Just keep praying. What's this? Evie turned to see Mr. White in the doorway. He had a strong set to his jaw and a determined look in his unfriendly eye. She smiled, hoping to disarm him with a happy answer. We're doing homework and making cookies. Care to join us? His eyes narrowed into slits so thin she couldn't make out the baby blues that had always been his best feature. No. I need to talk to the pastor. I believe he's at the house. Maybe check the clock. And our time is up. I'll bet your ride is out front. Mr. White disappeared without so much as a see you later. The girls helped load the dishwasher and clean up. Terry made a plate of cookies for each of them to take home to their families. They waved and went out front when Mr. Henderson texted that he'd arrived. You going to be okay? Evie asked Terry as they walked out to the parking lot where Terry's car waited. Terry's eyes were on something else, and Evie turned to see Mr. White stomp away from the cottage. His face was colored in anger, and his hands were in fists. Her feeling that all was right in the world evaporated. Mr. White slammed his car door and jammed his cell phone to his ear. He didn't even slow down for the biggest pothole in the parking lot. His poor car bounced through and groaned like an old man getting up off the couch. I wonder what's got him all in a tizzy. Terry pulled a lighter out of her purse and began flipping it. 
Evie's eyes were drawn to the movement. Oh, don't worry. I just like to flick it. Soothing sounds and all that. Evie smiled, thinking of the fidget cubes she'd seen kids use. They'd been all the rage a couple of years ago. Maybe she should pick one up for Terry. Terry readjusted her purse strap. I'm making a decision this weekend about what to do with my husband. I'd be obliged if you pray for me. Evie was touched by the request. Of course. Maybe... Terry looked up at the leaves over their head. Pretty patterns of light played across her forehead and cheeks. I'll try praying too. I'm not a pretty speaker like you and the pastor, but maybe God doesn't mind so much. That's the wonderful thing about God. He meets you where you are. I'm going to have to think about that one. Terry suddenly wrapped Evie up in a hug and released her just as quick. Thank you. You've been... a friend. With that, she ducked into her rust-covered car and cranked the engine. Evie smiled as she hugged herself. Terry certainly wasn't the type of person she would have sought a friendship with. In fact, the whole thing had just sort of happened. But she was glad it did. Her mom used to say that there was beauty in every soul. Evie had always believed her, but she was starting to know it for herself. All because she'd married a preacher. Chapter 21 Seth Mid-morning was an excellent time of day to immerse himself in scripture, and Seth took full advantage of the quiet in his office. The Holy Spirit often spoke in a whisper, and it was difficult to hear when his thoughts were so full of Evie, the parish, and the general list of tasks needed to keep this place running smoothly. But in the neighborhood stillness after the morning traffic settled down and the kids were off to school— he found a connection to the divine. He was reading in Exodus 17. Moses was always an inspiration. He loved how while Moses did the simple things, they had great effect on the people. Like holding his hands in the air to open the doors for the angels to battle with the Israelites. His soul stirred as he closed his eyes and asked the Lord what small and simple thing he could do for his small flock. The door flew open, hitting the wall behind it. Bang! Seth jumped, his heart feeling as though it stopped completely before taking off at a racing speed. Mr. White, you scared me half to death. Mr. White didn't seem to care. His balding head was splotched with color, and his eyes were so wide the whites screamed. I did my best to let this go, I did. I went home last night instead of confronting you, but I can't abide it any longer. Seth half rose out of his seat. Abide by what? You and your wife, sneaking behind the board's back and starting a youth group after we specifically told you to table it for a week. Whoa! Seth held up both palms. Don't try to deny it. I saw them in here last night. He pointed down the hallway toward the kitchen. Seth's heart sank. That was just a study session. With cookies and talking about dances and dating? Do I look stupid to you? How long had Mr. White eavesdropped on Evie? The idea made him sick to his stomach and angry. The girls needed help with English, and Evie offered to help them. There's nothing wrong with that. There is when she uses church property. One of those girls doesn't even attend meetings. Seth narrowed his eyes. All the more reason to invite her inside, wouldn't you say? Mr. White huffed out like the big bad wolf. You're missing the point. We specifically told you no on the youth group. No, you said no. The rest of the board were undecided. And what my wife and I do with our time is our call, not yours. He was treading a fine line here. Technically, the board was his boss and could fire him at any moment. But he couldn't just stand there and let Mr. White run all over him and Evie. You don't have to worry about that for very long. After I tell them how you went behind our backs, they'll vote you out like that. Mr. White snapped his fingers. I'll see to it. Mark my words, this will be your last sermon. He spun and left, a trail of anger and bitterness wafting behind him. Seth sank back into his chair. He didn't have far to go, because he'd never stood all the way up. Mr. White's attack was a perfect blitz. Removed. Discarded. Fired. No matter what word he used to describe what had just happened, they all had dire consequences. 
not just for him, but for Evie, too. She'd come to be the heart of this ministry. Sure, he was the preacher, but she had a way with people, a love that drew others to her and pointed the way to Christ. Things had been strained between them lately. Not really strained, just off, ever since that kiss and then the guitar. What would she do if he wasn't a preacher anymore? Would she be willing to go to another town to start over, to build from scratch? Or would she leave him? He really didn't know the answer to those questions, and that scared him more than Mr. White had. He stood up, bumping into his guitar. He paused, a sense of something big hanging over him. He listened, straining for the prompting he'd been praying for when he'd settled into his desk. He was far from settled now, but that didn't blur the message. Play. The sense that he was in the chapel playing for the parishioners came over him like a pillar of light. He tried to shake it off. After all, the music he made was between him and God. It was sacred and came from the purest parts of his soul. He didn't want to offend the Lord by making light of the gift he shared with Seth by acting like some wannabe Christian rock star. Play. He didn't want to. Putting himself out there by singing a song he'd written was the hardest, most terrifying thing on the planet. He'd rather face an angry hippopotamus or be dropped in a fiery furnace. Really, Lord, if there's a den of lions I could sleep in, I'd take that, he said to the heavens. An image of the pew full of lions flashed through his mind, and he chuckled. He'd always known the Lord had a sense of humor. Okay, I'll play. He picked up the guitar and plucked a few strings. The verse he'd read earlier came to mind. I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. If this was going to be his last Sunday as a preacher and as a husband, he would stand with his rod in his hand and pray that God be with him. Chapter 22 Evie It was four minutes after the hour and Seth was nowhere to be seen. Evie checked the dainty watch on her wrist and forced a smile. People turned in their seats to look at her for answers, and she didn't have one. Last she'd seen, Seth had been dressed, pressed, and ready to preach. She fought the urge to turn in her pew and stare at the back doors. Mr. White stood out in the front pew because he wore a full black suit, the same one he'd dressed up in for the funeral. His complexion had evened out, but his anger was as apparent as the other day when he'd about popped a tire on a pothole. His wife sat several inches away from him, as if he were giving off some sort of radiation or had a cold she didn't want to catch. Evie hoped he was okay. Where was Seth? She checked her watch again. Terry slipped in and took a seat two rows back. Evie waved at her. She didn't look happy either. People were not in the mood for good tidings today. Hopefully, Seth had some words for them. As much as she loved being a preacher's wife and giving service, these people needed to hear the word of God. It was only by faith in Jesus that they'd be lifted up. Sorry I'm late. Seth strode in, carrying his guitar, of all things. Evie's jaw dropped, and she hurried to snap her mouth closed. I was lost in prayer, if you can believe it. That comment earned him a chuckle. He situated his tablet and a sheaf of music on the pulpit and leaned his guitar on the side. People sat up taller. There was a level of expectation in the air, and she heard several whispers about music and singing. Evie's heart expanded as she watched the man she loved do something that was hard for him. He was so brave, so strong, so humble to be willing to change a part of himself and share his God-given talent with others, even though it made his hands shake. She wished she could walk right up there, put her hand over his, and still his nerves. Oh, how she loved this man. She tried to make eye contact, but Seth seemed to look everywhere but at her. As silly as it was, the avoidance caused her to doubt herself. Had she done something wrong? Did he feel pressured into singing today because of what she'd done before? Was he still upset at her? She didn't think she could take it if he looked at her with that much disappointment again. They shared an opening song and a prayer. The sense of anticipation was growing by the minute. Evie gripped the edge of the pew and hung on. 
needing something to stabilize herself or she might jump out of her seat. As it was, her knee bounced in a fit of energy. I was going to share some things I'd learned about small acts that have big results. I wanted to talk about prayer and how kneeling can open the floodgates of heaven. I've seen physical acts have spiritual results time and time again. And we've several stories in the Bible, including Jesus anointing a man with clay and telling him to wash it off in order to see, that teach us that what we do matters. A few people nodded their heads. Evie bit her lip. A burr of guilt buried itself against her ribs. She'd done a big thing, gotten married, and presented a false front to all the wonderful people in this room. To her friends. She adjusted in her seat, but the burr stayed put. Instead, Seth continued, I want to talk about being uncomfortable. Evie mentally rolled her eyes. I'm a step ahead of you, she thought. I don't think God wants us to be comfortable in this life. He held up a palm. Let me explain before you start quoting John 10.10. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full, says the Lord. Amen murmured several people. Jerome, have you ever had a growing pain? Jerome looked up at his mother, who nodded for him to answer. Sometimes. What's that like? Seth prodded. I can't sleep. My legs feel like they're stretching. He touches his thighs as if he could feel the pain in that moment. Evie gave him a sympathetic frown. Right. And perhaps when we are growing to become more like our Savior, we experience growing pains too. That's why we have heartache during our lifetime. Because we cannot learn to follow Jesus and forgive as he forgives us if our hearts aren't broken in the first place. Mrs. Timms's feathers bobbed as she nodded in agreement. We cannot learn to serve others if no one is in need. At times, you will be the one to carry a friend— and at others that friend will carry you. Thereby, you may both magnify Jesus. Evie looked around. This little flock was so good at looking out for one another. Her heart continued to expand for them in their needs. Mrs. Farmley's loneliness, Mr. Lucas's weak heart after his surgery, the Hendersons' struggle to raise a family, Terry's wayward husband, She focused her attention back on Seth as he picked up his guitar. My heart was so full of this message that I couldn't help but put it into a song. He kept his head down, but his red cheeks still showed. Please look up, Evie silently begged. He lifted his chin and their eyes met. She poured all her belief in him, all her love, all her strength into her look, praying he could receive it. He laid the strap across his back and squared his shoulders. The notes he played weren't solemn or slow. The music would fit in on any Christian station because it carried hope and lift and a good beat. When I was down, you let me cry. When I was up, you let me soar. But then you asked, who am I if I don't make you anymore? You are my God. You formed my soul. You brought me here. You made me whole. And when I look up, I look to you. You are my God and you renew. You ask of me more than I can bear, and I ask of you to please be there. Don't leave me be. Don't let me fall. You are my God. You are my all. You are my God. You formed my soul. You brought me here. You made me whole. When I look up, I look to you. You are my God, and you renew. I'm better now than I've ever been. You made me see who I could be. You made me find the best parts of me. You made me more. You let me see. You are my God. You formed my soul. You brought me here. You make me whole. When I look up, I look to you. You are my God, and you renew. He played a few more notes that rounded out the music and brought it to a natural, soft conclusion. Evie drew in a breath she hadn't realized she'd been holding until the song ended. She clasped her hands in front of her and closed her eyes. It was so beautiful, and it spoke to a part of her that longed to be more like God. 
that believed she was made for higher thoughts and practices, that she could be a better person, that she could be like Jesus. At the same time, she knew that God was pleased with her today, just as she was. The whole feeling in the room had shifted. The anticipation was replaced with a sense of acceptance, love, and openness. Evie barely had time to wipe under her lashes and get herself situated before the meeting was at an end, and Tasha and Cassidy were leaning over her pew to talk to her. My teacher loved my outline. Tasha brushed her hair behind her ears. She said it was insightful. She put air quotes around the last word. Yeah, and she said she could tell that I'd put a lot of thought into mine. Cassidy bounced on her toes. I just know I'm going to get a good grade and be able to go to prom. Can we meet again this week? I know I don't go to your church, but... Her eyes cut to Seth, who was still up front, shaking hands. I want to. He glanced their way, and worry furrowed his brow. He quickly wiped it away with a swipe of his hand and was back to listening to Mrs. Green. Something was up with him, but Evie had no idea what, and there was no time to figure it out right now. We sure can. Tasha turned just as Terry approached. You're coming too, aren't you? She grabbed Terry's hand and pulled her into their circle. I'm dying for another one of your cookies. I practically ate the whole plate myself on the ride home. Terry's eyes sparkled. You really like them? Evie could have hugged these girls. They had no idea how much their inclusion meant to Terry. Tasha snorted. Yeah, I had to hide two of them in my dresser so my dad wouldn't eat them all. Mr. Henderson turned at hearing his name. I'm a man who knows a good thing when he sees it. He smiled before turning back to help corral his youngest, who had climbed on the pew and was trying to jump up and grab his neck so he'd carry her. Terry sputtered. I'll have to check my work schedule, but I'll do my best to be there. The girl squealed. Yay! Cassidy grabbed Tasha's arm and tugged. We'll see you then. I have to get home. Mom says I had to weed the flower bed out front today, but Max said he'd mow the lawn at noon, and this way we can see each other without my parents freaking out. Bye. They met up with Tasha's parents at the door and headed out. Aren't you a nurse? Mrs. Gardmum asked Terry. I am. I have a question. She moved so that Evie was blocked from the conversation. Evie didn't take offense. Medical matters could be private things. What she did do was offer a silent thank you to the heavens for Mrs. Gardmum respecting Terry enough to ask her professional opinion. Evie turned away to give them some privacy, only to find Seth standing right behind her. Instead of taking a step back like one who was startled, she felt drawn to him and almost stepped into his arms. Stopping herself took all of her willpower. You did a good thing there. He nodded to Terry, who was talking with her hands. His hand touched Evie, and her blood heated into steam. He moved on before she had a chance to ask him about why he changed his mind about singing. He moved on to talk with Mr. Lucas. Evie just stood there and basked in the feelings his words stirred inside of her. Tears sprang to her eyes. She'd overheard Hannah's husband say that to her several times. Maybe she was getting the hang of this preacher's wife thing. But more than that, Seth's acceptance and praise showed that he was aware of her, of what she cared about. She loved Terry like a sister in God, and she knew that because Terry's happiness had become her own, Terry's sorrow brought Evie to her knees in prayer and supplication on behalf of her friend. Things were all coming together. Perhaps it was time she and Seth finally talked about that kiss. Maybe... Just maybe she'd be brave enough to tell him that she loved him. Not just as a preacher, but as a man. Her whole body lifted at the thought. She'd wait for the right moment, a quiet time between the two of them when they had hours ahead, and she'd open her heart. She wasn't afraid anymore. Chapter 23 Seth Seth stood at the front window, watching the branches sway on the trees in the yard. It looks rough out there. Are you sure you want to go? Behind him, Evie gathered her keys and purse. She stopped at the coat rack and grabbed a rain jacket. Seth hurried over to hold it for her to slip her arms into. Things had shifted between them again. 
Singing in church had been a miracle in many ways. A miracle he'd gotten through it, yes, but the results were undeniable. I can't miss this lunch. It's been ages since I've seen Maisie. She started buttoning the jacket and Seth backed up to give her space. Her scent was too much for him and took his breath away. An acorn hit the window and bounced away. I can't help but feel like the storm is a bad omen. He shivered as if the Wicked Witch of the West was flying his direction and cackling. Evie pulled the hood over her head. I'll be fine, she smiled. Thank you for worrying about me, though. All he wanted to do was cuddle up on the couch with her in his arms and watch the storm rage. He tucked his hands in his pockets to keep from reaching for her. Be safe, was all he dared say. She stood there an extra moment, watching him like she was trying to get up the courage to say something. The trouble was, he had no idea if the longing he saw in her eyes was a mirror of his own feelings or hers. If she yearned for him, she hid it much better than he did. She opened the door, bracing herself against the wind, and shut it behind her. The house moaned as if it missed her already, too. He glanced around at the furnishing— the quilt she'd thrown over the back of the couch, his and her shoes tucked next to one another by the bench. This was the first place he'd ever walked into that felt like home, and he was smart enough to know it was because of Evie. She was the one who brightened and warmed it. A branch scraped against the siding. Lord, if you could see to it to turn Evie's heart to me, I don't want to lose her. Even more than I don't want to lose this ministry— I've loved serving these people in thy name, but if I have to give it up to keep her, I will. His stomach grabbed and he sat down on the couch. Squeezing his eyes shut, he tried to align himself with God's path. Dear Lord, thy will, not mine. But please, please don't ask this of me. An eerie silence answered. Seth cracked open his eyes to see the trees standing tall, their branches still. The howling had ceased. The tempest calmed. He didn't have an answer, but God had sent peace. Evie craned her neck to see the sun part the clouds. Look! A ray of sunlight streamed through, hitting some far-off place with a spotlight. I used to think that when that happened, someone had died. She grinned as she picked up her soda and sipped. It's how they show it in the movies. Maisie speared a slice of chicken. True. Evie stared at her plate. She'd craved a Caesar salad for two days, and now that she had it, she could hardly take a bite. The look Seth had given her as she'd left had caused such aching inside of her. You're not hungry? I'm hungry for something I can't have. More like some one I can't have. Ugh, why am I so attracted to men who are unavailable? First, Owen, who was an emotional child, and now Seth, who I'm married to but can't touch. She threw her fork into the lettuce and heaved a sigh. Maisie dabbed her napkin at the corner of her lips. Isn't this what you wanted? No, it's not. Maisie's eyebrows shot up in disbelief. I didn't want to fall in love. Maisie leaned forward and placed a hand over Evie's. As your friend, I think you should tell him. If you want more, he needs to know about it. Men aren't mind readers. Heck, half the time they can't figure out what we want when we say it outright. But that doesn't mean we don't give them their best chance. Evie smiled. She'd resolved to lay her heart at Seth's feet. But since that moment of strength, she'd wavered. But what if he doesn't love me back? It would be so awkward, until death do us part, if he wasn't attracted to me. We've both had guys who liked us more, and it's always a recipe for disaster. I don't want an annulment, because I love him too much. Maisie shook her head. This has got to be the weirdest conversation I've ever had. Well, I'm the weirdest friend you've ever had. True. Maisie went back to her salad. Evie picked at hers for a moment. There was something else on her mind. I think you'd really like our ministry. You should come next Sunday. I'll think about it. Maisie's response was so flippant that it didn't give Evie much hope. But one invitation did not a convert make. She'd invite again and again as a friend. 
And even if Maisie never came, she'd still have the best friend ever. Who else would stand by her as she married a man she'd never met and then listen as she cried because she loved him? She drove home, listing all the reasons why she couldn't tell Seth that she was in love with him. She played a hundred scenarios out in her mind, and only one of them was satisfactory. But a one in one hundred shot wasn't the kind of gamble she was willing to make. Seth waved from the front lawn. He was picking up the debris from the storm. His constant care for the grounds was a sign of his dedication to making this ministry better than he'd found it. She waved back and headed inside to change into some gardening clothes. She didn't have anything pressing except her crochet project, and that was easy to put off. Mrs. Farmley had been disappointed with her progress until she'd watched her crochet. She'd ripped out every one of Evie's painstakingly made rows and told her to try again. It was depressing. She stopped in the kitchen for a drink when Seth's phone rang. He must have left it in the front room when he'd gone outside. She hurried, knowing he had a three-ring limit before the call went to voicemail. Mr. White's name appeared on the screen. Hello, she answered. Mr. White rarely called, so it must be important. Mrs. Powell? Yes? We're having an emergency board meeting to determine if your husband will continue with Life of Grace Ministry in five minutes. I suggest he be there. The line went dead, and she stared at the phone. A what now? Her brain grasped a few of the words. It was slower than her feet, which were already out the door. Seth! She practically screamed. She held his phone out in front of her like a snake ready to strike. Seth came around the corner where the tool shed lay. Evie? Is everything— She cut him off. There's no time! Two cars pulled in the parking lot. She gulped. There's an emergency board meeting right now. Mr. White said they were discussing firing you. What's going on? Seth's face drained of color. Car doors slammed and two more vehicles pulled in. The board members went inside without looking their way. I'm sure it will be fine. He dusted his hands off on his jeans. Shoot, I don't have time to change. She reached up and combed her fingers through his hair to get it to lay right. Has there been trouble? No, everything is fine. I'm sure it's just a review. Seth, we're supposed to be in this together. She locked eyes with him. They were supposed to be honest. Of course she was holding back some pretty big information from him. Love was the biggest news of all. Still, she sensed there was more to his denial. We are. He smiled, though the brightness didn't go all the way to his eyes. I've got to go. He patted her hand, which was still on his cheek, before hurrying away. Evie watched the church doors shut behind him. As before, her feet seemed to have a mind of their own, and she was soon standing at the glass doors. She pulled one open, expecting to see the board standing there watching her. Her mind was a blank. If they asked what she was doing, she wouldn't have an answer. The foyer was empty. The whole building felt evacuated with lights on, but no sound. She hadn't been here with it this quiet since the day she and Seth had shown up. Even then, Mr. White's booming welcome had filled the space. She shivered. His voice had been cold and calculating during the call, as if he were throwing out the invitation without expecting Seth to appear. She crept forward, thankful she'd changed into her running shoes. The stairs protested her advance with a groan. She held her breath, waiting for someone to come out of the room at the top and tell her to leave. God's house had never felt so unwelcome before. Once she made it to the doorway, she pressed her back against the wall and strained to hear the voices inside. She shouldn't eavesdrop, she knew that, but her curiosity was bigger than her common sense, and her need to know if Seth had been holding out on her caused her hands to tremble. If he'd lied, well, she didn't think she could handle that. He was supposed to be the good guy in her life, the best guy. She didn't want to lose that. To lose him. Chapter 24 Seth Seth shook Mrs. Green's hand. She glanced down at the grit he left behind and brushed her palms together. Sorry, I was doing yard work when I... The room was so quiet that he sounded like a prisoner on the stand, begging forgiveness. He lowered his voice. I'm lucky to be here. 
He glanced at the chairs, arranged as they had been before, with his facing the group. He gritted his teeth. Must he always be on trial? Did he have to prove himself time and time again? Or was this a mockery, a formality before sending him packing? Let's sit down, griped Mr. Green. He had recently been diagnosed with gout. The doctor said it was due to the fish oil pills he'd been taking to help his heart. Some people had a strange reaction to them. He'd stopped, but it could take a few days for the symptoms to go away. They took their seats, and all eyes went to Mr. White. He was all hard looks. I don't like to have to do this, but it appears that the lot has fallen to me. More like you grabbed the stick and took off running. He hadn't let up on Seth, not even breaking into a smile on Sunday. When so many people had told them their hearts had been touched by his song, that they felt closer to God because of it, and they wanted copies of the words to read with their daily devotionals, Mr. White had alternated between glaring at the floor and glaring at the ceiling. Seth Powell is not who he says he is, Mr. White announced. Excuse me? Seth was most definitely Seth. He had the driver's license and birth certificate to prove it. He came to us professing to be an honest man, a man who would preach the word and work with the board to watch over this parish. But he's argued during meetings, and I found out this week that he has already started the youth program he's determined we need without considering the larger needs of our regular worshipers and against our direct orders. I submit he be dismissed, and a search for a new pastor commence at once. There was a tiny gasp from behind him, one that sounded so much like Evie that Seth's heart lurched in that direction. He must have imagined it, because when he turned, there was no sign of her. Those are some pretty big accusations, Mrs. Green sniffed. I'd like to hear the pastor's side of things. Seth drew himself up. I never profess to be a perfect man. And yes, I did present a counterplan for the money received from Mr. Wellspring's donation. However, I have not gone behind anyone's back to start a youth program. Evie was helping a couple of girls with their homework. On church property. Seth bit back his argument. He and Mr. White had gone the rounds on that before. He would not stand by and let Mr. White dictate what he could and couldn't do on the property that had been entrusted to his care. Especially not when it pertained to helping another human being. Besides, it doesn't matter if it was your wife. She should have known better. Mr. White added. A scuffle sounded behind, and they all turned to the door. No one appeared, and Seth picked up before Mr. White could condemn him further. My wife is the best thing that happened to this parish, even more so than me. She's done more good here in the last six weeks than the rest of you put together. No offense. He smiled at the ladies and was met with frowns. She visits the sick, she talks to the lonely, she brings in lost sheep, and she helps girls pass English among a thousand other little things I can't keep track of. Thank goodness for recording angels in heaven. I'll not stand here and let you disparage her for doing what was right. His voice was deep and strong and sounded much like a charging bull he'd once seen at a rodeo. If you want to punish someone, then it should be me. I didn't tell her about the money. I didn't tell her about the meeting and your directive to hold off on the youth meeting. Mrs. Green wrinkled her nose in confusion. Why ever not? A sense that this was his one chance to come clean, to unburden his soul, overcame him. He closed his eyes for a moment, sick at what he knew needed to be said, but knowing it had to come out anyway. Because we aren't married. Mrs. Green grabbed at her chest, gasping. I mean, we're married, Seth rushed to explain. We have the certificate and everything. It's all legal. But we aren't married in the fact that we didn't marry for love. What on earth did you marry for? barked Mr. Green. For the job. Seth lifted his shoulders. I wanted this position so much that I put an ad in the paper for a wife. That was you? Mrs. Miller was aghast. It was, and the result was better than I'd ever hoped for. Evie is everything I've ever wanted in a woman, times a thousand. And she's been the center of this congregation handing out love and acceptance like they were candy canes at Christmas. But you lied to us! Mrs. Green spoke like she was trying to reason things out in her own head. I didn't lie. I told you I was working on getting a wife. 
A wife is so much more than a a means to an end, sputtered Mr. White. Seth pinched the bridge of his nose. I'm learning that. The hard way. Why did he always have to learn things the hard way? He stood up. I'd like to apologize for the way I handled things. It's about time, muttered Mr. White. But I won't. Five pairs of eyes blinked. Mr. White choked, his face turning dark red. Because if I do, that means I'm sorry that I came here, that I'm sorry I've been your pastor, and mostly that I'm sorry I married Evie. And none of that is true. In fact, if I had to do it all over again, I would, because the last six weeks have been the best weeks of my life. So if you're going to fire me, then fire me. He walked out of the room, his steps lighter for having unburdened his conscience. His only regret was that he hadn't told Evie all of that first. Well, it was time to tell her now. If she didn't love him back, if she didn't want to be with him like a true husband and wife, then so be it. But at least he'd be true to the feelings of his heart. He jogged to the door and then ran across the lawn, bursting into the house. Evie? he yelled. There was no answer. Evie, he called again as he made his way to the kitchen. A single piece of paper lay on the table. For some reason, he instantly didn't like it. Evie had never left him a note before, and the fact that she did so now felt off. Dear Seth, I am so sorry I ruined everything for you. The last thing I wanted was to hold you back. I'm leaving, so you can tell the board that it's all my fault. You'll all be better off without me. Love, Evie. His heart sank. He grabbed for his phone and tried to call her, but it went to voicemail after only one ring. Either she turned it off or she'd ignored his call. Both options made him wilt. Come on, Evie! He tried again and again with the same results. Darting to her room, he was devastated to find it cleaned out. She'd really left... His feet dragged as he made his way back to the front room where he sank into the sofa and stared at the grain in the wood. She was gone. He'd lost her and lost his heart in the process. He turned and punched the pillow. He always messed up. If he'd just told her about the issue instead of holding back, there wouldn't be a problem. His strength left and he slithered to the floor. Dear Lord, why did you make me a screw-up? He cried to the heavens. Why? He rolled over and stared at the ceiling, but no answer came. Darkness fell and he let it wash over him. He'd lost his best friend, his wife, the woman who made every day more beautiful. The one person who saw all his chips and found value in what was left. He couldn't recover from this. Even if they wanted him to stay, he'd decline. There was no music without Evie. Chapter 25 Evie Evie woke up the morning after leaving Seth, unsure where she was. It didn't take long for her to realize she was on Maisie's couch. The scratchy Afghan Maisie's grandma had crocheted itched her skin, and she shoved it away. If she didn't like Mrs. Farmley so much as a person, she'd throw out a curse upon all crochet projects until the end of time. She sat up, feeling grumpy and unsettled. I miss Seth, she said out loud to no one. A glance at the clock on the wall that told her Maisie was already at the office and she'd better get a move on. She had an appointment to keep. A shower made her wake up, though it didn't make her feel any better. She walked into the courthouse, determined to put on her best face despite the memories of her wedding day. The task ahead wasn't a pleasant one, but it was better to get it over with quickly than stall in misery. Terry was already there, her knee bouncing like a bunny. I'm a big ball of nerves with a side of chicken, she said by way of greeting. I've never done this before and I'm scared to death that I'm going to make a mess of it. Evie reached out and laid a steadying hand on her arm. Anyone would be nervous about filing for divorce, Terry. I'll be with you the whole way and taking notes in case I need them for my own marriage, she added silently. Tears threatened, and Evie forced them back. She couldn't cry here, not in front of Terry, who needed her strength. 
We have to wait a few minutes until the mediator will see us. Oh, why can't they just press a button and get it all over with? He can have the truck and his tools. I just want the house. Why don't you tell me how you came to this decision? Evie hoped that replaying the process would calm her down. I was praying, like I told you I would, and I was talking to God, and I just felt like... Terry glanced down at her hands. Like this wasn't the life he wanted for me. Like I was something special, you know? Evie nodded. She'd felt that same way after marrying Seth. Like something special. Like God was telling her this was the path she was supposed to take. You are special to him. I thought I was special to Scott, but I'm not. How do you know that? Evie was desperate for some sign that she was important to Seth. If Scott was the opposite, then she could claim that at least some of her affections had been returned. Because he never came after me. If I left, I was the one to go back to him. If I pouted, I was the one who had to apologize. When a man runs after you, it means he loves you more than himself. Terry's eyes welled up with unshed tears. Like God did for me. He came after me that day I wheeled old Mr. Wellsprings into your church. I didn't know how much he cared before. I wish I had. Maybe I wouldn't have picked a man so bent on breaking me. Evie put her arm around Terry's shoulder and hugged her. She needed the comfort as much as Terry because Seth hadn't come after her. She'd missed several calls from him when she turned off her phone, but she wasn't sure that counted. A couple of phone calls? If that was all she was worth to him. I want to keep baking for those girls. I want them to know they are worth something. It took a second for Evie to wrap her mind back around to what Terry was talking about. That's a fine idea, but I... She didn't have a chance to finish explaining why there wouldn't be any more study sessions before the receptionist told them to go on back to room two. They stood at the same time and walked down a wood-lined hallway with green carpet. They shook hands with the mediator and sat down. Evie stayed silent for most of the meeting, lost in her own thoughts, muttering hmms at the appropriate times. She couldn't help but feel like she was previewing her future, and it was wrong. All of it was so very wrong. Chapter 26 Seth There were a few things Seth wanted out of his office— so he took advantage of not sleeping and made his way over to the church. Even in the dark, the building held a sense of beauty about it. The rock finish and stained glass windows reminded him that Jesus was the only foundation and the light of the world. He unlocked the door and headed down the hall. He flipped the lights on in his office and was blinded by their glare. He'd have to take his guitar, a few books. Wasn't there a box around here somewhere? Hey there, Pastor. Seth jumped and flipped around, gasping for breath, only to find Mr. Green standing in the doorway. You shouldn't sneak up on people. Mr. Green lifted a shoulder and sauntered in with the confidence of a man who could kick your butt. I was out driving to settle my mind and saw your light on. Seth found the box in the corner and began packing. How's the tow? he asked, inquiring after the gout. Better every day? He leaned against the desk. You're not normal. Seth paused a moment in his packing, trying to determine if he was being insulted or what. Thanks. He went with the not offended option because he didn't have any fight left in him. Evie hadn't returned any of his calls, and he was as low as he'd ever been in life. I've never seen a preacher sing during a sermon. Apparently, Mr. Green wasn't done. Or throw horseshoes with me. He shook his head. It's not normal, but I like it. I like that you come to a meeting with your hands dirty and that you're willing to put in the work to make this place shine. Makes me think you care. I do. A smile tugged at his lips. My grandfather helped build this church. He hammered nails and laid the stones for the finish. Ah, he did excellent work. It's held up really well. Mr. Green wrapped his knuckles on the desk. I voted to keep you. Most of us did. I expect Mr. White is figuring out how to eat crow tonight and tell you that you're sticking around. Seth set down the books he'd been holding and stared at Mr. Green. Thank you. I certainly appreciate it. 
but I'm afraid Evie thinks this is all her fault, when it clearly is mine, and she's, uh... He couldn't bring himself to say the words, left me. They sounded so final. Not around. Mr. Green clamped his mouth shut, and a muscle on his jaw twitched. Then what in tarnation are you doing here? Packing? Mr. Green grabbed Seth's shirt and shoved him toward the door. I thought you had a head on those shoulders. If I'd have known, you get your sorry butt out there and bring her back. He stopped muscling Seth toward the door and smiled the one and only true smile Seth had ever seen on his face. She makes the best chocolate cream pie I've ever had. I won't let you lose her for any of us. He shoved him once more, this time letting go of his shirt. Seth stumbled several steps before regaining his footing. I'm not sure where she is. You have to have some idea, Mr. Green glared. Seth scrambled. The only thought that came was of her friend she'd had lunch with, but he had no idea where she lived. I'll do my best. He all but sprinted for the door, not needing any more of Mr. Green's form of motivation. He typed Maisie's name into a search engine, and an address came up. Let's hope this works. He got in his car and snaked around the potholes to get out of the parking lot. Once on the road, he checked the time. It was after midnight. He glanced upward and started praying. The only way he was going to get Evie back was if the Lord was on his side. Dear God, you brought her into my life. Please, help me to keep her. Chapter 27 Evie It was official. Evie hated yarn. She threw off the afghan and wrapped up in the sheet. Another sleepless night on the sofa, and she wasn't any closer to finding peace than she had been when she'd left. Someone really needed to write a book on how to leave your husband who you'd fake married and fallen in love with. A manual would be epic right now. She got up and went to the kitchen for a cold glass of water. It was too hot in here. That or she was just plain miserable. She hadn't shared a bed with Seth, but she missed her room nonetheless. She missed knowing that his door was slightly open, that if she called out, he'd answer. Car lights flooded the room, and then it dimmed again. Tires crunched on the driveway. What on earth? She got up on her tippy toes and pushed the curtains aside to see out the window over the sink. Seth's car idled, and then the engine cut. Her heartbeat spiked and she dropped the curtain. He's here, her heart whispered. She racked her brain for a reason for him to show up besides coming after her because she didn't think she could take a letdown. She hadn't taken anything of his. She hadn't left anything behind, so... Her breath caught as a spark of hope ignited. Maybe, just maybe, he loved her. She sucked in her cheeks. The sound of a car door opening had her sprinting about the room. She hurriedly fixed her hair in the mirror by the front door. At the last second, she pulled a couple of tendrils out to frame her face. She blew into her hand and sniffed. Scrambling for a mint, she chewed ferociously. Her mouth lit on fire with the explosion of peppermint, and she alternately huffed and sucked in air as she scrambled to find her robe. Just as she was tying it off, there was a small knock on the door. She ran for it, then came up short, not wanting to appear too desperate. Who was she kidding? She was so desperate for this man's love. She lunged for the handle and yanked the door open, throwing herself at him. He grunted on impact. You came, she said into his collarbone. His arms came around her and he buried his face in her hair. Tears gathered and fell faster than she could count them. She pulled him tighter and tighter still, relishing the feel of his warm body against hers and the protection she felt in his embrace. He smelled of soap and laundry detergent and him. He cleared his throat, and when she pulled back, his eyes were shiny, as if he was moved by her affection. She thought back to the times she'd tried to show him that she was a safe place for his heart. The only things she hadn't done were holding him, touching him, and kissing him. Perhaps that was the key, and she'd missed it all along. She ran her hand down the side of his face and paused, feeling his stubble against her palm. Closing her eyes, she leaned her forehead against his chin, 
breathing him in and vowing never to hold back her affection. Evie, sweet Evie, he whispered as he pressed a kiss against her skin. His lips were warm and inviting, sending thrills up and down her whole body. He pushed her back and held her away, his hands on her shoulders. I have something I have to say. She swallowed and nodded, her heart thudding so loudly she could barely make out his words. I'm in love with you. Well, I hope so. Seth's head jerked back. She let out a giggle. It was not the time to laugh. Seth was being so serious, but the sound had burst out just like the smile that split her cheeks. Sorry, keep going. There was more. Her husband was a man of words. As much as she wanted to get right to the kissing part of making up, she let him say all the beautiful things he'd planned. He really said the most wonderful things. He shook his head slightly as if he couldn't quite believe the way this was turning out. Jesus said that if you bring one soul into heaven, your joy shall be great. I want to be that one soul for you, and you for me. We can work together all our lives and then find our rest in God. She blinked back tears. Like soulmates? Exactly like soulmates. She could have burst with the feeling of flying that overcame her. If Seth hadn't been holding on to her, she would have floated away. I love you, and I want to be husband and wife in every sense. I want you in my arms. I don't want separate rooms anymore. And I think you should come to the board meetings. Wait, you're not fired? She really wanted to talk about the bedroom situation, but she was too shocked at the good news. From what she'd overheard outside the room, Seth had been as good as gone. You thought I was fired, and you still— He crushed her against him. You still wanted me? She nodded against his shirt. I know I married you to become a preacher's wife, but Seth, I really want you. If we had to go corporate, I'd be happy just being your wife. I told the board about the ad, about everything. They voted, though I don't think Mr. White is happy about it. They want me to stay. Us. To stay. She took his face in her hands and pressed her lips to his, pouring all her love and acceptance and feelings of joy into that kiss had her gasping for breath. Seth answered kiss for kiss, giving just as much as she gave, maybe more. His hands roamed her back, and she let out a soft moan, practically begging him to deepen the kiss. He did, and her knees gave out. She buckled against him, appreciating the hours of yard work and maintenance that built such a nice body. Is that a yes? He teased before kissing her neck. His breath was hot and delicious on her skin. Yes, she kissed him. A hundred yeses and more. Seth's mouth consumed hers, and she was lost to him, heart and soul. She might not have set out to find love, but she'd found the love of her life. They say the Lord works in mysterious ways. Who knew he had a hand in Brides Wanted ads? Evie was glad he'd intervened in her life and set her on a crazy path that led right to the man of her dreams and the life she'd longed to live. Epilogue One year later I've never done this with an audience before. Seth laughed and clapped the contractor on the back. We're all very excited to have you here. Be sure to grab a plate of food when you're done. He turned to the large group gathered on the church lawn. They'd spread out blankets, set up lawn chairs, and laid out a spread to celebrate the new parking lot. The first truck will be here in two minutes, he shouted. The group cheered so loud they could probably hear it on Main Street. Evie motioned for him to come over to the group of teenagers who were setting up a volleyball net. They had 17 kids in the youth program, their families all regulars on Sundays. Terry had taken over running and organizing it. She had a way with the kids, especially the ones with surly attitudes. When kind words and offers to help with homework didn't warm hearts, her cookies always made a difference. Word of Seth's songs had spread, and people came, curious to hear the singing preacher. The nickname wasn't his doing, and he still wasn't used to it. He was humbled by the Lord's continual help and inspiration as he wrote songs to share the deeper feelings that he had a hard time expressing otherwise. He jogged over, ready to help. 
Evie had been under the weather lately, and he didn't want her overexerting herself. Can you believe this turnout? She shaded her eyes against the sunlight. I dare say even Mr. White is pleased. Seth turned in time to see Mr. White load his plate with pulled pork, a grin on his face. He's just happy we finally got the parking lot done. She laughed lightly. Maybe. It's been a group effort. It truly had. They'd held bake sales and car washes, received donations, and scrimped. But the dream was finally a reality. A large dump truck full of asphalt turned the corner, and the crowd clapped. The driver honked his horn in response. Seth laughed, grateful that the company and the people that worked there were good sports. Life was beautiful. He had a wife, the best one in the whole world, a ministry full of good people and giving hearts, and the chance to make a difference in the world. His heart couldn't get any fuller. Who would have thought that a boy who'd come from two emotionally distant drunks would ever find so much love in one lifetime? Dear God, thank you for everything. Thank you for this moment. Evie wrinkled her nose as the smell of the asphalt hit them. I think I should go inside. He cupped her elbow. Are you okay? She nodded. I'm fine, but I don't think the fumes are good for the baby. She patted her flat stomach and slipped out of his hand. He watched the truck back up to where it would drop its load. Her words came back at him, replayed as if on a voicemail. The what now? He called after her, not sure he'd heard her correctly. She giggled and threw her arms out to the side. At her signal, the teen set off poppers that threw pink and blue confetti into the air. It rained down on top of them as the people they'd grown to love gathered around, shouting congratulations. Evie ran to him and he caught her. You're going to be a daddy, she whispered in his ear. He couldn't stop the smile that filled his face. He thought his life couldn't get any better, and then God showed him that his heart could grow, first with Evie, and then, in a blink, with his future child. I love you, Evie Powell, for all that I am and all I'll ever be, and for all eternity. He kissed her nice and slow, taking his time, because every moment with her was precious and he wanted to savor this one, and the next, and the next. This has been The Small Town Preacher's Fake Marriage, The Bride's Wanted Matchmaker Series, written by Lucy McConnell, narrated by Liz Crane. Copyright 2020 by Lucy McConnell. Production copyright by Lucy McConnell.